Hey everyone, welcome to my channel, Anarchy for Freedom, India's home for conspiracy research and free thinking. I'm super excited beyond words today to be joined by the one and only. Uh, just give me a second. I'm getting feedback. Yeah, that's much better. Man. I was getting feedback for that. My tabs open. And anyway, yeah, so I was saying, I'm super excited to have Tom Monk Montauk on. Um, to be honest, you're someone, dude, I, I wish I found your book uh, many years earlier because just uh, taking this time out and reading your stuff has helped me shortcut so much, which I probably think I would take a lot of time to reach, man. So super, super grateful for all of your hard work that you put in over the years, even at a time when probably a lot of people weren't interested in this stuff. But, uh, you know, now with changing trends and alien disclosure and all of that, uh, I'm pretty sure that your, your work's really going to get out there. So thank you so much for like giving me your precious time and coming on, dude. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for inviting me on. I'm really looking forward to this. Great, man. I'm going to start out with a quote from Henry Bergson. Uh, fortunately, some are born with spiritual immune systems that sooner or later give rejection to the illusory worldview grafted upon them from birth to social conditioning. They begin sensing that something is amiss and start looking for answers. Inner knowledge and anomalous outer experiences show them a side of reality they are oblivious to, and so begins their journey of awakening. Each step of the journey is made by following the heart instead of following the crowd and by choosing knowledge over the veils of ignorance. Um, the only difference is that this quote isn't from Henry Bergson, it's actually from Mr. Tom Montauk, who's sitting right here. And uh, like I've always read that quote and thought, man, that's such a profound quote, like whoever came up with it. And uh, when I read your work, I could I could see your wisdom, you know, even like after I got to know the fact that that's actually your quote, I could see the wisdom reflect over there. So yeah, how, how do you feel about that quote being misrepresented? And you know, most people thinking it's actually from someone when it's from you. Yeah, well, I think it's a... Uh... I think it's flattering if it's if it's attributed to Henri Bergson, you know, because he, he's a pretty famous French philosopher, you know, and a lot, a lot of people enjoy his work. So if, if my writing is mistaken for his, I guess I guess it means I sound like a hundred year old French dude. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing that I thought when I first saw you, I thought you were like 20, in your 20s or early 30s or something, but you're actually in your 40s, man. So. What are you doing? Like, what supplements are you taking uh, to, to, to age backwards in time? I don't know. I mean, the older I get, the younger I look. It's kind of weird. Maybe, maybe it's a bleed through from being an alchemist in the past life. You know, so now, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I get enough sleep. I work from home. I avoid pretty much all caffeine and tobacco and alcohol and drugs. Uh, not because I'm like religious or um, a monk like that, but some of it just has to do with my inability to metabolize, let's say, caffeine or alcohol. So I just stay away from most of it. So I think I think just kind of everything just kind of adds up over time. All right, man. What are we doing is clearly working for you. So <laughs> let's get right into it, man. I have a ton of questions lined up, so I'll I'll just take this one by one because uh, I've I've tried to watch all of your interviews like as many as I could in the time I've had and read your books and really extract the questions which would. Uh, Help the audience quite a bit as well as people who've already been into your work the kind of questions i want to ask are the ones that would help build on your work instead of uh, you know like you having to say what you've already said i'm sure a lot of that will be there but i want to offer some novelty as well with respect good. to maybe some things that people haven't asked you good so yeah i mean uh, with respect to how i found you as well i found your work on synchronicity really really insightful man I've, I've never seen anyone who's dealt with that subject in the level of incredible detail and the types of synchronicity and all of that and uh, i was actually going through like a very difficult time a couple of months back and i was praying to god you know just uh, give me what i need in order to like make sense of what was going on in my life and even early on like uh, this is <laughs> funny like my friends like my close friends will know that I've had some frustrations with uh, people in the movement. Like when we were talking last time, I was sharing this with you as well. I mean, no one's perfect. You know, you're not you're not going to get someone who's like the ideal person who's going to like be right about most things. But uh, I was a little bit disappointed in the people who I really looked up to over time with respect to how they've changed their take on certain things. So, I mean, I take names like David Icke, Mark Passio, uh, a couple of other people like that who... You know, I have some disagreements within certain areas. So I was like, you know, I always used to tell my friends, I want someone really fucking cutting edge who's, you know, scientifically oriented at the same time. His mm -hmm. intuition is like, 
next level and he can bridge all of these subjects together and you know just present a coherent world view and i thought that person would be impossible to find man but uh, god does answer your prayers so i'm so glad i found your work dude so maybe let's just start out with how do you integrate intuition and your intellect in such a profound way because uh, i mean just talking about the intellect side of things you're not a vegan you're not a virus denier you're not a flat earther and a lot of people in the movement who have like who mostly come from a who have i would say the intuition is overpowering over the intellect they tend to fall for a lot of these things which objectively just aren't true or on on the best things to believe in just looking at the evidence so i mean my my question really is like what what makes you arrive at such precise conclusions because it's i mean these are kind of fields where people would really have to go and master and spend a lot of time and uh, you manage to reach the right conclusions i mean of course all of this is in my opinion but i'm i'm steeped in researching at least like virus denial and veganism I've been researching them for a long time so just like very refreshing to see you be on point with so many things man mm-hmm. no it's an it's an important question because it really speaks to what all of us truth seekers are really trying to arrive at if you're if you're interested in the truth if you're not simply looking for a, a pacifier to to satisfy your ego or your shadow you know your childhood wounds like you know so some people some people they they stumble upon the very first theory that sort of makes sense to them and then they stick with it for the rest of their lives because what they do is they they merge their identity into into it so it becomes their ego identity and then they don't ever want to give it up so essentially they've been captured by a cult by a limited belief system um now i don't believe in that i i believe in surveying as broad of a field of information as possible and then extracting from it what makes sense like i don't i don't think a person should simply join something and based on a few things that make sense and then have to swallow everything else about it that doesn't make sense mm. you know just just because now they're part of something and they just kind of hold their nose and uh you know they they accept the the poison with the sugar you shouldn't do that you should simply be like a bee that visits from flower to flower to flower gathering all the right pollen so that you can make your own honey of wisdom you know that's sort of been my approach now people have to understand though that for me i didn't start out late in life researching these things for me it started out even in childhood where i had a lot of different paranormal experiences and i've talked about them at length in other podcasts so i don't have to go over it here but i've had demon experiences ghost experiences i've dealt with aliens when i was a kid like alien abductions uh and at the same time though my dad uh who's german he was an electrical engineer working for siemens the the technology company and so he was very technologically minded as well and so he taught me a lot of science when i was a kid and i really grew to appreciate how reality works how everything works um i was taking things apart putting them back together well mostly taking things apart i didn't really know how, know how to fix things but i knew how to destroy things but to figure out how it worked um but that sense of curiosity kind of ignited me into it ignited me into questioning reality itself like i could figure out how science worked but what about the aliens and the ghosts and the demons like what was that all about uh, and so that sort of set me on a lifelong path of reading all the books that i could on the subject communicating with thousands of people through email and chats and you know in person too uh and then so over the years i just gathered more and more data and so it became clear and so in my case for the most part i would say it was a like a brute force approach of just having so many experiences so many people that have helped me that i've known and crossed paths with and so many books that i've read like right now i've got here probably about 300 books but that's 1/5 of my total collection i've had to get rid of many books over the years um Why is that? Pretty, just because like you don't have enough space at your house or something like that? Yeah, I've moved around quite a bit, and uh, I, I made it a goal to never have to rent a moving van or a moving truck. So everything I wanted to own, I wanted to fit in my car, and if I couldn't fit it, I had to throw it away or donate it or sell it. Right. So I, I, I like to live light. Um, so every time I move, I kind of trim down again. That's why. Yeah, but you asked about intuition and intellect and how to kind of merge the the two. Well. So in my case, I've learned from my mistakes in the sense of. If I give in too much to ego, if I become too cocky, life always kicks me in the butt. You know, it, I, I always suffer the consequences of doing that. Um, and and I've, and I've had negative forces, like many people, I've had negative forces try to bait me into doing things and saying things that end up sabotaging me 
my networks, my friendships, my reputation. And I don't really care about my reputation in the sense of ego. I care about my reputation only in the sense that if it's really damaged, then more people will not pay attention and they won't consider the ideas that I'm putting forth. You know, so I want people yeah. to even give it a chance. And so that's why I care somewhat about reputation. You know, I don't really have much ego left after all these years because it's been it's been battered by you know so many setbacks and mistakes and learn learning from it. Um, but you have to be aware of yourself, your flaws. Um, and when you come up with new ideas, for example, like when you study different sources and you get an idea, you have to question yourself as well. So you're not only questioning the source, you're also questioning your response mm. to the source. So whenever I brainstorm anything, whenever I come up with an idea, I always act as uh, the devil's advocate trying to question myself and to make sure like, is this logically sound? What holes are there in it? Um, are there any counter examples that I can think of? And uh, what would a skeptic think? You know, that's, that's typically how I think. I always question myself in that way. And that level of self-awareness kind of helps me self-correct over time so that I don't start steering into a wrong direction and just keep going worse, worse and worse in that direction, which only, usually only happens when a person is too in it from an ego or emotional perspective and doesn't have enough critical thinking to really see through the flaws. So that's what I do. Um, my main practice in order to come up with most of what I have on my website is simply contemplating on a notebook. So I just have a notebook, a blank notebook, no lines, no grids, no nothing. And I write down my questions, my problems, things I'm trying to figure out. I brainstorm it, I draw diagrams. I listen to my intuition really carefully. Like if, if I sense something is off, like if I read a source and it's something that's off about it, I will, I'm not content with simply saying to myself, oh, this feels off, I'm not going to pay attention to it. What I do is I think to myself, what is off about it exactly? What is exactly off about it? And I dig into it and I think about it logically until I can get to a point where I can boil it down to very distinct lines that it's a, it's a concise statement that I can present to someone else and it's crystal clear to them and they can read it and they can say, oh yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I see exactly what you're talking about that source being off. So once you get to that level of clarity where you can explain it to someone else, then you've got it. Mm. So my notebook is full of these things. And once I have enough of them, I put them on my website to share with others. So that's why my website ends up being the way it is. Awesome, man. I, I did want you to go a little bit into your childhood experiences because I know that you've had encounters with... Uh, gray aliens but they didn't present as gray aliens they actually presented as uh, the gray aliens without their you know protective covering on as credo mutua talks about them being the, the mm -hmm. pink in color so you yeah. want to go through just like give a brief of a little bit of your alien abduction experiences because i think it's mostly been grays but anything other than that mm -hmm. as well feel free to share that sure yeah so in my case um i'll go backwards in time so one of the <laughs> one of the scariest ones that I've had, which totally mystified me at the time, is uh, it happened in, I think it was 2002 or early 2003. I think it was late 2002. So I was living in my studio apartment in Fort Lauderdale, Florida at the time. So a little studio apartment. There's like one apartment to the next to me and then one, no, another one this way. And uh, it was right around 4.30 in the morning. I was up writing an article. I was sitting on the floor typing on my computer. And all of a sudden, I hear what sounds like a rustling outside like like dry leaves scattering across the the cement that's what it sounded like uh or like a porcupine shaking its quills you know like a like a shh, kind of rustling sound i heard that and it was, it, was, it was scattering across the the front lawn and so i put out my mental feelers trying to figure out like what is this thing and i guess i must have been psychic enough that i connected with it and as soon as i connected with it the hair on my arms just like stood up because i could sense that whatever it was it was an animal and it wasn't human. Now it ran across the yard again, and I paid more attention to it. And it sounded to me like a, like a 70 pound, which I guess is like a 30 or 40 kilogram child, maybe seven years old, running extremely fast across the, the, the yard uh, on two legs. I, I, could, I could hear like, like two feet. And then all of a sudden it stopped. And then it started moving closer and closer towards my front door in the dark. I could hear it like step onto the cement patio outside. And I could hear its feet shuffling on the cement, like just like sand on the cement. So I could hear it going shh, 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 as it got closer and closer towards my door. Now my door at the time, it was made of frosted glass. So it's like frosted glass slats that could be angled like so, so you can kind of see out it. So it was only like halfway angled. So I couldn't see it when I was sitting on the floor, but if I stood yeah. up, I could see through, through, through the cracks. Um, but anyway, I could see enough through the frosted glass that 
when the entity or whatever it was finally pressed itself up against the door, it was starting to look in. So it had like its face here, it had its hand down below the doorknob. And I estimated its height to be right around three and a half to four feet tall. So the size of a child, but its color, its color was not like a gray alien color. Its color was like a, like an eraser, like a pink eraser. So it was a pink colored creature of some form. And it pressed itself up against the door. It was like pushing the door, like rattling the door. So I was like really freaked out. I was trying to figure out like what the heck was going on. So first I yelled at it thinking it was a neighbor. I was saying like, hey, identify yourself. Like, who are you? And it didn't say anything. And then I realized, well, okay, what if it's just like a burglar trying to get in? So I said, I'm going to call the cops, you know, if you don't get off my, my, my porch. And it didn't respond. So then I realized, what if it's not even human? And so then I said, in the name of the infinite creator, I, you know, I banish you, you know, get, like, get out, get out of here. I tried to do like an exercise. Dude, if, if you're going to say it in such a cute voice, I don't think that he's going to run away. I think no. it. <laughs> No, no, no. He he was still there. So I, so, I, I hope you actually got angry because I've, I've never seen you like that. You're always very like calm and composed. So I, I hope the grace got like a little bit of your angry side. As well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I admit I was more I was more freaked out than angry at that point. You know, I, I was feigning anger, but I was actually a little more terrified. Um, and w- what was going through my mind though at the time was, this can't be happening because everything I knew up to that point is that when aliens come for you, usually you're in an altered state. Usually you've been asleep and you just wake up and now you're in sleep paralysis. You know, you're like maybe slightly out of body or something like that. But no, I was fully awake. I had been working on an article. My brainwave state was probably in the beta brainwave state because I was so intensely focusing. So, and, and I had no alcohol, no drugs or anything. I wasn't hallucinating. And the door was shaking, so it was physical. And it was only one creature because um, usually grays, they come in multiples, I guess, because they're hive minded. So they kind of work in teams. But this was only one creature. It was pink. It was short like a gray alien, but um, I only saw the hand behind the, the frosted glass and I only saw the face behind the frosted glass. I couldn't see any eyes because it was too fuzzy. Um, so, yeah, so after I tried to cast it out in a religious sense and it didn't do anything, I reached down for the phone to call my girlfriend, Carissa, and to try to tell her like what was going on. And as I was dialing it and I was talking to her and I looked back up, it was gone. So it was finally gone. Now, fast forward um, two years later, 2004, Chris and I, we had escaped the hurricanes that were striking Florida, and we moved north into central Virginia, a town called Charlottesville. Oh, it's a pretty nice town. So anyway, we had a new apartment. It was near the woods. And one night around, I think, October of 2004, the window in the kitchen was open, and Carissa was on her laptop, and I was on my computer. And all of a sudden, I hear that rustling sound again, the exact same sound, outside the window. And this is in a totally different state. This is like mm, 17, 1800 miles north of Florida. Um, I heard the same sound. Carissa heard it. And as soon as she heard it, she knew exactly what it was. And she, because I told her like what, what it sounded like back in Florida. She wasn't there because I was in my apartment at the time. So now we're living together and she heard it. And we had a black cat. And the black cat heard it too. And the black cat just went crazy the black cat went running from window to window, pushing the blinds aside, trying to look out. Like, and, and the thing is, when we were living there, we had all sorts of animals. We had cats, dogs, raccoons outside in the woods, deer, uh, never a bear. But we, we, we even had a peacock outside once. And we had people coming in and out. And never once did our cat ever react to any of those like she did to whatever was outside this window. So um, Instead of looking out the window, we decided to just shut all the blinds, pick up the cat, lock the door, go into the bedroom, you know, and just kind of seal ourselves off from it. We didn't want to like mentally connect with it or God forbid, look at it. Because I imagine if I had looked at the creature and looked at it in its eyes, maybe it would have exerted some hypnotic effect on me. Mm. So, so I didn't I didn't want that risk. So we decided to just kind of like shut it out mentally. Um, don't give her permission. Don't invite it in. Don't be scared by it. And just kind of shut it out. And uh, it didn't come back after that so that was 2004 and then the pink alien at my door was back in 2002 and prior to that i really didn't have too much in terms of conscious alien experiences until um in the early 80s when i was a kid and this was in germany so for the benefit of the viewers who haven't heard the story before because i've told it in other podcasts but i'll tell it again Um, most of those were the classic gray alien abductions and most of those happened during the daytime. And the way it would always go down is uh, it was me, my mom, in my parents' bedroom during daytime, 
Uh, and this was in a town in Germany. So I was born in Germany. I grew up in Germany for eight years. I spoke German for a long time. Um, yeah, so my mom would tell me, you know, Thomas, uh, stay, stay there. I have some business to attend to out in the rest of the hallway. And I could feel in the rest of the apartment, it was very, very busy. Almost like, almost like when you're at a party and you go into another room and you close the door. So now you're in a room alone, but you can tell there's all this activity going out and on in the rest of the apartment. That's what it felt like. So she went out there and she closed the door. And as soon as she closed the door, that's when all of a sudden my suppressed memories would start coming back. All the previous times that these abductions had happened, it would always start out the same way. And so I knew what would be happening next. I knew that the door would be opening, that several grays would come in through the door. And uh, so I would either try to hide under the bed or I would run into the corner and try to you know, cower down in the corner. But every single time, um, the grays would eventually get me. Now, a couple times they couldn't get me because we had a bed where you can lift up one end of the bed to store blankets and pillows underneath. Mm. So I, I was strong enough to lift that up because it was spring loaded. So I lifted up the bed. I jumped in there, closed it behind me, and I just was looking out through the gap and in the bed. And I could see the gray bodies and legs kind of running back and forth in the bedroom like that. Uh, that was interesting. And I would be in there probably for five, ten minutes before they probably called some supervisor. And as soon as a, the person, I think, I think, I get the impression that it was human. I couldn't quite clearly remember it, but it sounded human and it looked sort of human from what I could see through the crack. And then my memory would fade out from there because they exert like a psychic um, force field on your consciousness to blank you out and switch you into an alternate personality, which has an alternate set of memories. So the, the regular Tom that, you know, was a little kid running around and going to kindergarten, um, that, that, that kid would not remember these experiences until the next abduction would begin. So it was kind of like, almost like yeah. a split personality in a way. And Similar to what they do in MK Ultra, like in terms of fracturing the mm -hmm. mind and then using it, like triggers and stuff to uh, change the alters which they program. Right, exactly. And um, right, exactly. And the thing about being a kid, though, is because your brainwave state is probably in the theta or the alpha state, um, and because your mind is more plastic compared mm -hmm. to an adult whose whose brain is pretty much crystallized at that point, because you, your brain is more plastic as a child, memories are hard. It's, it's harder to to split a personality when you're a kid. You know, I mean, that's Hard. usually when a lot of trauma happens and where kids do end up splitting. But it's not as reliable as if you try to traumatize an adult and that the mind just cracks because it's not plastic. You know, it's not fluid like it is when, when you're a kid. So I think that's why I was able to remember even the beginning of these abductions. Um, and so when they when they would happen, uh, I did remember enough of it that for a period of time when I was around two or three, I was telling my mom and my dad and my grandparents all about always about the, the stone men or the gray men that would come around. And, you know, they didn't believe me. They, they thought it was just imagination. But I asked them about it many years later and they confirmed that, yes, I was always talking about these things. So uh, I do think um, I had abductions going on at the time. I also had classic post-traumatic stress disorder syndromes. Like, I was absolutely terrified of anything that was white and bulbous. So even even like a dandelion, after you blow all the little things off and you look and they got that little tiny nub, that that little nub reminded me of what the gray bald alien heads look like. Um, and so I was terrified of that. I was terrified of owls. Like my grandma had this wooden owl. This was like three feet tall, and owls, you know. Owls are cute, but they're also kind of creepy sometimes. So they got these eyes, right? These, these owl eyes. And the statue, the little wooden statue had that. And that scared the hell out of me because it reminded me um, subconsciously at the time because I didn't remember it at that exact moment. But subconsciously, it reminded me of these things that were coming into my reality and taking me and terrifying me. So, yeah, my childhood was pretty, pretty scary. But in the end, it helped me get interested in the subject and to research it and to learn about it enough that I even ended up writing a book about it and having lots of articles on my website to help other people. Great, man. I feel like the darkest times and the, you know, the stuff that happens in our life that we tend to look at as deeply negative always has something that, that comes out of it overall. And I've heard you speak in other interviews as well. Like it's actually, maybe you planned that to happen in your life at that time so that you could, you know, grow stronger and actually learn all the ways to, defend yourself against these beings so that you could do the kind of work you're doing today because i don't think if you if you didn't have those experiences and you didn't learn what you did you'd probably be taken out by now because just understanding the level of uh, self-mastery and control over your own perceptions and thoughts it takes to actually 
block these things out uh, i f- i feel like most people have to go through really difficult stuff in order to really be forced to you know chase that or to attain that level so uh, just in terms of how you were able to cope dealing with all these experiences uh, firstly what made the phenomena drop off because i know that like after these experiences it, it did drop off so what were your tools of self defense uh, and uh, how do you go about learning them how are you not like broken or fractured because a lot of people who mm-hmm. go through these kind of experiences they just go back and uh, they lose all their rationality and they're just living in like a paranoid delusional state all the yeah. time so how do you make it man and how how are you the person you are today despite all of that that you've gone through yeah it was pretty difficult to to be honest but i almost went down that route myself back in 2001 so 2001 i was still in college uh, i was studying physics and electrical engineering So I was in I was still in college when I came across some material online talking about the matrix control system or just the, the matrix. Um it was that free your brain website some of you people might know about it but anyway it was written by a probably by a paranoid schizophrenic. But the thing about schizophrenics is um as much as they're wrong about certain things they're also right about certain things because they're not really locked into consensus reality. So when they're outside of consensus reality they're picking up on things that are hidden you know behind the veil like the, the matrix control system they're picking up on that but at the same time they also have their internal uh subjective errors of of cognition that get mixed into it too so you kind of get a mix of both so that's why I enjoy reading schizophrenic writings sometimes because you do get the truth component mixed in with some of the crazy and uh it's just so you have to use weird. your discernment to you know separate the mm-hmm. the good stuff from from the crap yeah right Right exactly. So I'm I'm pretty good at that because so here's the thing. Some people they want to have absolutely pure sources like for the most credible academic, right? With the, the most scientific studies behind it. Um because they're afraid of being wrong and they're afraid of being um discredited. So they they want the maximum credibility. Uh, the problem is however that that when you do that you're you're narrowing your data to such a, a narrow sliver that you never ever get access to the bigger picture. So it's better to loosen up your tolerances somewhat and become better at discernment so that it's almost like um it's almost like when they have radio satellite dishes that look that radio telescopes that look into the distant galaxies they operate at well not only do they collect data but they have very good signal processing to differentiate between the signal that they're picking up and the noise that's always in the environment and because they have multiple antennas with such sensitive noise ratings and so on they're able to to map what galaxies look like all right so and, and i i try to do the same thing with data i try to be very broad and have very good signal filtering which you can only really do over time through trial and error you kind of get better and better at it so you just read more sources and you think through it and you uh spot mistakes um but but like in my case when we're when I'm talking about dealing with negative entities and how I didn't get taken out I did I did come very close several times to get taken out um but you have to understand though that this might not make much sense if you don't have context for why I'm saying this but essentially free will and permission is a big big component of our lives here and what is allowed to be done to us in life you know because we're not really born as blank slates that are thrown into this mechanical universe and anything goes it's not like that there is a there's a metaphysical structure behind our lives there is a, a curriculum some sort of a pre-incarnational plan agreements contracts all these things that it's just like when they when they shoot a movie right when you watch a movie you only see the plot you don't see all the production that went into it all the contracts that were signed all the money the you know the the talent that was hired and the, the people that are behind the camera I think our lives are sort of similar to that in that we as we are conscious in these egos we only see the movie part of it but we don't see the production that's going on behind the scenes that is influencing our lives every single day. So, if a bad guy of the movie wants to do something to the main character, well, there is the, the script writers have some control over that. And 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 maybe maybe the bad guy truly is like a bad person in real life. who as an actor wants to do something to the main to the main actor and if he wants to do that then he's going to have to talk to the scriptwriter say like hey psst, can you write me into the scene and so I can do this you know because I really want to like violate this person i think it's something like that but more archetypal more like not, not as literal as i'm saying it i'm just saying that there's there's like back backstage stuff that happens um that negative forces often have to go through in order to get us and to kill us and to, to really take us out. So what this really means in in a practical sense 
is that if you have enough spiritual protection, these negative forces have to go through a multi-step process in order to finally be able to take you out. So initially, it might just be uh, a temptation. Um, it might be a little paranormal event that tries to scare you or get you overly focused on it. And so if you, like for example, um, this is an example of a guy that I knew. He, he was relaxing on his backyard patio, just kind of relaxing. And he looked up and he saw like a UFO in the sky, like a silver ship. He saw it like as clear as a day. And um, he watched it for a bit and it went away. The next day he looked out his kitchen window, he saw it again. And that's when he got hooked. You see, he started obsessing over it. He started engaging with them mentally. And over time, they started taking over his mind more and more and more. And he just lost his sanity. At one point, they were sadistically telling him to follow their ship as they were going f across the fields. And he was walking across the fields through the bushes, getting all ripped up and torn by the, by the thorns, um, getting all scratched up. And they were just kind of snickering to themselves sadistically of make, being able to make this human mm -hmm. follow them around in this crazy state. I'm not sure if those are aliens. I mean, I mean, sometimes it's just demonic entities that can induce hallucinations in people. It's probably what it was in his case. But I'm just saying that there's a multi-step process before you can be taken out. And so therefore, if you are clever, if you are aware, if you're smart, you can spot stage one, you can spot stage two and stop it right there. Catch yourself, you know, um, bring yourself back into balance um, so that you never actually have to get to step eight, nine or 10. Now, typically step eight, nine or 10, by the time a person gets to that point, they are homeless. They are, they have utterly given up in life. Maybe they're fully addicted to drugs or alcohol. Um, and at that point, once you're on the street and your defenses are that far down, it doesn't take much to, to be killed. I mean, be stabbed, shot, beat to death or whatever. Um, and so, so typically when these forces try to take a person out, they try to do it in a plausible and deniable way. Uh, it's not just, oh, this person just vaporized into thin air and, and people saw an alien standing there with a ray gun. That never happens. That never happens. Typically what happens is a person commits suicide or they get in an accident or they get cancer, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, and cancers, you know, as aggressive as they are, you know, part, partly they are metaphysically induced, but partially, of course, there's also environmental factors, genetic factors, epigenetic factors, right? Uh, and so a person who is taken out by cancer artificially, there were things that they could have done early on probably to, to prevent the cancer from developing as, as, as much as it had, right? I wish you were in touch with Dr. Carla Turner before she died, or maybe like she yeah. was she was into your work more. You know, she she could have lived on, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I really. And I know you 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 shared that uh, a lot of people interview you when they're in these kind of states, and that you know you, you try to help them in terms of getting out of the mm -hmm. feedback loop that that they're stuck in. How how is it emotionally like having to hear from these people and you know sometimes not not being able to save them and then succumbing to you know whatever's going on. Right. Yeah. You know, I've dealt with so many, so many people that need help that I have to almost take a doctor approach to it where you, you can, you can have compassion, you can have empathy, but you got to be careful because if you, if you do it too much for too long, you get compassion fatigue and then you can't help anyone. Right. So, uh, you know, some, sometimes I have to take a more cerebral approach. Um, mm. And as soon as, as soon as I read their email, I'm already like thinking like, I don't want to say like I'm a, like, like a robot, but I'm, I'm diagnosing, I'm thinking of possibilities, I'm thinking of possible solutions, I'm gauging how rational and sane they are. Because when a person is too far gone beyond a certain point, they won't hear anything you're saying. You can give yeah. them all the advice, you know, you can even be on video giving them advice and they'll nod, but nothing is getting through to them because it's almost like, um, it's just like when a person is asleep and dreaming, a lot of times they don't know they're dreaming, right? So if you're in a dream and you don't know you're dreaming, someone can tell you like, hey, you're in a dream and they'll probably ignore them because you're in a trance, you know, like your reality switch is turned off. So some people unfortunately have their reality switch turned off and they can't even see their own behavior. And those types, usually they wind up in mental institutions or unfortunately homeless. Um, partially, partially it depends on your degree of self-awareness and partially it also de depends on your intelligence. Because things like like the whole like targeted individual phenomenon where people get gang stalked and they get directed energy weapons beamed at them and they hear voices and electronic glitches, things like that. 
it happens to a broad spectrum of different kinds of people, right? You get people that already might have been schizophrenic, and you get other people who are extremely intelligent. They're professionals. They, I mean, they're really smart in life, and it happens to them too. So it's not really dependent on intelligence, but what does what does depend on intelligence is how they respond to it. Mm. So I've I've known some people who have gotten targeted like that, who were very smart, very resourceful. Um, they had a good spiritual grounding, and they were also very self-aware. So they were able to beat it only because they weren't unintelligent and emotional and just kind of like lost in their own heads. They weren't that. So therefore, they're able to, to correct it. So that's why, you know, self-awareness, self-examination, introspection, and self-control. Those things are the essential ingredients to surviving pretty much any matrix manipulation or attack that comes your way. But if you're missing any of those, then that becomes the open doorway through which these negative entities can kind of trip you up in life. So yeah, let's take this uh, step by step. I want you to lay out your uh, 360 degree view because I've, I've read one of your chapters in your book where you've really absorbed like the raw material, the Cassiopeian transcripts, all like m many other texts and you've laid out like what you think is going on in the multiverse in terms of the different dimensions and densities and uh, different stages of consciousness and what the bigger picture is behind all of it. You know, you want to just like elaborate on that and then I'll zoom in on some aspects of it. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a big question, right? Because mm. I'm, I'm like trying to explain what's going on with, with entire reality. <laughs> yeah. No, but you know, it's, it's important to it's important to understand. So the thing that I've been thinking about a lot recently is about whether reality is a collective dream. Is it, is it like a big dream that we're all sharing? Or is it like the Matrix, some sort of a technological simulation? And the reason I even ponder these questions to begin with is because, well, in life, we have things like synchronicities. We have things like omens, you know, like signs. And we have the ability to use our intention, our visualization, and our emotion to manifest things in life, the, the so-called law of attraction, right? Now, all those things are identical, well, pretty much identical to what you can experience in dreams, right? In dreams, you can get dream signs, like dream symbols that communicate some symbolic message to you. They just appear in your dream. You can um, focus your intention and your emotion in a dream and manifest a change in the dream. You can, you can change your dream environment if you're lucid and uh, you, know, you try to change the dream. You can do that in a dream. And so how is it that waking reality acts like a dream? That shouldn't be possible if you think about it. Well, it certainly wouldn't be possible if this reality were simply a mechanical construct as physics says it is. You know, just atoms, everything's just chaos and chance and determinism. That's all it is. There's no intelligence behind it. Well, that's automatically dismissed if you have ever had one single undeniable synchronicity or paranormal experience or ever manifested something using your, your intention. So clearly there is something dreamlike about reality. But at the same time, if you compare reality with a dream, well... In a dream, um, things are way more fluid, right? So, for example, you can have an object, you can look away, you can look back, and now the object is different. It didn't maintain persistence as a real object does. So there's something about waking world where the illusion is way more persistent than it is in a dream. But at the same time, like I said, you know, we got synchronicities, we got dream symbols, we, we can manifest in, in waking world, we can manifest in dreams. So there's also an overlap there. So what I concluded, therefore, is that reality is indeed essentially a collective dream, but there is a layer to it that is more computer-like, more programmed, more deterministic or mechanical. Okay, that's, that's what I concluded. So ultimately, I think consciousness is primary. Consciousness is the fundamental of all existence, okay? So imagine if you got like a, like a blank sheet of paper that you can draw on, that sheet of paper is consciousness. And everything else from the people, the objects, the environments, this universe, that universe, this timeline, that timeline, aliens, humans, animals, that's all the stuff you draw on the white sheet of paper. So everything takes place within the space of consciousness. However, if you think about dreams, once again, you see, when you're in a dream, right, you can, like I said, focus your consciousness, your intent, and you can change a part of the dream. And that takes time. Like, for example, if, if I want to manifest a flower in a dream, I have to visualize it. I have to intend it. Maybe I have to look away and look back. Oh, okay, finally, there's a flower. That took maybe three, four, five seconds. However, if in a dream I push on a door 
or I open the door, it opens right away. It acts just like a real door does in the real world. So there's physics inside of a dream that reacts instantly. Mm. At the same time, though, manifesting in a dream takes time. And likewise, here in this waking world, if I like push on a door in the waking world, it, it moves right away because that's what physics is. At the same time, though, if I try to manifest something like a flower or, you know, like 100 bucks or whatever, you know, if I try to manifest something, it takes hours, days, maybe weeks. So likewise, just like in the dreams, in the waking world, physics is instant, but manifesting takes time. And so I realized, yes, okay, so everything is a construct of consciousness, but there is a part of it that reacts instantly, and that part is computer-like, it's simulation-like, it's programmed, okay? Now, if you look at occult theory, okay, occult theory, like occultism, theosophy, or Rudolf Steiner's anthroposophy, even Rosicrucianism, they all understand that besides this physical layer of reality, besides physicality, there's also what they call the etheric layer, and then above it, the astral layer. And these are very, I mean, these terms are just what they gave it, so I'm using it. But actually, it goes even way back to the ancient Egyptians. They were aware of the physical body, they were aware of the ka, which is like the etheric body, and they're aware of the ba, which is like the astral body. So they had terms for these things, even, even back then. So this is not just like new age modern nonsense, right? So anyway, we have to understand that beyond the physical plane, there is the next thing that's a little bit above it is the etheric, the etheric plane. And what that is, is it's like an energetic scaffolding. Um, it's kind of like the matrix code that projects and fashions the physicality as we know it. So for example, if you load up a browser and you go to a, web, to, go to a website, the HTML code that is behind it and the JavaScript and all the other code that is behind it, that code is what, what ultimately projects the image that you see on your screen. That's what leads to your browser rendering a certain web page the way it is. Well, the same thing with physicality, right? If I take this glass of water here, behind and beneath it in another dimension, there is the etheric plane, which has code in it. And the code is what codes for the properties of this. It codes for water, glass, gravity, the intermolecular forces between the, okay, I don't want to get too scientific, but you know, you know what I mean? It codes for all the physics stuff. And so therefore, you can almost say that reality, even though it's a consciousness construct, it has an etheric plane to it that operates in a computer-like fashion. It has, you know, probably has bits in it. It's like, like, the, it's like a quantum foam of ones and zeros, like, like, like code or something. And it codes for physicality. And because it's programmed, it can react instantly. You know, just like just like if you do martial arts enough, you program your subconscious and your body to react to a punch, just like this. You know, you just something like that. You don't even have to think about it. It's just instant. Versus if someone asked you, for example, uh, hey, you know, can you come up with a, a cool idea for a book I'm going to write, like I want to for this chapter? Well, you have to sit there, you have to think about it. Okay, imagine this, imagine that. That might take you minutes, might take you hours or days to do that because you're consciously thinking about it. So that's why it takes time. But if it's simply like a like a karate block boom, you know, that's programmed. So it happens instantly. So I think that collective consciousness, this, this collective dream that we're in, there's a layer to it that is more conscious, which takes more time. It operates on the level of symbolism, archetypes, emotions, meaning, and that's more associated with astral energies, the astral plane, and so on. And then there's another part which is programmed and therefore reacts instantly. And that's the etheric plane. And it is what generates physics. So, you know, in the physical world, Everything happens at the speed of light. You know, as soon as you start a chemical reaction, as soon as you try to open a door, as soon as you reach for something, the interactions happen at the speed of light. So that, that's the speed limit of it. And the speed of light is way faster than the speed of thought because you have to think about something and it takes time. So that's ultimately what I've been thinking about recently, that we do live within a collective consciousness construct, but a part of it is computer-like. And we can call that a simulation. So in, in a sense, you know, everything physical, like this right here, this glass, this is... A simulation in the sense that we think it's a glass of water, but it's really actually code. It's actually etheric code that is projecting this. And behind it is consciousness, but consciousness requires uh, an interfacing layer to generate this. Just like, you know, the, the, intent of a the intent of a video game programmer can only be accomplished through the code and through the GPU and the, the CPU and the LCD monitor, right? So there's this huge technological interface layer between the intention of the programmer and what the player finally experiences. And likewise, between the infinite creator or between the, the higher gods or eons, whatever you want to call them, between them and between us experiencing this life, this reality, 
there has to be inter intermediate layers that kind of mm. translate their intentions into what we experience here. So that's what I'm talking about with the, the production crew of the movie. You know, you got the cameras, you got the lights, you got the stage, you got the, the backdrop and everything. So I think our reality is like that. But uh, I guess, you know, another metaphor would be Plato's cave for people who are familiar with it. People in a cave, they see these shadows on the wall and that's all they ever see their entire lives. Little do they know the shadows are actually being projected by people near the cave entrance. It's kind of like making shadow puppets, you know, the light coming in. Um, yeah, so we live in a false reality. We live in an illusion. Um, but the illusion has purpose. I, I do think it has a positive purpose. However, because beings have free will, because we've been endowed with the ability for free will to, to choose, some beings have used the, the ability of free will to choose against the better interest of all the rest of life in the universe. You know, turning their backs on the divine, turning their backs on, on their, their fellow brother and sister, and choosing to exploit others for their own gain. You know, that's allowed within a, a collective dream where free will exists. Hmm. Um, and not only that, but when these negative forces, when they exist within a physical environment, you know, even, even if the physical environment is projected by the etheric plane, even though, you know, it's ultimately an illusion, because it is programmed the way that it is, we have physical consequences, right? We have action, reaction, gravity, force, energy, momentum. Momentum and energy, that is what causes a bullet to destroy you when it enters into your body. Physics is what kills you, okay? And so if a being with free will wants to violate another person and they both live within physicality, that's how you get force. That's how you get violence. And so even though this is a collective construct of consciousness, even though it might have a higher spiritual purpose, the fact that there's free will in physics allows there to be free will violations. And that's why we have to wear our seatbelts. That's why we have to lock our doors. You know, that's why we have to put food into our bodies to keep from dying because those are the rules of this simulation or at least this part of the collective consciousness. So that's my view on it. And that's the basis. And from that, you can go in so many different directions. Like for example, my, my book called Gnosis. That book, I get all into how, because of these, because of these physics that operate in this reality, you can make technology from it that not only works on the physical plane, but it also works on the etheric and astral plane. So you wind up with this amazing alien technology that can alter physicality as we know it. Um, for example, it can alter the timeline. It can probably manifest food out of thin air. It can basically treat reality as if it were a dream because it's operating at the level of the, the collective dream. Okay. Like, like for example, if I, if I were to take this glass of water, my nice handy prop, if I took a hammer to it, it would smash, right? Well, a hammer, a fake hammer against a fake glass, it's going to create a fake shattering, but that's all happening within the fiction of physics. It's all happening within the dream. But what if I had a technology that instead of shattering the glass with a hammer, what if it merely rewrote the code of the glass itself? Well, all of a sudden the glass would turn, well, the water would turn into wine, okay? If I wanted to code it for that, it could turn into wine. You could, you could accomplish miracles if you have control over the etheric matrix code that projects mm -hmm. physics. And so I looked through history, whether it's Christianity, Hinduism, um, folklore, anthropological evidence, and I found evidence of alien technology like this being used throughout history by various forces. And a lot of times it was abused, it was misused, and that led to historical events that screwed up our timeline as we know it. So the world that we see, like right now, everything that's happening with the, the potential war between Russia, China, and NATO, and the United States, um, the racial conflicts, the all, the all the problems that we're having, a lot of these things trace back in history, ultimately to the use and misuse of alien technologies uh, early, early in history. So anyway, but that's only possible because of the way that this reality works. You know, the fact that it is not a mechanical universe, but a construct of consciousness that has an astral layer and an etheric layer. And if you can reprogram the etheric layer, you can alter physics and that leads to the alteration of history. So, you know, that's like a general overview. And then you've got aliens in there, you've got demons too. It's a, it's, it's a big complicated picture. Yeah. So uh, what I really li like, one of your analogies I really liked is you were talking about how in the dream, <clears throat> like everything's a result of consciousness, but then there's different levels of consciousness, like a, a rock or a chair in the dream will not be as sentient as maybe like a dream character like you and I. So 
do you want to like translate that and relate it to how it uh, you know translates into real life with respect to the different levels of consciousness that exist within creation i mean of course we have like astral and etheric layers behind uh, you know sentient life forms but then consciousness itself manifests at different levels in different densities right so do you mm-hmm. just want to like give a break up of the different densities and what kind of beings exist there what the purpose of different realms are like i've, I've read in your writing that the fourth density has a, a different properties and a different purpose as to what the characteristics of the beings there and how they operate compared to what lies on like 5d both in terms of positive polarity and the negative polarity okay yeah so i wrote an article on my website it's called sto sts and densities i think that's what it's called yeah. now you know there are many different many different um viewpoints or paradigms that you can use to try to understand how reality works okay you can go strictly with the mystical occult tradition and talk about uh you know the ast- astral plane the etheric plane the the causal plane and you know all these different planes that they divide subdivide things into but out of all the different systems that i've looked into the one that i find works the best for everything that i've come across would be probably what what would be in the, the law of one books the raw material okay so that you know okay it, it's channeling and some people have a big problem with channeling but as i said earlier if you loosen up your tolerances a little bit and you up your discernment then you can look at something like channeling and get some very useful information from it okay so that's why you're really pretty tapped in about it because i I've, i've read your writings about how to dif- differentiate what uh, criteria to use to differentiate between the credibility mm-hmm. of different kinds of channelings and what uh, metrics people can use to see you know whether it's more likely to be credible or not yeah and that's pretty important um so yeah i'll, I'll just briefly get into that so channeling you know there's different methods of channeling some people use Ouija boards some people are trance channelers where they kind of like fade out in consciousness and some other voice speaks through them it's a complicated topic because what is it that is actually working through people when they channel um a lot of times it's just people's own subconscious personalities that are coming through so it's not even an external entity it's just a part of their subconscious that has autonomy which is totally possible because if you think about it when you're in a dream you're talking to someone right the person is saying things that you can't really anticipate but it's being generated what by your subconscious so even in a dream you can have you can be surrounded by 12 people all saying different things and those 12 people are being generated by your subconscious usually now it is possible for entities to jack into a dream and appear as a dream character and that's an external influence but let, let's ignore that for a moment you you can have characters in a dream that are independent mm. so likewise if a trans channeler is faded out it's possible for one of their subconscious so-called dream characters in a way to come come through and speak okay and that's a subconscious speaking that's one possibility another possibility is when you have either a demon which is like a, a malevolent non-physical entity uh they can jack into a person and speak through them or you can have discarnate humans so people so humans who people who die and they don't move on into the afterlife they kind of hang around the earth plane and they kind of network with each other and they play tricks on the living humans they feed off their energy and so on those kinds they can also get involved in in channeling as well like speaking through people and another possibility is the idea of what's called a, a thought form or an egregore that's what it's what it's called in occultism and all a thought form is it's a construct within the etheric and astral planes that resembles an entity but it's not really an entity it's just a temporary ai like construct so so if you have a really intense thought and you visualize a person having a certain whatever if you if you put enough emotion and thought into it you can program the etheric and astral environment to uh create that you know in the etheric so it's not physical it's just non-physical but that thing has temporary autonomy and they can speak so it's almost like an externalized dream character that's that's what it is essentially that's what a thought form is and so those things can also come through so um on youtube there are several videos on a famous experiment that was done it was called the philip experiment So the Philip experiment I think was done in the 70s possibly. Well, these people they, they it was a scientific scientific experiment. They wanted to see what would happen if you had several people come together to do a séance to invoke uh, an uh, an old deity, right? Like like an old entity. Except for the entity that they were invoking was fake. They made it up. It was like a fictional plot, you know, that they, they this, this guy named Richard um who lived like hundreds of years ago. and they gave him a back story and everything and so every time they would sit down at the table they would try to invoke this richard character who's totally fictional well after enough time they started getting occult phenomena 
in the paranormal phenomena coming through. And this Richard entity started to manifest through the communications, you know, confirming that, yes, you know, I'm Richard, and this is what happens, and it kind of elaborated on the story. Well, it wasn't real. They made it up, but it became real in, in, a, in an occult sense. So that's an example of a thought form being generated by enough people putting enough thought and emotion into it. So, you know, some channeling is that as well. But finally, the last possibility is you can also have aliens or hyperdimensional beings, even beyond aliens, come through and take over someone's consciousness or even just psychically communicate words and images to them, which then they consciously translate into, into spoken word. So, so therefore, you know, when you look into channeling, it covers that entire spectrum. Mm. And of course, you know, when a demon is doing it, when a ghost is doing it, the channeler is not going to either know it or is never going to admit it. So there's a lot of channeling out there that tries to claim it is from angels or aliens or some light beings, you know, from the sixth density or whatever, but is actually from ghosts, demons, the person's own subconscious, or you know, in some cases, completely fabricated, right? So you have to be careful. You have to be very, very careful with channeling. And of all the channeling that I've looked into, there are only like two or three that I find are even useful at all. One was the, the Law of One books from LL Research, Carla Record. The other is the Cassiopeian transcripts from the Quantum Future Group, I think if they're still called that. And, um, and then the third one, probably uh, Barbara Marciniak's first book, Bringers of the Dawn. Mm. Those, those three I find, well, maybe maybe the Seth books as well, you know. Yeah. Um, I've seen you recommend Seth material on your website as well. Yeah, it's not bad. Uh, it was actually pretty good for its time. Um, but, but overall, I would say the Law of One books and the Cassiopeian material have been the most helpful to me. And when I say helpful, what I'm saying is I don't take anything that they say as being gospel. I don't ever mm -hmm. take it on authority, right? I take it more as a working hypothesis to be tested. So, for example, when the Law of One gets into the different densities, I think about it and I say, well, is there any simpler way that you could boil that down, like a simpler model that would explain reality? And to me, I would say, no, it actually is the simplest that I know. So the way that it, con it conceives reality, it does conceive reality as a collective dream being projected by an infinite consciousness, like an infinite creator that projects reality. But the way that reality is divided, it's divided into almost like a, like a rainbow, like a white light is divided into different, like seven different colors. Well, the same thing with all of the creation, there are seven, seven different layers to it. And so they get into things like, oh, first density. What is first density? It sounds like a mystical new age term. No, all first density is, is the, the mineral realm, the mineral, chemical, atoms, molecules, physics. Like, so when, it, when I earlier talked about the physics engine and the, the physics simulation done by the etheric, well, the etheric and the physics and all that, that's all what they would consider first density. So that, that's what that is. Like, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty basic. Uh, I think that includes even like microbes and like the earliest protozoan type um, living living things, you know, fun fungus and so on. Mm. That would be in that category. And then you step up to second density. That's like a more complex uh, classification of life. And that's where you get things like plants and animals. Okay, that's second density. Now, if you think about these things in terms of etheric and astral energy fields and complexity, you can totally understand it from that framework too. For example... When we talk about, like, we, we, like, let's say you got a quartz crystal, right? A quartz crystal. A quartz crystal is, what is it mostly? It's a, it's a, it's a molecular, it's an arrangement. It's like a latticework arrangement of molecules. So it's just mostly just atoms. And a crystal might have a stronger etheric energy field than a you know, plain old rock because it's more ordered. You know, so it's got certain quantum properties that a rock, a regular rock doesn't have. So a crystal would be an example of a mid to high level first density thing. Whereas a regular rock or a chair or, you know, a piece of metal or something would be a little bit lower than that because it doesn't have the, the ordered nature that a crystal does. All right. Um, so it has an etheric energy field, but it doesn't have an astral body. Okay. It doesn't have an astral body, which is, uh, which is associated with emotion, emotion and, yeah. impulse, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, like, uh, sentience, like sentience, all right. Like your, your ability to, to consciously react to something. Now, when you start getting into plants and animals, that's when you start getting more astral, right? Because an animal, right? An animal has drives, has impulses. When an animal makes a noise, like a crying noise or like, like a cat, you know, when a cat makes like a happy meow versus a sad meow, those emotions are being conveyed. So animals are sentient and they have emotions and uh, they have their own volition. They have their own will. It's not like a house plant that just sits there. You know, they, they go where they want. So animals have astral bodies. They have etheric bodies. They have physical bodies. 
But what do they not have? They don't have they don't have the solid core of spirit consciousness that humans have that allows us to reincarnate and to maintain our identity through different success, successive incarnations. All right. So they have the etheric, they have the astral, but they don't have well, the higher the higher animals do, like certain pets like cats and dogs that become pets of humans and like whales and dolphins and higher apes they do have the seed of spirit already but i'm talking about if you compare it to like worms or crickets or things like that and, you know those, those types of animals you know they don't really have it those animals they only have soul energy um but their core identity is actually their their species oversoul so their entire species has an ego or, or an intelligence up in the astral planes and this this is something that rudolf steiner the founder of anthroposophy he, he talks about this quite a bit he talks about how animals animal species they have almost like a collective consciousness in a way and so when an animal dies their energy it it doesn't just simply disappear it kind of gets retracted back into that group oversoul right whereas what steiner said with humans is that each each individual human is almost like a species unto itself and that we have our own higher thing that we retract back into after we die and this is our higher self you know this is our spirit our higher mind over soul whatever you want to call it so we have each one of those for each person or maybe if you're like a twin flame or twin soul or something maybe both of you share the same higher self but generally each person has their own higher self um, versus animals where it's the entire species that has mm. you know this one higher self so that's the difference. Um, but as you can see, as we go up through the different densities, um, humans would be third density. So that's, what, that's where we are. And we have ego. We have this, this core of consciousness that has uh, free will abilities. And so once you're within 3D, once you're within third density, according to this paradigm, that's when you start having the ability to choose between whether you as an individual versus others are going to um, help, help better others or exploit them for your own gain. Okay. And so that, that, re that results into a, a polarization of life into STS, which is service to self and STO, which is service to others. But I mean, they say service to others, but what they really mean is you're serving, you're, you're furthering your own evolution by furthering the evolution of others. So you're, so you're serving self through others versus STS, which is serving self at the expense of others. And the reason I bring this up is because you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about STO and what it means. Some people think that service to others means you totally forget about yourself. You neglect yourself. You know, you become like a, like an ascetic who has no possessions. And all you ever do is just give, give, give until you burn out and die. And, you know, but that's not what it is. You, you're not, STO is about balance. You're balancing yourself versus others. And the reason why that is important is because if you want to be of maximum help to the universe, to others, you have to take care of yourself in order to be a better help in the future for others, mm. right? You can't help others from a position of weakness or poverty unless you just give advice or something. I mean, you could be like a poor sage, but generally you can't really help others from a position of weakness or poverty. And so therefore you have to take care of yourself enough that therefore you have the resources, the energy, the time to be able to help others, right? So therefore STO is about always finding the maximum point of balance that enhances the, the learning and the free will and the spiritual wellness of yourself and others, you know, for the longest term possible. That's what STO is. This, this is what and I really liked about uh, your writing as well on this subject is when you were talking about how, you know, helping s someone or a being who's negatively oriented is actually mm -hmm. fueling STS and not not really helping, you know, right. true service to others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's very important because one of the big mistakes that people make when they have a good heart is they help others indiscriminately without discernment. And so you get things like, uh, like for guys, you might get the white knight syndrome where the guy wants to be the white knight that helps a girl in distress. Little does he know that she's like a toxic narcissist and isn't interested in helping herself. And so he just ends up getting exploited and used and ultimately burned out and disappointed. And all of a sudden he becomes black pilled or something and starts or red pill and starts hating women, becomes like a misogynist. He you know, joins that whole, the whole, that whole crowd, that insult crowd. Yeah. And, but that, but that's a logical fallacy. You don't, you really don't need to go there if you're just smart about it. Um, and so discernment, discernment is one of the things that we are here to learn. I guarantee you hundred percent. We're all here to learn discernment. Um, and the reason why we need discernment is because, and when I say we, I'm talking about you, me, people listening, people that we 
that we realize are we're, we're generally good people. Mm. We, we, don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't really have a dark heart. You know, we're not here to 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 kind of rape rape the earth and exploit other people. And some, some people are. You know, some people are probably not even people. But some people are here on that dark side. But we're not on the dark side. We're on the good side. But if you're a good person, you can't be here and not have discernment because you're going to get eaten up. You're going to get used, abused, burned out, and then and then you're you're of no good to anyone. Or or worse, you get so angry and so you know so cynical about humanity that you join the dark side, and whether you know it or not. And so. You know, a lot of spiritual seekers face that risk. You know, they want to help others. They want to be good. They want to be of the light. But it always comes at the cost of boundaries and spiritual well-being. And as I said, you can't you can't help others when you're fully burned out. So sometimes not helping is helping. Right. Mm. And and although you know other times, for example, when you're trying to help someone, you also have to look at what part of them you're helping. Because a person isn't just a person. When you look at a person, you see the physical body, of course. And some people think, well, I don't, I don't just see the physical body. I also see the person that's inside them. But they're not going far enough because they're not just seeing the person behind them. They're, they're ignoring the distinction between their inner spirit and their ego and shadow. Okay, mm. They're ignoring the distinction between the two. They just think, oh, it's just the person behind the physical, behind the mask. Well, no, you have to go further than that. And you have to distinguish between the light in them and the darkness in them. Because when you help a person, you might only end up being an enabler. You might only end up enabling their ego and their shadow. And their ego and shadow is, a, is like a hostage taker. Okay, So their, their spirit, their true self, is inside of them and has been taken hostage by their ego and shadow. And so if you feed and enable the ego and shadow, you end up actually hurting the hostage because you're making the hostage taker stronger, okay? And so that's why if you, if, if, if the hostage taker comes at you, the shadow in them comes at you and wants you to do something for them or feed them in a certain way, and if you realize what's going on, that it's a toxic, narcissistic, you know, or even a sociopathic kind of thing going on, and you say no, they might pout, they might cry, they might call you names for abandoning them or being a mean person. And it's supposed to, that's supposed to like play on your, on, you know, it's supposed to tug on your heart. You know, it's mm -hmm. supposed to tug, tug on your desire to help others. But if you just say no and you're firm with them, uh, you might actually end up helping their hostage. You might actually end up helping their, their spirit because now you're making the hostage taker weaker and you're giving their spirit a fighting chance, right? So sometimes, sometimes the best love is tough love. Sometimes you have to be firm. Sometimes you have to walk away to give them space in order for the light within them to win over their darkness. So that's an important step in discernment. Great, man. I feel like a lot of this does come down to actually separating the two parts within ourselves, as you mentioned, because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, many people make the mistake of just taking the person as a whole. But then uh, what ca what criteria would you use to actually separate the ego and the shadow? Maybe could you go into the, the qualities of each and how can one differentiate between each during the daily tests of life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something that we need to figure out because... If we don't do that, then it's so easy to go wrong. It's so easy to think that something is, you know, um, you're doing something out of your heart. Little do you know it's actually from your ego or shadow, right? And so earlier, just now, when I mentioned when you help another person, you have to differentiate differentiate between their, their ego and their shadow or between their spirit and their ego and shadow. You have to do that within yourself as well. Mm -hmm. Because things like white knight syndrome, for example, which I mentioned, that's an example of the shadow within a man. Um being attracted to the shadow within the woman and yep. enabling that shadow. And then, and then because of what the woman does, you know, and this can go the other way too, although it's not as common, you can also have women trying to rescue, you know, troubled guys that happens all the time, actually. Yeah. So like white princess syndrome, I don't know, white nitrous syndrome. Like women, women what, being attracted to the, the alpha bad boy trying to change him, you know, thinking that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually, I mean, part of that is, is it's coded into biology too, right? Because evolution-wise, mm. I mean, the woman woman needs and wants to be attracted to the alpha just for the protection of the tribe. So and it's coded biologically, you know? You, I mean, you can't really blame all women. Just like men have their own biological programming to prefer certain women. It's, yeah. So, I mean, there's a reason for it. I'm, I'm not, we're not casting blame here. We're just kind of pointing out that this phenomenon happens. Mm. So anyway, yeah, so because of the white knight syndrome, because of what the woman does, therefore the guy's shadow then ends up getting burned or hurt and becomes stronger, you know. So the guy becomes even more angry at women or at the world or at himself. So the shadow grows. So so when the shadow within one person tries to help the shadow within another person, both end up getting growing stronger, right? Yeah. Versus 
if the spirit within a person helps the spirit within another person, both the spirits get stronger. So there's a duality within us, and there's a duality within the person. And so if you want to be a helper, that's the discernment. And ultimately, the discernment is not so much about discerning within the other person, but it's about discerning within yourself. Like, where is my motivation ultimately coming from? You know, like, like where is it really truly coming from? And one way to tell is, you know, you have to understand the ego and the shadow, like any time an, an, an impulse comes from that, it feels like a, it feels like a, like, like, like it's a hole that needs to be filled. You know, it's like a hunger, you know, it needs mm -hmm. to take, needs to grab, needs to fill, needs to patch. It's like a wound. I mean, it truly is like a wound in the subconscious. So it's a wound deep in the subconscious in the shadow. I mean, that is what generates the shadow. It's, it's all the emotional traumas that we experience in life. They, <clears throat> these emotional traumas that we experience, they, um, they get linked to a certain thought, a certain reaction, a certain belief that is, I mean, it's logically, logically fallacious but it's anchored in place by the emotion that surrounds it. So for example, if someone's been burned by enough women, he might say like all women are, you know, be like, you know, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're bad. All, all women are bad. And so he becomes a misogynist, but that, that belief is rooted in the pain that he's, he has endured throughout life that, you know, every time he got rejected, every time things didn't go well or laughed at, humiliated, that hammered it in, it like forged it. It's like, it's like, a, like, like, like the dark ring and the Lord of the Rings, you know, it got forged in the flames of pain. Um, and so that that's deep in the subconscious and, and typically this person will not acknowledge it, will not think about it, but will be thinking from it. So that's the, the platform that he's standing on emotionally, mentally, um, intellectually that he then reasons from. And so this person then can become a woman hater or it can become like a, like a, like, a, like one of those, um, I don't know what you call them nowadays, but the, those, those red pilled alpha male, like, you know, gamma male type guys, right? They're they're overcompensating for this deep wound that mm. they're not that they're not acknowledging, and people like Bernhard Gunther knows you know he talks about this quite quite a bit. I know. So this is not anything new that I'm saying here. It's actually pretty standard knowledge, but you know there's a lot under the hood of people that we have to we have to recognize. So the ego feels like a hole to fill. It, it's 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 operating on blind reactionary programs, so it's not logical. Um, it feels constrictive and hungry and desperate, uh, almost like a like like a like a sleek used car salesman just like wanting to make that sale right he's got this hurried rushed uh, hungry uh, you know con con contracting kind of like uh, like like grabby kind of quality to it and that's what the ego and the shadow feels like so so there's there's a level of desperation to it versus versus the heart or the soul or the spirit which is the opposite instead of being a hole that needs to be filled instead of like drawing it to yourself like a like an sts kind of power grab it's more of a potential that is yearning to be expressed. So it's more like a sun that, that, you know, it has all this energy and it wants to like radiate it out and like give life. All right. So if you have an impulse that it feels more alive, more open, more giving, more, more, uh, more, more like your true self, like your true alive self that comes from your spirit or your heart. Okay. Uh, and it feels clear. It feels lucid. It feels, um, like a form of expansion. It makes you more of who you truly are. Versus the ego and the shadow, which tries to suppress who you truly are and latches on to this false value that has been programmed into it by all the pain and trauma that you've experienced in life. So those are the main, main two differences. Um, and so because of that, you know, you can, you can look at what impulses come from spirit and you can nurture those. So things like fun, fascination, wonder, uh, a sense of play a sense of like rightness, like righteousness, like in a healthy way, like justice, you know, mm. integrity, ethics, uh, creativity. All those things come from the soul. They come from the heart. You know, they come from the true part of you. So the more you do those things, the more you return to being who you truly are, right? Now, I did just say like all these things like fun, wonder, excitement. You know, I mean, typically people say, oh, that that's your inner child. And, you know, they're, they're relatively true because what the inner child is, it's um it's a part of our soul that is closest to the the core of who we truly are so when we're born into these bodies when we're kids we haven't yet been programmed by life's traumas you know we haven't been programmed by all the false thoughts that we've come to accept about ourselves in the world and so as as a kid we are more pure to how we truly are uh, you know in our, in our true spiritual sense 
Um, and that part of us remains within us, even as we add more and more layers, you know, the, the teen layer, the adult layer, the old person layer. As we go through life, we add more and more layers, like the skin of an onion or like the, the layers of a pearl. And so by the time we get pretty old, um, that, that inner child has been buried under mountains of different persona layers, you know. Um, and so that's why as people get older, we, we tend to lose our energy. We tend to lose our motivation and our drive is because we've neglected to nurture that, that core fire within us, all right? And so the more, the more you ignore that, um, the more you lose touch with the, the, the clean, free energy of the soul that would motivate you to be who you truly are. Now, here's, here's the problem. Some people um, in life, they realize that you, don't, that you can suppress that inner child part of you. You can suppress the, the heart emotions, uh, the happy energy, you can suppress that and you can switch to a different kind of energy, which is strictly willpower. All right. And, and the way that that usually happens is that a person goes through a really tough time where they're not happy, but they suck it up and they kind of like armor themselves. You know, they put on this armor of non-emotion. They suck it up, you know, like I gotta be a man, you know, I gotta be, I gotta be tough and I gotta make it through this. And so they, they kind of, it's almost like, like, like taking a knife and stabbing it into the inner child. Mm. And, and, and and sticking it away so that you can be the tough monster who needs to you know take on the world all right if you do that enough the inner child will retreat and will basically become immobilized and so now you no longer even have the heart energy to to call upon in life and now you're operating solely on willpower and willpower it's kind of like switching from like nuclear fusion energy to uh like dirty coal energy right so it's like it's like a less efficient form of energy and it creates all this pollution in your soul. And so if a person relies on willpower exclusively for pretty much everything they do and they reach high levels of success in life only through willpower, they end up being basically polluted to death on a spiritual level. So they wind up having no heart, almost no soul, and pretty much only being driven by this, this dark willpower energy, which is, I mean, it's, it's, it's a demonic energy, to be honest. Mm. See, the only reason why we need willpower here it's because we're confronted with resistance in the matrix. We're confronted with the, 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 you know, aging, having to go to work, making money, you know, dealing with like social pressures, right? All these, all this crap that's coming from the matrix, we have to deal with it and we're not happy where we have to push to it anyway. So willpower is almost like a backup energy supply that comes from the matrix that helps us deal with the matrix, but it's, it's a self-reinforcing loop because the more you use willpower, the more you forget about your heart the more you forget about your soul and what truly makes you happy, right? And so there are basically two modes of operation. The mode where you are your true self and you're kind of living from the exuberance of your soul. And then the false self, which has willpower energy that, um, you know, it allows you to operate within the matrix very effectively, but you're only operating within the rules of the matrix, you know, um, for the matrix, by the matrix, you know, you're basically become part of the matrix. And that then gets into the STO versus STS polarization as well, because you're drawing on different parts of yourself. If you draw on willpower, you're drawing from your ego and your shadow within, mm. you know, but if you, but if you go from your heart, your the, the natural and fun expression of who you truly are, that's more your, your soul, your spirit. Right. Mm. Right. Yeah. So, so the polarization towards STO, it's actually getting closer and closer and closer to who you truly are. And that includes not only an intellectual understanding of who you are, but also finding and nurturing and drawing from the part of you that is genuine, you know, your, your spirit, your heart, your soul. So, yeah. yeah. So one thing I wanted more clarity on is that uh, in, in the incarnation cycles, when we come here, what's the, what's the point at which a soul would choose to go towards the other polarity? Cause a lot mm -hmm. of lifetimes that beings come here because of amnesia, because of matrix, you know, hostile forces, all of that, someone might just go down the wrong path and, become STS in a particular lifetime, like more STS oriented. But then what's the point, I mean, in their journey at which over lifetimes it would kind of cement and then they would go towards the fourth density, like evolve into a negative alien or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, that actually depends a lot on, um, it actually depends a lot on, on what their preferred mode of learning is, okay? okay. Because there are different ways that you can learn in life or grow, I should say. I mean, growing is more important than learning. And the reason I say that is because learning, I mean, 
you can be up in the astral realm in the afterlife looking down on people here and learning from their life from a distance you can learn intellectually all oh, like okay, that person messed up because he cheated on his wife so he didn't learn his lesson about honesty and you know, whatever you can we can learn about that from a distance but if you want to grow you actually have to get in there and experience it for yourself so i think that's why we're here i think we're here to grow ultimately but in terms of making the choice so in life you know you can you can learn you can learn the easy way which is the proactive way where you experience something um you think about it you contemplate it you kind of extract the wisdom and the lesson from your life experiences you kind of reflect on your life you strive to be a better person you know if you make a mistake you give, forgive yourself and you try not to make it again right that's a proactive way of learning or you can do the i don't know what you want to call it, the stubborn donkey way of learning where you don't want to do anything you don't want to learn you don't you don't care you're like wrapped up in your own stuff playing victim Why? blaming others always not introspecting yeah. not trying to clean your own shit out i guess mm -hmm. that would make yeah. it yeah exactly and and when you do that then life has to whip you like a donkey because you're not willing to move and so you make a mistake you don't learn from it situation happens again you experience a pain again so you go through a lot of drama over and over and over again and so in that case it is like a it is like the blows of a hammer of a of a blacksmith forging the sword you know if you, if you go through that process over enough lifetimes it'll slowly start sinking into you that you know all right you know what i'm i'm not going to engage in this drama anymore i'm i'm tired of it i'm going to be a better person this time it just it just starts to nat naturally develop as you mature but it takes a long time mm -hmm. because you're letting life do it to you you know you're not taking any proactive steps versus as i said if you're more sentient more conscious about it then you can accelerate the process because because now you're 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 cognizing it you know and so that's why earlier when i mentioned contemplating in a notebook that's another thing i like to do in my notebook i like to look over my life the things i've done wrong how i could be better and uh, i kind of think about it and just really really ponder on it and as you ponder on it it starts sinking more and more into your subconscious and it becomes more integrated into you right so when you do a lot of self work like this a lot of introspection it truly catalyzes you in your self development development that's why that's so important to do so that's why it kind of sucks for people who are extroverts who never really do that mm. and a lot of times extroverts they're the ones who have to go through external rituals and you know new age methodologies to have things done to them to try to change them but because they somehow can't do it internally but internally that's where it all is that's where the internal alchemical process really truly starts i mean we are the the alchemical vessel that transmutes from the lower into the higher and if you want to rely solely on external factors to evolve you then yeah it, you're you're going to have a hard time because you're going to have to repeat lessons over and over and over again got it so you're saying that over lifetimes if a being continues to not take the easy path and just continue to go down the hard path then over time they might become someone like a uh, illuminati black magician or some of these uh, families that that we see today i've also read in your writing that uh, a lot of these people who are at the top of the power structure were psychopaths and narcissists like they really don't have a spirit at all so right. uh do you think it's possible that someone could have a spirit and be that negatively oriented that they actually land up into these families or is it just uh, you know spiritless beings who are making up most of that no i, I do think actually you know to be honest i think that <clears throat> the highest parts the highest levels of the negative secret societies are made almost exclusively of spirited humans like real humans okay and the reason i say that is because if you don't have a spirit um then you're going to be lacking certain occult powers. Okay. You're going to be lacking free will. You're going to be lacking a certain uh numinous power within you that would be an advantage, right? So so for example, um if you didn't have a spirit, you probably wouldn't have the level of ambition and connection to deep okay, here. This is important. So what a lot of these dark secret societies do is they make bargains with demons. Mm. they make uh, and not just dark secret societies but even like certain hollywood celebrities people in the music industry they make deals with the devil so to speak and the deal is that if you you know like okay i'm going to pretend to be one of these people and i'm talking to the demon I said if you give me success and power if you give me everything i want then um i will do what you want me to do after i die so i'll i'll pay you back after i you know after after this life but in this life i want to be king i want to have all the girls i want to have all the money when have all the fame and success and you you arrange that for me and then I'll be yours forever. Okay, that's the sort of deal that they make. 
Well, if you're a truly spiritless human being, you're not going to have anything to offer a demon necessarily because you're not going to make it too much longer past death uh, to, to work in the service of demons for mm -hmm. a long time after that. You know? So so the, the people who have the most to offer to demons, that the demons truly come after to either feed off them, terrorize them, try to make deals with them, they're going to be spirited people. And when a living human and a demon come together in a, in a cooperative partnership, uh, they have more power together than they do alone. All right. And so that's why it takes a real human and a, and, a, and a demon to come together and they get so much power that way that they're the ones who end up filling the top ranks of these negative secret societies. You know, so that, that's why I wanted to get that out there. Um, right. So yeah, they're, 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 they're real, you know, they're sold. Um, but what I wanted to bring up though, is you asked about like where, what, where, what point does a person make the switch to the mm -hmm. dark path, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so typically, Typically in life, you know, things happen to us, bad things happen and that affects our shadow. It grows our ego, right? So we get these ego shadow wounds and they're always there. And if you have a spirit, if you're, if you're a real person, you're going to know in the back of your mind that you've got issues. You're going to know that when you're lashing out from that place, you're going to know deep down in the part of your, whatever part of spirit that you have left, you're going to know deep down that you're doing the wrong thing. And because you know it, because you sense it, you have to make a free will choice as to whether to ignore that or not. And that is the exact point that a person splits into one direction or the other. You oh, know, it okay. comes down, it becomes down to whether they choose to pay attention to that inner voice or to ignore it and squelch it down. Now, if a person decides to ignore it, then that's when they, you know, they try to become tough asses as much as possible. And like they squash down the inner child, try to try to like basically murder the inner child and then amplify this inner shadow demon that they have more and more and more and um, because now they're on this negative track of i mean the law of one calls it evolution like you know like the negative path of evolution but really it's a form of de-evolution because mm -hmm. they're they're devolving spiritually so they're becoming more capable more cunning smart um they can even graduate to a higher density along the negative path yeah but ultimately it's a dead end because the negative path doesn't go on forever it, it, it it's a dead end all right it's, it's kind of like a person who signs up for a new credit card to pay off the debt of the old credit card and then another one to pay off the debt of that one right how long can you keep that up or you know just like just like with um, uh, debt-based economies like europe and america you know we're debt-based economies and and this nation is borrowing money to pay off debts from borrowing old money and they can keep that, that up for a while but ultimately it's a dead end ultimately it's all going to collapse in and so the negative path of de-evolution it's it's like making spiritual progress but on credit on a credit card and you know there are negative entities above you who require your payment of soul energy or sacrificial victims or whatever in order for you to advance to the next level and then so so there's always negative entities above you wanting something from you mm. and therefore they're always taking 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 so it's, it's like a ponzi scheme it's like a multi-level marketing scheme within within the negative hierarchy that you know sucks up all the energy all the profits from the lower levels and channels it up to the the head archons at the very top you know so that's how that works and that's why that path you know even though these people think that they're accumulating power even though they think that they're winning in this world even though they think um that they have god beat you know that mm. they're winning over, over the light no no i mean they're deluded because where they're going has no future you know so ultimately they're going towards a dead end and meanwhile it's the light which you know, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to be a good person in this world because the entire system is stacked against us. You know, it's stacked in the favor of the matrix. So it's very difficult being a good person. But if you stick with it, if you stick with it, then then you get somewhere. You have a future. You know, you, you get spiritual rewards. You know, not that you're in it for spiritual rewards, but you get them. You know, you kind of get honored with the power that is, the, the power that is divine, that is part of your spiritual birthright for being a child of God, I guess you could say, you know, you get that um, the legitimate way, whereas the, the dark path gets power the illegitimate way, the illegal way, um, which is on credit. You know, just like when people can't afford, a, they can't afford a new car or a new couch or whatever. So they get a credit card and they buy it, right? So now they have the card, now they have a couch, but do they really own it? Not necessarily because now they're in debt, you see. Now they're in debt and they have to pay interest on it. So actually it ends up owning them. So that that's the whole bad bargain of the, the dark side that you think you're getting power, but you're not, you're actually losing power. 
Or man, I've seen this in my own life. I'm sure you have as well. Like when we're on this path, then uh, you know when we polarize positively and we're trying to help others and we keep at it, then miracles happen. Synchronicities are just a matter of course. You know when we're in the right state of mind, and uh, I mean I've I've seen it with myself as well. Like even going through hard times and difficult times, uh, you know it's always a catalyst to just like expand and grow more and get closer to God that way. So. I mean, in your writing, I've seen that you you differentiate between density and dimension. Even the raw material does. And un- until we're talking about third density, it's pretty synonymous. But then once we mm-hmm. start to go about above here, like you were saying, that negatively oriented, uh, you know, humans, the 3D beings, uh, who then graduate into a higher dimension, can either be positively polarized or negatively polarized in terms mm-hmm. of their density. So. Um, let's just take this one by one. Maybe do you want to elaborate on the fourth density and the kinds of beings who are there and the properties of that realm and what what they're there to experience? Yeah, yeah. I'll quickly cover just the idea of dimension because dimension and realm and density are terms that get easily confused, and a lot of times they are used interchangeably in the fringe field because mm. the fringe field, you know, I mean, it's like the it's like the wild west. You know, people are pioneers. <laughs> they're they're like pioneers of knowledge, and there's no standard. There's no like scientific standard yet about what term we should use for this or that so dimension you know a lot of people say oh um this being came from another dimension or before i was born here i was from another dimension well what they really mean is they're from another realm of existence like another plane of existence that's where they're from so that's what they mean by dimension but um if you want to talk about dimension in a very precise scientific way then a dimension is simply um it's an axis of motion it's a degree of freedom okay so we've got like we've got three dimensions of space We've got one dimension of time, one dimension of time, and that's sort of what defines our existence here. So, you know, we've got length, width, and height, X, Y, and Z, and then we've got, you know, time on a time on a watch, and those are, you know, four dimensions. Now, in terms of densities, as we mentioned, first density, which is just like mineral life, like, you know, molecules, atoms, and so on, that plants, animals in second density, humans in third density, we all exist within the same three-dimensional spatial environment, yes. you know, with, with, with one environment of time. Mm. So the first three densities are all within the first, like, space-time manifold, essentially. Now, when you go above third density, in other words, when you graduate from the level of humans where we are right now, when you graduate from that level, you enter a higher realm, which is a... Um, well, let me, let me preface this. So throughout history, okay... We've heard of certain uh, esoteric masters, you know, Qigong masters, certain yogis who were able to do amazing things, you know, like levitate, walk through fire, um, do do these these amazing physics bending feats, almost like they almost like they were superhuman. Okay, when you get to that level, you're essentially on the cusp of third density to fourth density because you're starting to transcend the human condition. All right. So like consciously, we humans are like children. Okay. We we're like children that, that we can't drive. We can't leave the house if our parents don't say so, you know, we're kind of like locked in here and by house and driving, what I'm talking about really is I'm talking about space time and <clears throat> space time and uh, being able to like shift between different realms. Okay. Now, if you're, if you're able to train yourself consciously, um, even alchemists, alchemists who took the philosopher's stone, they were changed at an etheric level that made them psychic. It made them nearly immortal in terms of uh, life extension, and it made them able to phase out from the space time and, and almost like disappear and like reverse aging. Right. So, so they're able to do all these paranormal things because why? because they're able to access the etheric level of reality and they're able to have control over the matrix code that makes physics what it is. So your body, since your body is made of, you know, code, like etheric code, if your consciousness is strong enough that it has control over that code, then you can make it so that you don't age. You can make it so that you disappear like Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars, you know, like you're off in some other realm, right? You're, you're tran- you've transcended or like Buddha turning into light and transcending to another realm. That sort of thing, that is a transition from 3D to 4D. Now, now here's the thing. There are entire civilizations of beings that are already fourth density, that are already at that level. Mm-hmm. And, and for them, you know, um, so when, when I mentioned like, like Buddha, alchemists, 
yogis, you know, uh, certain esoteric masters of the West, all of them did it individually through their own practices. And that is so incredibly difficult to do, to do it by yourself. Whereas some of these civilizations that are in fourth density, they didn't have to do it by themselves, like, you know, sitting and meditating and, you know, like turning into light. They didn't have to do that by themselves. I think they, they evolved as a civilization, almost like when they hit a certain critical mass of consciousness, it flipped them over into a higher state, you know, so they almost like mass incarnated into the next stage. And when you incarnate into the, into the next stage, you know, now you've got a different set of genetics, your, your consciousness is supported by your genetics, and it's, it's a much more natural and easy process. And so that's, that's how they did it versus, you know, these except these exceptions that I mentioned in, in mm -hmm. history where they did it individually. So right. you can do it individually, you can do it individually, but it takes a lot of practice. I mean, that's why in China, in India, uh, even in the West with Rosicrucians, you have people who spend their entire life meditating, contemplating, doing these spiritual practices, and they become better people, but they're not like walking on water. They're not going through walls. You know, they're not bending spoons. They might have certain psychic abilities, but they're not quite there yet. And as I mentioned, that's because it's so difficult because they're trying to do it not collectively, but individually. And so they're on their own and there's not enough like this mass. There's not this hundredth monkey morphogenetic field mm. that, you know, collectively assists them into, into going to the next level. So what is what is fourth density? Fourth density is a very important concept because when we look at ufology, for example, um, in ufology, we, we notice that that aliens, they have abilities that we don't have. Their ships can be bigger on the inside than the outside. They can dematerialize themselves and walk through solid walls. They can lift an abductee out through a solid window on, a, on the famous blue beam of light that you know, kind of lifts them out. It's like a tractor beam. And, and they can also be at a different time rate. So, you know, one year for us might only be a couple hours from, for them if they want. You know, they can, they can kind of play with time like that. So that is what fourth density is like. It's, it's a state of existence where you're quasi variably physical. You know, you can be physical if you want. You can, be, you can project yourself here into 3D or you can project yourself out into a more ethereal state in, in another realm. Um, I'm not sure if we would call that necessarily the fourth spatial dimension according to mathematics because it's not like, um, it's not like, like, a, like, a, like a cube. When you bring it into fourth density, it becomes a hypercube. I don't think it does that. I think it's just a, an altered state of existence that is, um, it, it's almost like, like, like the old Windows, like Windows 95, Windows 98 versus Windows 10 and 11 and 12 that we have nowadays. It's an operating system, but one is more enhanced, right? It's got mm. better colors, do more higher resolution. You can do more, do more with it. So right now, our reality right now, we're like Windows 95. We're like the retarded version of, of existence, you know? But, but, but they're existing in the upgraded version 2.0 and they can go from there to here, you know, where it's like backwards, backwards compatibility. So they can come here, um, but for the most part, they, they stay in their realm, in this fourth density realm. And ultimately, I think that's where humanity is headed. I think we're headed in that direction to become like a fourth density civilization. Um, but it's, it's a, definitely a road to get there. Got it. So uh, in terms of fourth density, I mean, you've described in your writings that there are both kinds of beings. So on the negative side, you have the uh, reptilians, the mantids. Yeah. and some uh, dark nordic factions and on the positive side you have some uh, nordics like positively oriented nordics so what is their purpose in fourth density like from from my understanding uh, just just gleaning your writings and the writings of others uh, i understand that it's a place where beings basically graduate and then they spend a lot of lifetimes trying to master the mind over matter connection and become uh, like enhance the psychic capabilities more uh, is that it or is, are there any other features to that kind of existence yeah, so if you go by the law of one viewpoint of things, then third density, which is what, what humans are at right now, third density, this is the stage where we kind of choose whether we want to align more with the darkness or the light. You know, so we kind of come into our own, we start to start coming into our identity, our path, our, our choice. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and then fourth is where you live out that choice and you enhance it. You kind of like live it, you kind of perfect it. So you become perfected in the sto direction you know in the, in the light direction or in the negative direction if that's the path that you've chosen um so that's the, that's the main difference you know, like here we're just still sort of being sorted out like if you ever see or read harry potter um the movies or the, or the book when when all the new and you know, when all the new people come to the school they get sorted out into different schools 
right? And there's this, this magical sorting hat that says, like, you belong to this group and you belong to the Slytherins or whatever. Mm -hmm. So in, in a way, that is metaphorical for uh, the 3D graduation into 4D in the sense that our soul history, our vibrational quality of our, of our you know, the, 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 the essence of our, of our being, like who we are on the inside, that resonates us and attracts us towards uh, different compartments within the fourth density environment. So if you're uh, like a, a really good person, all right, you've got like a high vibe, you've chosen to help others. And if you were to graduate to 4D, you're not going to have much contact with, let's say, the, the dark occultists who got there through who knows how many human sacrifices and weird occult rituals and demonic bindings that they've done. All right. You're not going to be in contact with them because you're you're too vibrationally separated within a plane that is no longer a consensus shared and forced reality like we are here in 3D. Mm. See, that's the thing that that's, makes that, that's one point that uh, really resonated with. You were saying that mm -hmm. in 3D, both polarities are kind of forced to live in the same mm -hmm. plane, but then when you go to 4D, it's like they don't have to interact with each other, so they can be vibrationally different and never meet over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not meet, not meet unless by choice. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and that, that's totally true because. That's what sort of what makes 3D so, on the one hand, attractive, but also on the other hand, uh, difficult, in that you you can you can choose to come here and be a partner with a husband or wife with uh, an absolute psychopath, mm. which you would never experience in either the afterlife state, which is even beyond fourth density, or uh, or in, in 4D because you know vibrational stuff there isn't crammed together like it is here. So, yeah, like, like here, you can go to the grocery store, you can walk on the street, you can walk past murderers, you can walk past pedophiles, you can walk past uh, angelic saints. Um, you're all on the same street, you know, you're all seeing each other, but only because this is 3D. And I think it's because of that, that etheric layer that acts almost like a simulation that we're all plugged into that enforces the shared physical environment. So, you know, th this realm has its perks but it also comes with a lot of downsides all right and uh, i mean another insight i gleaned is that after we die we basically go into fifth density and that's that's a place which is not like 4d and that 4d is like part physical part ethereal but the fifth density is like a fully ethereal plane mm -hmm. uh, i would like it maybe if you could elaborate on the differences between uh angels and positive aliens and demons and negative aliens because a lot of people who tend to come from a religious bent like equate those and i've seen your reasoning in that in ancient times it'd be hard to differentiate between you know both in terms of right. like what's an angel and what's a positive alien but then today we do have much more in terms of uh, you know just the knowledge base we have in the abduction literature and uh, all the novel discoveries we've done in science, which help us to, you know, get a better idea about differentiating between that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, from what I understand, you say that, uh, I mean, let, let's say a being is incarnating in fourth density, so they can live their lives there, but then once they kind of die in the physical body, they then go to fifth density. So, there are beings who kind of transition into fifth density like we do when we die we temporarily go into fifth density and then come back and then once we you know on our soul trajectory once we really graduate then we can natively move to that and become native fourth density beings but then mm -hmm. fifth density is like a resting place for a lot of beings but then there are native fifth density beings as well like how would you differentiate between all of these things yeah um <clears throat> yeah so earlier when i mentioned how the etheric plane the etheric plane kind of kind of generates this matrix and keeps us all in the shared reality. Well, that is what makes up the three dimensions of space and time. And therefore, first, second, and third density are all within that. They're all within the grip of this etheric energy field that keeps us, you know, in the shared reality. Whereas fourth density, they're <clears throat> they're um they're they're on the edge of that. They're like they have the ability to control the etheric, the etheric plane. And so that's why they can make the big the inside of their ships bigger than the outside. You know, that's why they can slow down or speed up time because they have control over that matrix code. But but the thing is, they are still physical or they're quasi physical, but they can I mean they're generally physical. They have bodies, they have ships, they have bases, you know, they have clothes, they eat food, all right? They have these things because they are like us, they are consciousness that is inside of a body, a vehicle, like a like a physical vehicle, like a vessel, all right? And because of that, they can die 
And when they die, in theory, they go into the astral planes, into the afterlife, or into fifth density, if you want to use the, the, the raw material terminology. Mm. They go into the fifth density. And fifth density, that is the first density where it is completely non-physical. Okay? It's completely non-physical. And, and interestingly enough, interestingly enough, there is no etheric plane or environment in fifth density. Got it. It's entirely astral, meaning it's entirely within the fluid, the fluid space of the universal mind that generates all of existence. So if you want to, if you, if you want to speak about that in terms of dream metaphors, then when you're inside of a dream, you look around, right? You see the sky, you see the ground, you see the trees, you see the dream carrier. Okay. That's all within the, 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 the space of your mind. Okay. That's within the field of your internal consciousness. It's what all of that is taking place within. And so that's what the astral plane is. The astral plane or planes, actually, because it's got different levels to it. It's like the general mind space, like the subconscious space of the universal psyche uh, of the infinite creator. That's what that is. And so, <clears throat> and so that's why fourth and third, second and first density, they're all happening sort of within or around the, the field of etheric energy, which is the closest thing that I would say to a simulation computer. So it's not like we're running on a silicon computer in the year 3000. We're not, we're not running on hardware. We're running on a programmed subset of the collective subconscious. And the and okay. same exact thing happens in dreams too, because in dreams, as I mentioned, the physical environment in your dreams, it, it seems physical, but it's not. It's just con consciousness, right? But it's not just any consciousness. It's a, it's a programmed part of your consciousness. It's a part of your subconscious that has been programmed by your physical experiences in life. You know, from the moment you're born as a baby, you reach out for something, you grab it, you learn how your hands work. You know, I, I have memories going back to childhood, like to being a baby. So I remember what it was like seeing my hands and trying to understand, like, okay, if I do this, if I do this, and you know what I mean? Your mind is programmed by physicality about how things work. And so when you're asleep, right, your dream environment is likewise reflecting that because it's been programmed by physicality. But this physical environment that we are actually in, in waking world, has been programmed by something. I don't know what that something is. It could be the demiurge, but why or how, or how exactly it happened, but it's been programmed to be the way that it is. And, and that entire thing is what fourth, third, second, and first sense are about. But when you go into the astral state after you die, ultimately, or when you graduate beyond fourth density and you enter into fifth density, you're outside of that. You're outside of that bubble. And so now you're not no longer in space time, but you're in something that's almost like the inversion of it, like the time space, mm -hmm. where time ends up becoming like space. And so therefore you can see all your past lives. You can probably see your future probable lives all at the same time, almost as if it's like a, like a, like a collage on a wall that you're looking at, or like a map, like a giant map that you're looking at, like a mosaic, okay? That's what time space is. And so in fifth density, in the astral state, in the afterlife state, that's what your consciousness is ultimately like okay it's it's like a it's beyond time it's beyond linear time it's beyond even what aliens are at okay so okay so having said that you asked about what is the relationship between positive aliens and angels and negative aliens and demons okay now so positive aliens and negative aliens they exist within the positive and negative parts of fourth density which is like an enhanced form of physicality that where things are more fluid Mm -hmm. So they're still physical. Like, as I mentioned, they got bodies, vehicles, they need food, they got clothes. Um, they have that. Um, and that's fourth density. Whereas once you start talking about angels and demons, now we're talking about beings that are only astral for the most part. They don't have bodies that they incarnate into. They don't have, therefore, they don't need clothes necessarily. Um, they don't need ships or bases you know, or planets to hang out on. They, they exist in a higher realm, which would be fifth, even sixth density, um, where, they're, where they are non-physical. Okay, so they're non-physical. They're slightly beyond time. Um, however, they can project themselves into the lower realms. They can project themselves here into, the, into 3D. So angels, for example, angels. Angels are, they are extremely powerful divine beings who are emanations of the divine creator directly. So they didn't necessarily evolve upwards from, you know, microbe to plant to animal to human or, you know, human-like type thing to alien. They didn't go from the ground up. They were direct emanations from God, essentially, from the infinite creator. And so they were created perfect 
in order to to carry out the divine will. Um, and because they're so powerful and so perfect and so close to that infinite creator, they can project themselves here into 3D if they want, and they can do it flawlessly. They can appear as a beggar, as a child, as an animal. You know, they can they can change to whatever form they want because they have absolute control over the astral and the etheric layers that ultimately you know form this reality. Demons, on the other hand, they're not on the level of angels at all. They're they're more on the level of um, the most cunning and sadistic human, or possibly even an alien. That's that's about how high their intelligence levels level goes and their power goes. So generally, they they exist within the astral realm, like the lower vibrational levels of the astral plane. So like the very lowest astral planes, that's where they hang out. Um, it's very dark, very heavy, very murky down there, but that's where they are, and they can they can remote view or they can psychically see what goes on here in our world okay um, especially especially if a person is experiencing uh, emotional vibrations that are a match for them okay so so imagine if you're a demon you're in this murky kind of like other otherworldly environment and you can sense like a warmth like an energy coming from this part of third density and what is it oh it's a person who let's say is under extreme depression and is almost suicidal so you're going to be able to psychically smell it, almost like a shark mm. smelling blood. Mm. And you're going to be drawn to it, and you're going to start to get to work on the person, if you haven't already. You know? You're know, you going to start getting to work on the person, telepathically influencing the person to become even more suicidal, um, start thinking very negative thoughts about the world and themselves, and uh, you know, feel like they've been forsaken by God, feel like the world hates them and there's no one left. Get them to a point where they're so demoralized that they're going to turn towards you, the demon, to help them out or for guidance or whatever. So the person commits suicide. Now that now they're outside their body, they're, they're too dark to even see any sort of white tunnel of light to go into. And who's going to be there? The demon is going to be there to lead them into the demon's den to, I don't know, be, be, be traumatized, be, be kind of shown the ropes, kind of like how, like, like an orphan on the street gets taken in by a gang kind of gets taught how to be a gang member, you know, how to go through the, the rites, the rituals, you have to kill someone to, to you know, be part of the, the ranks, that mm. sort of thing. The same thing happens to that that soul that is so lost that it never goes into the light or anywhere else, you know, it gets, gets taken in by these demonic forces. So that's what a demon is. A demon is a non-physical, malevolent intelligence that usually hangs out in the astral plane and can sort of come here, but it doesn't really manifest physically ever. It doesn't, it doesn't have the power. At best, all it can do is gather etheric life force energy from other people to manifest for itself a, a temporary etheric body. Okay. And so, for example, in your home, okay, if you have a demon that is merely in an astral state, you're not, you're not really going to experience too much occult stuff. You might just feel like, like a dark energy. You might feel more depressed than usual, more angry than usual. Right, but if the demon starts feeding on your life force energy and becomes stronger and stronger and stronger, all of a sudden you will start seeing a shadow moving past the corner of your eye. All of a sudden you might start getting poltergeist effects, like objects being thrown around or or, or, or developing weird illnesses and cancers and so on, because of the demon having that etheric level of power to start influencing physicality. Right, mm. but uh, but that's only if it can gather etheric energy, because remember etheric energy is what interfaces with physicality as we know it is what projects it it's a matrix code um and so the, the demon has to do that whereas an angel can merely consciously project into here and you know the, it has perfect control over the code it's like a system administrator almost it can alter the code however it wants and it can appear as the most unsuspecting person on the street maybe asking you for for you know ten dollars and out of the goodness of your heart you know you give them ten dollars little do you know it was actually a test by an angelic being to test your morality and what do you know, a week later, without even knowing it, all of a sudden, a thousand dollars comes your way. I was, you know, like like nice little gesture for you know, passing the grade. Hmm. So those those sorts of moral tests happen in life without us even necessarily knowing it. But but that that's what that's that's how they can happen. I mean, if you want to test someone on whether they're a good person or not, you can't tell them like, hey, I'm going to test you if you're a good person or not. Are you going to give me ten bucks? You can't do that because they know that you're testing them. So, of course, they're going to give it to you so they can get that tasty reward at the end of the week, right? That's cheating. So, you know, the, these higher powers, they can test you in ways where you don't know you're being tested, right? 
And that's why it's important to just live from the best part within you so that you don't ever have to worry about being tested because you're always on your best as much as possible. All right. So yeah, so angels and demons, they're non-physical beings. And as far as aliens go, aliens are a step below that. Okay. So if we have humans, if you, if you take the scale of creation, you got humans in the middle, and then you've got angels at the top. In between the two would be like higher positive humans, like um, positive secret society people who are extremely, they have extreme levels of self-mastery and connection to their higher self. And they might even have occult powers because, you know, mm -hmm. so that's like there. And then above that, that's when you start getting into certain types of potentially positive aliens. You know, and above them, eventually, that's when you get to non-physical realms, angels, um, higher self is up there too. All the non-physical stuff is up there. Then you got the quasi-physical in the middle. Then you got humans here in the middle. And likewise, if you go below humans on the vibrational spectrum, then you've got um, psychopaths, the negative elite secret societies that you know torture and feed off life force energy. And then below them, you've got um, negative aliens because they're now they're at the fourth density level, so they've got higher levels of technology, intelligence, cunning, wisdom. They're like a whole beyond even like what the satanic elites have nowadays. They're like way beyond that. And then if you go even further, then that's when you start getting into demons, for example. Um, but just to be clear, um, demons themselves have a hierarchy within them. Okay, so it's not like the it's not like the the smallest piddliest demon is higher than the highest negative alien. No, it's not like that. A demon is simply a non-physical malevolent intelligence. So, for example, if a if a psychopathic human who has a spirit, if a psychopathic human dies, is now outside their body. And if he stays within the birthbound realm and starts feeding on the life force energy of people, that is essentially a demon. I mean, that is one type of demon. It's, it's a human demon, but, you know, it's, it's a demon. And same thing with some of these negative alien powers. If they leave their body or they die and they still want to hang around in a non-physical state, now they're going to be an alien demon. Or you can have thought forms, you know, those, those artificial uh, etheric and astral constructs that are formed from extreme levels of hatred and suffering and you know dark sexual energies that get emitted from humans and they become their own like temporary entity. Those things can also act in a demonic way. So not all demons are the same. You know, there's different levels of power, there's different origins, but they're all generally just non-physical malevolent intelligences. Whereas aliens, they're they're physical, you know. Yeah. So from what I understand in terms of uh, negative density like once a being reaches the fifth density it's like after that point they evolve into matter like, i think the cassiopeian transcript spoke about that mm -hmm. but uh, on the positive side like when a being reaches fifth density so maybe they might be like the higher self or angels and then it, there seems to be a step further where these beings kind of come together once they've achieved that level of self-mastery and then become something like a social memory complex like mm -hmm. There are, you know, there are collective. So, uh, is is that accurate in terms of my summary? Well, it's it's. I don't know if it's accurate, but it's logical. It's logical. Okay. And yeah. the reason I say it's logical is because if you look at the sequence of evolution of a, a consciousness, okay, in in third density in the human realm, as I said, we are <clears throat> we're kind of starting to realize our individuality, and we're making our choices as to which path to go. Okay, so so we're just kind of like being sorted within 3D. <clears throat> and then in, in 4D, we are living the full expression of that choice to be a full expression of the STO path or the STS path. Whereas if you go even further beyond that in 5D, that's kind of like the final perfection steps of the individual. Mm. So, so, all right. So I did just need some clarification. Um, so typically when, when a person dies, okay. So when a person dies, they leave their 3D body behind. Okay. Their mind, their consciousness is still relatively 3D for, for I mean, for most humans. Um, not talking about higher beings who come here from a higher realm and then come here and then when they die, they kind of go back. I'm talking about people that are like at the 3D level of evolution in their in their consciousness. Hmm. So, so when they die, they're, they, they go straight to fifth density as a temporary holdover area. And that's what we call the spirit realm or the afterlife, you know, where they do the afterlife review. Um, they're not there natively. They're there um, almost like um, almost like like babies that are born into a hospital and then they put into the nursery for like a week or a couple of days and then they get taken home. So it's kind of like the hospital environment. It's like the spiritual hospital. And that's what 5D essentially is. And so just as a hospital has babies and also nurses and doctors, likewise, fifth density has 
souls that have died and crossed over and are now temporarily there. Those are like the babies. But it also has people who are entities who work there natively. Mm -hmm. And those are the graduates or for of fourth density who are there natively as fifth density beings. Okay. So so when you get past 40, you exist in in the fifth density in the astral environment as a non-physical, highly advanced, highly individualized consciousness. Um, and at the end of 5D, you've pretty much maxed out everything that you can do as an individual. So, at, you know, what, whatever path you chose, the STO path, you're at the end of it because as an individual, you've learned everything, you've grown as much as you can, and that is it. Where do you go from there? Where do you go from there? Well, where you go from there is you go to the next level where now you kind of join up with other perfected individuals and you form a group. Uh, raw material calls it a, a higher level of social memory complex. Okay. And, so it's, and you form a group and now it's the group that evolves forward hmm. um, because the individual has reached its final path. But as you know, like even, even here in 3D as a human being, if you are someone who is single in life, and you don't have any friends, not much family. You can you can go far in terms of your self development, but there are certain things that you can only develop by hanging out with other people right. and interacting. You know, right? Like like you know, f things about yourself that you might not not have realized. For example, other people might trigger out of you. You know, just acting like mirrors, right. and then that that serves as catalyst for us to get to know ourselves better. Yeah, and that's a microcosmic reflection of what can happen in the higher realms. Hmm. where a soul has perfectly individuated, have, has perfectly individualized, <clears throat> um, but then really can't go any further. So it has to work and cooperate with others to reach a higher level of harmony. It can only come about through through union. Right. And that's what the, the, the raw source and what the Cassiopeian source, that's what they claim they are. Okay. Now, I don't know if that's true, but right. that's, what they, that's what they claim they are. And that's where it fits within that entire schema of you know the different densities and where they are and where we are, where the afterlife is, where aliens are, where animals and plants. See, <clears throat> all of that fits very neatly into the six or seven levels. And if we go by another system like uh, the occult system with the etheric plane, the astral plane, I mean, that's a little bit too simplistic to to describe the the plethora of phenomena and consciousnesses there. Are. But it's not mutually exclusive with it either, because as I explained earlier. The etheric mostly has to do with the first density and the atoms and the molecules. And the astral has to do with, you know, uh, plants or not, not plants so much as animals and humans, things that have a volition. And then you got the astral plane, which is like fifth density and so on. So it all fits, you know, and you can, you can explain the etheric and the astral planes in terms of the density model. Uh, it's not that they're separate. It's like they're, they're kind of interlocked. And so the article on my website called STO, STS and densities, it gets into all that and it kind of, Kind of differentiates between the different nuances and it explains just how well it works for categorizing and understanding so much of the phenomena that we're faced with you know whether it's people that we know whether it's aliens that we're dealing with or demons right because nowadays there's so many people that are saying oh aliens are just demons yeah right they're, they're getting one confused with the other and <clears throat> in ancient times of course you know back then they didn't have the term alien they didn't know about extraterrestrials or genetic engineering or robots, right? They didn't know about that. So they used one term for multiple phenomena. And then as you said, nowadays we have more scientific terms. Uh, and actually, you know what? I mean, the term alien is probably not even truly accurate. It's a scientific term because, oh, alien, extraterrestrial, it's like beyond Earth. Yeah. Well, but that's not necessarily true because they could be from another realm, another time, a parallel timeline, another entire reality altogether right so they're, they're not necessarily alien in the in the old like extraterrestrial hypothesis sense but at the same time um if they are interdimensional if they are quasi-physical if they are fourth density that doesn't mean that they can't also at the same time have homes on other planets or other worlds because they might come from a fourth density version of some planet in another star system right true and which you know probably explains how they can travel here so easily if they do because, you know, if, if, you, if you try to travel through outer space right now in a regular spaceship, you're going to have meteors. You're going to have, like, lots of space debris, radiation. It's going to fry you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take a ton of shielding to be able to make it through all that in 3D, right? But we know from abduction accounts that aliens can phase through solid walls, right? They can phase themselves 
out of this physical state. So if you're traveling from another star system and you're coming to the solar system, all you have to do is phase yourself out of physicality slightly. And all that radiation, all that debris is going to pass right through you. It's not going to collide with your ship. So you don't even need like heavy shielding in order to, to travel like that if you have phasing technology. So, you know, pe people who say like, oh, aliens can't be from elsewhere because it takes too long to get here. Well, they're thinking in a 3D way. You have to think in a fourth density way. And all of a sudden it becomes more understandable and it makes a lot more sense. Great, man. I just felt like I had to, you know, like nudge you to lay all this out because it's like once people understand the scales and the bigger picture, then we can start to zoom in on, you know, different aspects. So right, let's yeah. just tie, tie this in practically to uh, reincarnation, right? I mean, mm -hmm. now that people understand the different levels. So before you or I were born, you know, uh, as far as I've read in near the experience research as well as in your work, we tend to have a broad outline for our life in terms of the challenges we have and the kind of things we want to master. And that, uh, you know, we come with our own unique frequency resonance vibration, as you call it. And uh, based on our karmic path, you know, we, we've kind of come here to learn certain things. But then, uh, as you talk about rightly so, that these negative beings basically lock into that and kind of use those learning experiences in order to maximize the luge for them. So mm -hmm. how does all this tie in practically together? Like, Maybe I'm going through a dif difficult life experience right now and uh, the angels and the positive aliens are trying to support me, but then there's this entire negative realm that's trying to feed off that experience. How do you reconcile all of that? Hmm. Yeah, it's a big subject because we're, we're all of us, we're in it. You know, we're in it. We're experiencing it. So this is about your life. This is about my life. This is about all of our lives. <clears throat> yeah, so... Um, if you want to say like like if, if life were the if the life that we lead were an equation, what would the equation be? Well, it would be life equals dharma plus karma plus free will plus physics. That's what life really is. Okay, we we got our own free will choices that we make in life, and they kind of knock us into this probable future or that probable future. But at the same time, we also have dharma, which is a English word. English word would be like like a, like destiny or duty. It's like a, it's like what we were meant, meant meant to be and meant to do. That part of our life, that's sort of written into our soul as well. Um, so we have this destiny component that pulls us forward and tries to give us opportunities to manifest it. Okay, But at the same time, we also have negative karma, which is the consequences of our past actions, which, and, and just to be clear, I don't believe that karma is um, uh, a moral judgment that is passed down from, let's say, uh, a group of judges in fifth density. I don't think it works that way. I think what it is is that we have another part of our consciousness, which is up in a higher density, a uh, higher self in sixth density to be exact. And um, <clears throat> this part of us has has no filters on its morality or its, or its ethics. See, as a human, when you do something bad, you can block it out of your mind. You know, you can rationalize it. You mm -hmm. can use your religious programming or social programming to justify why you did it or why you had to do it or why that person deserved to you know whatever you did to them right well but but that but we're lying to ourselves when we do that that's an illusion so so we can do that while we're here in 3d in these amnesia ridden monkey bodies because we're not that smart we're not that aware we're not that psychic we're not plugged into the rest of our being which is up above almost like a satellite looking down that can see um what we're doing here and it can feel it knows when we make a moral or ethical transgression Right. And so when you die or when you I mean, even even when you kind of feel within yourself for your 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 conscience or your heart, you know when something you did was wrong. OK, mm. but it knows it like perfectly. I guess it's clear as day. All right. And when you die, you kind of merge with that consciousness a bit. And so therefore, after death, you. You you can feel the the guilt and the remorse you have over what you've done in life that was like way past, you know, like crossing a line. Things that you ignored in life, you're going to see clearly after death. And that kind of guilt, that kind of remorse, it, it informs the higher self in its decisions on what kind of life to have next when it reprojects itself back down into 3D. Okay, and so that therefore that, that's how you get past life karma mm. because it's, it's, the, it's a guilt from the past life that is still here as a trace that is now therefore part of your energy field and it's kind of shaping what experiences you track to yourself. Right. So, so if you have guilt over um, screwing someone over uh, and you're really stubborn about that, you're not proactive about it. If you're not proactive, then it's going to it's going to attract an event in life that where you get screwed over so that you know what it's like. 
Um, and when that happens, you have a choice to make. You can either be humble and accept it and realize, okay, I shouldn't be doing that to others because I know how bad it feels. Or you can say, oh, screw you, you know, and you're going to be even worse after that. See, people make that choice. They can go one way or the other. And that's also mm. what, what catalyzes, you know, the, the direction of yep. SEO or STS. And so that's why the STS path, if you keep on going with it, they, it, you start severing yourself from the entire Dharma karma cycle. You start severing yourself from the higher self. And I hate to say it, but uh, even Rudolf Steiner talked about this, but some of these, these dark occult secret societies, if you want to advance in them, you have to hurt innocent things, whether it's animals or people or babies or whatever. You do it in order to sever yourself inwardly from your conscience, from your heart, from your soul, from your higher self. And actually, I think the raw material talked about it too. Um, talking about how the STS path, if you keep on going with it, you, yeah, you do kind of segregate yourself off from the higher self yeah. and become almost like, like an orphan to the entire learning program. And you become like, a, like an orphan on the side who joins the gang of demons and negative aliens if you're at that level. And you become part of that lost hierarchy, like the Lost Boys, like the movie Lost Boys, these, these vampires that feed on innocent people, right? It's kind of like that. Um, yeah, yeah, so... Yeah, 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 keep keep on going because uh, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, I was asking you specifically, maybe we could just relate this to your life, right? Like uh, in terms of the entire dimensional play that's going on, how how do you think that it's translated in your life in terms of support from positive forces, mm. in terms of angels and like aliens, as well as you know interference from the next on the on gotcha. the lower side? Yeah, so everyone's got a different case. Um, like in my case, when I was <laughs> I was a weird kid. Like I was born, I had very very early memories of my, my childhood, like uh, I remember being in the hospital. I think I remember even being in the womb and hearing, you know, the noises outside of it. And one, one time I asked my mom, like, hey, I remember like like when you're pregnant with me, I remember hearing like all this banging noise and like some guy talking and she says, oh yeah, that, that was uh, that was your uncle. Uh, we, were, we were talking, you're like eight months, I was like eight months pregnant with you and he was building a baby changing table. So you had like a hammer and wood and all that and you know, hammering the nails. So I remember that. Um, I don't have perfect memory, but I remember that. Um, but anyway, so my case with the alien abductions that I had as a kid and my interest in science, uh, I was very like space oriented as a kid. Like I built this really awesome UFO out of a giant Yamaha keyboard box, it had like a cockpit and like little levers and buttons and emergency supply of gummy bears on the, on the side, you know, like really cool things. Anyway, uh, reminiscing about my UFO as a kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I'm just saying that there's just things in childhood the kind of reflect or foreshadow who you are on a, on a soul level, right? So because I had the alien things, because I had the space interest, I probably had past lives as a non-human, okay? Maybe I, I came here on a mission to uh, deal with aliens and to one day write a book about it and to educate others about aliens, which would make sense because it would make sense for, let's say, a higher, I don't know, positive, spiritual, angelic type being to come here and to talk about aliens would make sense because even in the in, in the other realms they don't really have too much to do with each other mm. you know, they don't really have a common mission set i mean typically what you'll find is that angels are more concerned about your your spiritual well-being um your spiritual well-being your integrity where you where you where you are on the moral spectrum and not like you know did you read your bible today no it's not like that it's more like are you a good person did you help this person when he or she was in genuine need like you know when no one was looking, did you do the bad thing or did you do the good thing? That's sort of what they look upon because they're they're caretakers of the divine that is within us, right? And that's that's what they care about. And so they exist more on the moral spectrum, whereas aliens they exist more um, they exist more on the uh, the strategic, militaristic, scientific, genetic, dimensional level. So they're more interested about like manipulating the timeline, the future of humanity as a whole. Like what happens to Earth, its resources, its genetic diversity, um, and so on. That's what aliens generally care about. And so if you have an alien and an angel in the same room, they're not going to have too much to talk about. And generally, they're not going to be even talking with each other too much. Mm, now, I have asked various people who have ex had experiences with both aliens and angels, or aliens and demons. I asked them, well, do they ever interact with each other? And if so, like, what is, what, like how is that? And uh, one of them, my friend, he said, uh, he said that the alien that he knew was who was a Nordic alien. He said that that she perceived them as uh, 
with wonder like like we've heard about them but we don't know too much about them so whenever they show up it's always like this big spectacle um which reminds me of other sources including the allies of humanity books by marshall v and summers in those books which were supposedly channeled um the channeled messages that were transmitted by what i think are probably upper third density level aliens that, that you know they transmitted this book they transmitted this book in order to warn humans about the negative alien agenda which was coming mm -hmm. up right yeah. but anyway in that book they they speak a little bit about their culture and about what they know and they talk about these beings called the unseen ones that's what they call them the unseen ones and the way that they describe them is very similar to how my friend described his nordic alien describing a, the, the, her in, in, interactions with angels you know okay. these mysterious super powerful uh you know mystical beings that sometimes they show up and they got their own agenda right so those those are different data points that indicate that aliens and angels have different agendas unless unless of course you're talking about the very positive aliens if they exist positive aliens and angels then they might have a little bit more to talk about because they are both they're both um serving the divine will ultimately so to the to the to the positive angels or aliens i think they would perceive angels as being almost like a oracles or kind of like in lord of the rings how they they viewed gandalf the white after he kind of ascended you know this kind of like mystical like super wise super powerful magical being that is a uh, way higher in, in in the hierarchy of you know the divinity it's, that's how that's how they view it so now in terms of my life if i did come here with a mission that involved science aliens which you know i mean that seems to be the majority of what i think about most of the most most of my day i'm thinking about science or music i guess or aliens and the whole like end of the world issue that's that's what i think about mostly um i've had demonic forces in my life i've had alien forces in my life both helping and hindering you know i think mm -hmm. there are different i think there are different alien factions and i think they are aware of who is out there researching talking about and influencing human perception of the alien presence right and so whether they're a positive alien or a negative alien or some neutral alien i think they would be interested in that person and how that person affects the timeline like no no person is too unimportant for them to check in on and to see how they are influencing things right and so therefore i think i've been steered um and i've been also blocked depending on which alien group we're talking about uh now as far as demons go They've also been a problem, but I think it's because demons are just so common. I think um, I think a majority of households in the world have some malevolent entity around in the vicinity trying to cause disharmony, you know, trying to make a person more depressed than they would naturally be, more angry than they would naturally be, trying to set up fights, you know, trying to um, lure a person into, let's say, drugs and alcoholism and then get their kids addicted and you just kind of destroy the entire family bloodline. Um, I think that happens way more common than a, than alien activity is. Because see, because because aliens, if they if they're in physical bodies and they got ships and bases, they're going to be logistically limited by their resources, and by the fact that they have to maintain their vehicles or maintain who they are. All right, so they're going to be limited in number. They're going to be limited in where they can be at any any point in time. So you're not going to see them as often as you would a demon, which is non physical, so it can't really die. You know, it's always. All now, it's always around. It's always trying to feed off energy and trying to cause mischief. So I think demons are way more common than aliens are, and therefore I've had demonic activity in my life as well. Um, I think I've had angelic activity too, like watching out where I might have come close to death, but it saved me. And you know, these these, these interventions, I've had positive influences too. So I've had all those, and I think all of it happens within the the allowable parameters of, as I mentioned dharma like your destiny karma and also physics so there are certain things that negative entities are not allowed to do to me or to other people th until that person has their spiritual defenses disabled and so that's why as i mentioned earlier in the show there's a multi-step process for them mm. to be able to take a person out you know so people ask me okay well how can you talk about these subjects without being killed right and the answer is it's because i can recognize when that 10-step process is about to you know it's, it's it's starting to happen i can i can notice my vibe starting to get lower i can feel um negative impulses starting to creep in i get omen warning signs you know starting to pop up 
And I also know that deep down that I'm on the wrong path. And if I ignore all the signs, if I keep on going, if I, if I do the drugs, if I do the alcohol, if I, whatever, you know, get into crime or whatever. Um, yeah. At some point I will be able to be fully taken out. Now, unfortunately, even though negative entities cannot do that necessarily, they have other ways of hacking a person's permission system to still get at them. Like in my case, in, in 2010, I almost died. Okay, I almost died in, in 2010. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit, if you don't yeah. mind? Because I've always heard you mention that, but then uh, I've never seen like what you actually went through. If, if yeah, yeah, all right. that. yeah, yeah, sure. So, so, so in the years prior to that, I was running the Noble Realms Forum. It ran from 2004 through 2008. And it was an awesome forum, you know, but I was, I was a sole administrator, or administrator. I was a sole moderator. Um, but I wanted to do an experiment, which was, can you have a fringe forum for like people that are interested in these subjects and keep it open enrollment so that there's not even a vetting process. People just come in almost, almost like a, like a utopian free society, right? Have people just come in, talk about these things. And if anyone was a problem, I would deal with it very fairly. Um, yeah. So, and of course <laughs> what happened is that it became an open vessel, an open doorway for trolls, psychopaths, uh, people influenced by demons and also people influenced by negative aliens to get in there and really screw things up. Uh, not screw things up, not just for others, but also for me, like causing me a lot of stress. Like uh, it, it did to see it started to deteriorate my health. That's that's why I mentioned this, because I had 24 seven stress, like even sleeping. I had one part of my mind always on the forum, like mm. who's going to cause a trouble problem next? What about this person? What about that person? And, you know, it's different drama going on. Um, interestingly enough, though, because the forum was important for the people that were there and because I was dealing with supernatural forces that were working through people. Um, it's almost like the permission system opened up a little bit and allowed me to become more psychic too. So I started getting precognitive dreams, uh, psychic impressions about what the next problem would be, who it would be, when it would happen and what it would be about, you see? So I became mildly clairvoyant enough to become almost like a super moderator where I could detect problems before people even realized a problem was happening. And so then I was able to make some very clever moves in managing a certain problem person that would uh, disable the, the scheme that they were being maneuvered into accomplishing. You know, So, so the, these disruptions that would happen on the forum, it, it would always be, funny enough, it would always happen around the full moon or the new moon. I noticed that. And it would always involve some degree of psychic influencing of the people. Because some of them afterwards, they wrote me absolutely shocked and in, in, in fear as to what overcame them. They didn't know what it was because they never experienced it in their entire lives. It was like some external psychic force came over them and manipulated them into saying and doing certain things and being a certain way, feeling a certain way, right? So anyway, the forum ended up becoming this big occult uh, chess game um, that I was able to deal with, but I was extremely stressed out by it. And so I ended the forum in 2008 I worked on my book, Discerning Alien Disinformation, which was also very stressful because I had to comb through dozens and dozens, I mean, if not over 100 books of alien disinformation. And I, and I absolutely hate disinformation. I hate lies. I hate incorrectness and incongruency. So I'm like dealing like, it was like torture, like dealing with like yeah. Stephen that, Greer. That, that's why it resonated with you so much. Man. I feel <laughs> like we have certain cynicism towards quackery and like disinformation. So yeah. yeah, right. So I was reading these books trying to dig through the garbage to figure out the pattern so that I could boil it down into a slim book that I can get out there and uh, help people see through alien deception. So I, I did that, but it, it took a lot out of me. You know, earlier when we were talking about killing the inner child, you mm. know, to like, like put like d dipping into your willpower, so you can, like power through something. I had to do that in order to accomplish discerning alien disinformation. And it was so difficult that I almost gave up. So in the end, the chances of me completing that book was probably only around 1%, 1%. So out of 100 timelines where I started this book, only one, which is this one, is the one that I finished the book and I put it out there, right? But it was worth it because, you know, I always love kicking the matrix in the balls in a way. I love <laughs> sticking, sticking it to the negative alien agenda. So I'm, I'm glad it got out there. But the stress over those years, this is why I'm mentioning all this, the stress over, this, over those years it was, it mounted. And uh, I spent a lot of time on the computer, so I wasn't getting enough sunlight. So therefore I had a vitamin D deficiency, which I didn't know. And I started developing autoimmune disorders, right? So now my immune system was depressed 
I didn't have enough vitamin D. And uh, actually, Mozart, Mozart, the famous classical composer, supposedly he died of vitamin D deficiency because he spent too much time in front of a keyboard, you know, mm. instead of being out in the sun. So same with me. I was in front of a digital keyboard, but um, I didn't have enough sunlight. So it started to, to come at me. And then, and then here's the weird thing that happened. So 2010, that summer in Charlottesville, we had two freak storms, okay? Um, they're, both of them were, they're called derechos. It's like a, it's like a microburst. It's like a huge gust of like storm, right? It's like a, almost like a, like a mini hurricane or tornado. Mm. But we had the first one It knocked out the power. So I was like, I was extremely careful. Like, okay, power's out. Be careful about everything. And um, so I survived that one. Then three weeks later to the day, exactly three weeks later. And then the number three comes up a lot in alien abduction, you know, alien type stuff. They love the number three. Three weeks later, we had another freak storm in the exact same location, the exact same way, which according to the meteorologist was freaky. Like it shouldn't have happened. Like it's almost impossible the odds of that happening. So this time the power was out for, I think three, maybe four days. Yeah. And uh, we had, we couldn't use our stove. And so I had to, well, I figured, okay, you know what? What if I just get some charcoal, some burgers, I'm going to grill some burgers. All right. <clears throat> so I went to the usual store that we go to. As soon as I went there and walked inside, the power went out. Like they had like emergency power or something like that. And the power went out. And so I, I tried to get some hamburger meat, but they're like, nope, sorry. It was just closed. You know, we're closing the store. So I'm like, all right, fine. I went down the hill to the other store, which I never go to because it's kind of sketchy, but I figured, you know, why not? So I went there, power was running. I bought the hamburger meat, went home. I grilled it. Little did I know it was contaminated with E. coli. Oops. You know, it was, it was contaminated with E. coli. And, um, I ate it and it was only contaminated with E. coli probably because their power went out and they didn't keep the meat as, you know, cold as it should have been. Right. So the, there was an issue there. And so I, I ate E. coli contaminated meat while having severe vitamin D deficiency in an autoimmune disorder. And that, that was a deadly combination because I got so sick. I got a really, really, really bad form of gastroenteritis where I couldn't even eat anything. All right. And I, and I, I didn't go to the doctor because I figured I could make it through. But I got sick so fast that I couldn't eat for a week. And I got down to like 125 pounds. I'm like, I'm like six feet tall, you know, so 125 pounds. That's, that's, that's pretty bad. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I almost died from the infection because I don't know, because it almost spread to my kidneys. And once it spreads to your kidneys, like you get like a viral infection in there, then you can get kidney damage, then you're on dialysis, like my mom, and then you eventually end up dying from that. So that was 2010. But the only reason that happened was because the power went out at a grocery store that I normally go to. And because we had two freak storms in a, in a row where I let down my guard on, on the second time. So was it just bad luck or was it a very clever series of stalkings that eventually got me to the point where out of my own ignorance and letting my guard down, I could have almost died from it, you know? Now, interestingly enough, I noticed, I noticed a phenomenon where when negative entities try to take you down or try to do anything to you in life, they can only do it because it's a gamble because something good can, can come out of it if you triumph over it. You know, so that's sort of the, that's part of the bargain of why they're allowed to do what they do. So in this case, because of that, I had to start eating very healthy afterwards, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I overcame it and now I'm definitely healthier because of it, but I could have died just as well. Damn. That's fucking interesting experience. I'm glad you made it though. <laughs> <laughs> like it only needed at this time for sure. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, uh, yeah. Just, just real quick though, I had some other close calls, not in death, but like, for example, what my book, Fringe Knowledge for Beginners. That book, I was almost done with it, and then a computer glitch happened, and I lost the file, you know? So I lost I know, the I, I read about that in your book, that like, uh, you had to run uh, recovery programs, and I think in the fourth recovery program where you almost gave up, you landed up recovering that. Yeah, yeah, I, I gave up on the fourth one, and then I said, okay, fine. And then I actually, you know what? Screw it. I'm just gonna try just one more. I already did it four. Like, you know, well, what was that Einstein quote? Like the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. So I did it four times already and it would have been insane to do it a fifth, but I did it anyway and boom, it worked. I got my file back. So there it is. You know, there is the French knowledge for beginners free on my website because and I kind of pulled through. So same with discerning alien disinformation. It was the 1% chance that I followed in order to get it out there. So yeah, I mean, uh, me being here right now talking in my website, it's a, it's a result of a lot of improbabilities. It's very interesting, man. So a lot of people who see the darkness and the darkness interfering in their lives, uh, you know, they kind of tend to get cynical with respect to 
the idea that these negative beings don't have any karmic consequences for what they do so uh, i mean i we kind of uh, you know went back and forth over this in our consult as well so maybe just give your insights as to what advantages the the higher positive beings have over the negative ones because i've i've heard you talk about the fact that it's free will that actually makes a uh, being more powerful and free will is determined by the awareness and knowledge and love that a being holds uh, you know compared to that so surely like negative beings uh, some of the disadvantages they have that i've read about in your work is that because they're in a sort of low vibrational state they have access to a tiny uh, window of probabilities compared to what could actually happen that they tend to be very short sighted and even in terms of like they might not have karmic consequences but then it's not like they can just do anything to anyone like you mm. mentioned and there are higher process, uh, forces protecting so what what's the downside to these negative being like what weaknesses do they have what do they tend to lose in terms of the benefits that they seem to gain mm. well let me frame it this way so this might seem like a, like it doesn't tie in but it actually does right So imagine imagine or consider the idea of the law of attraction that the the idea that your your state of consciousness well specifically the health and essence and state of your subconscious is what magnetically draws in certain probable futures that correspond to it mm-hmm. right so if you're if you're filled with an attitude of general optimism kindness towards others you know zest for life you're likely going to be more lucky in life than you are if you're got very heavy dark depressive expectations about your life and you know life is crap and then you die that sort of that sort of mindset that that pulls in those other probable futures right so take that idea and imagine then if you're also at the same time um psychic or precognitive like a like an alien is so an alien can it, an alien can psychically sense probable futures so if a particular probable future is very likely to happen the alien can probably see it days months perhaps even years at a time and it knows that it's going to happen because it's it's almost like 100% likely it's going to happen versus another probability that's mm, probably not going to happen at all and it might only have like a like a fuzzy vague view of it right so think about this if if you were a person with the ability to see the future different probable futures but but you're also someone whose subconscious is attracting certain futures over others then ultimately what that means is you're seeing the futures that you are attracting vibrationally subconsciously right so if you're a psychic person and you have a very good subconscious like positive vibe you're going to be able to see futures that are more probable which are going to be the ones that have good things happening to you right mm-hmm. now but the but the way that this can backfire is if you are an alien who has who who's who's on the very like low end of the vibrational spectrum and when we talk about vibrations it's more of a metaphor you know because we can't, we can't really say oh it's a uh, um i don't know like like 300 cycles per second like hertz like sound is it's on some other sort of thing which isn't quite fully understood yet but it's it's a quality of consciousness that relates to whether something is is more in the direction of darkness sts you know pre- predatory uh, low consciousness or whether it's like high consciousness divine positivity so that's what we mean by vibration right mm. so if an alien is on the lower part of that vibrational spectrum it's going to be tuned into probable futures that reflect that meaning meaning it's not going to be able to easily see the probable futures that are positive okay so because of that it leads to um it leads to a false sense of confidence it's almost like wishful thinking and that's something that the cassiopian transcripts talk about quite a bit how the sts forces one of their achilles heels is that they are given to wishful thinking meaning meaning that they see the future they see it logically they see it psychically Bro, just just give me 10 seconds man someone sure. knock on my door continuously i'll just be back yeah you know i'm i'm going to get some water Hope you guys are enjoying this discussion. It's funny you're in the matrix, learning about the matrix, 
so that you can overcome the matrix. <sighs> Too bad there's not like a live chat because I could be answering some questions right now. Well, I'll be right back. Hey dude, so sorry man, my mom decided to order a new washing machine today out of all this, so oh, they had funny. to kind of like take it out. Yeah, where were we man? I'm sorry, I cut you off. Oh no, uh, I, I totally forgot. I went to get some water and like I got abducted, my, my memories got wiped. <laughs> I came back. I'll, I'll, I'll trigger them back, no worries. So yeah, I I'd asked you to elaborate on uh, the, the things that the negative beings seem to give up for the advantages that they seem to get ostensibly. Mm, that's right. Yeah, so I was talking about how their Achilles heel is that they have wishful thinking. And, and what that means in a technical sense is that they are tuned to a vibrational part of the spectrum that only relates to certain probable futures that kind of uh, confirm or reinforce that. And this leads to a very, uh, <clears throat> a very false sense of confidence, which leads to them ultimately failing, you know, it, it leads to them not being able to see a less probable positive future that they couldn't account for right so so, so it's kind of like they have this machination set up where it's very complicated you know they got all the pieces in the right place you know, like let's say taking over planet earth uh turning it into the whole great reset nightmare where mm. we're all eating bugs and in these underground shelters well the earth ice is over or whatever you know but let's say that they have this all planned out but they only plan it according to the futures that they can see and they lack the, the the vibrational quality to see the other probable futures that will ensure that that doesn't happen, All right? And that's actually that's that's really the reason why the divine always ends up winning in the end through the most subtle and clever ways, uh, kind of like the butterfly effect. And actually, there was a Disney movie that was never released. What was it called? It wasn't called The Prince and the Pauper. It was a uh, the Cobbler and the Thief. I think that's what it was called. The thief and the cobbler, something like that. Anyway, uh, in that movie, there's this giant war machine that starts coming towards the city, about to wreck it. And this 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 poor little innocent, naive cobbler, he takes a single tack from a shoe and fires it, and it lands in the machine. And this causes another thing to happen, another thing to happen. All of a sudden, the entire machine just falls apart because it couldn't account for that little tiny thing that you know ended up wrecking it. So I think that's sort of a metaphor for how the divine works. And actually, um, if you want to go back to some of the quotes of the historical, well, the alleged historical Jesus, he talks a lot about how, how, how the kingdom of heaven works and how, what the kingdom of heaven is. And the kingdom of heaven has been compared to a mustard seed that is extremely tiny that yet grows into a big bush or a big tree, okay? Or um, it talks about a woman who is carrying a jar filled with, I think, grain, and the handle broke off as she was walking. And when she got home, she looked and all the grain was gone from the, from the, from the jar. Well, what that, what that really means is the idea that things are accomplished without awareness necessarily. That the divine hand works through the smallest things, the most inconspicuous things. And it has like a master stroke on being able to orchestrate outcomes that negative forces simply cannot anticipate or defend against. Because it's it's operating via the uh, the butterfly effect, you know, chaos chaos theory. Nice. Chaos theory says that in the world there are very complex systems like hurricanes or weather, all right? That they're so complex that even the tiniest of factors can affect things on a large scale. So like a butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil can cause a typhoon in Japan, you know, many days or weeks later. It's like a cascading system of effects. But 
But if, if you're an intelligence, if you're an, uh, a divine intelligence that has access to seeing multiple probable futures, uh, but see, because see, the thing is, positive forces, even though they got a positive vibe, uh, they're not locked into only seeing positive futures. Um, and, and, and I think it's because they're more plugged into the divine part within themselves. So it's almost like they have higher administrative privileges over what parts of this you know, matrix system that they can see. So they can see the positive futures, they can see the negative futures, and because they can see more, they can maneuver in clever and in more clever ways than the negative forces can ever anticipate. Because they can see that little tiny probability that ends up, um, you know, um, undoing the negative forces. So, like, like in my case, when I got my fringe knowledge book back, or when I did my discerning alien disinformation, that one percent chance of me doing it, that's like a minor example on my level of doing the improbable thing that maybe wasn't foreseen by negative forces because i'm pretty sure the negative forces would have thought okay you know what he's going to fail 99 times out of 100 so we've, we we have a 99 percent success rate you know so like clinking champagne glasses figuratively speaking but there it is book, book is out because i did that one percent chance i didn't take into account right um so only only if you like in like in my case the reason why i completed the book is because i called upon my inner reserves of i guess my my dharma you know my mm. purpose that my inner sense of purpose and justice is what drove me ultimately to finish the book that and also willpower but that's what drove me to, to, to finish it so that's why i got out there and also with um the french knowledge for beginners i accomplished that one because uh something like a little voice in me did tell me to go ahead and try the fifth time so because i listened to intuition and because i kind of stuck with who i am at, at, at the core that's how i was able to defeat the probability of me not putting those books out at all, you know, and and what that what that speaks to is the fact that the divine can work through us in small ways to accomplish big things. It can it can just take like one day you're going for a walk and you get a certain idea in your mind, and it feels good and it feels right and it makes sense, and you have to make the choice about whether to go with it or not. If you go with it, it might lead you to a whole new future that ends up helping you and ends up helping others. So. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, so I mean, uh, just looking at how positive forces have played out in your life as well, and in your work, reading your work, uh, you've described them as being very subtle. Like the neg seem to have an outright kind of interference with our history, our evolution, the entire aliens' presence today, with everything happening with disclosure. Uh, but then, you you talk about how the true positive forces uh, wouldn't really intervene in that fashion, at least until the negative forces are outright, like all out in the open. Um, mm. So this kind of ties into the question as to a lot of people wonder, you know, why aren't the good guys coming to save us? Or is everything going to go as per the like negative entities plan with respect to creation of the Great Reset, New World Order, technocracy and the entire transhumanist nightmare that we're going into? So how do you reconcile the micro with the, the macro in terms of what's going on today with the alien agenda and what uh, positive forces are helping to counteract that, if any. Mm -hmm. Well, see, the one thing that we've noticed about the way negative forces work in this world is that generally they try to be covert, okay? Mm -hmm. So they do things very sneakily, like with governments, for example. With governments, they, like, like the American government in particular, they spent, uh, since when was it? Like, at least since 1913, slowly taking over the system you know, getting more and more socialists and neocons and these compromised politicians into power over time so that eventually when it, when it, when it finally counts, they can start enacting tyrannical laws and taking away people's freedoms and uh, leading to what is the Great Reset ultimately. I mean, the Great Reset, we talk about it now as only being a World Economic Forum plan, but no, I mean, that, that plan was already in the works 100 years ago. It's, it's the, the outgrowth of even Marxism back in the 1800s, you know, like it's just almost like a 150 year long agenda that is now coming to fruition now why didn't negative aliens or demons or whatever why didn't they simply land in force back in the 1800s when we didn't have machine guns and you know laser weapons and probably like anti-gravity black you know black ops squadrons why didn't they just take over the planet back then well the answer is it's because they needed our civilization to be at a certain level of technological proficiency to become self-sufficient so that the prison would run itself you see because if they had landed back in the 1800s we wouldn't have had surveillance systems the internet satellites uh you know things that would help 
uh, a police state, a global police state, police its own citizenry. So therefore, the aliens would have had to provide all of it, which is very risky, like sharing that level of technology. They would have had to train people, manage people, and it would have just been a big, big, inefficient thing. All they had to do was wait more than 100 years from, from the mid-1800s and wait until we had satellites and, you know, closed circuit television and, um, you know, pretty soon if they get through with it, a social credit score system and digital ID, right? All they had to do was wait for that and then kind of like take the present once the present has all been nicely wrapped up with a bow. That's what they're waiting for. Mm -hmm. The problem is the closer we get to the level of technological self-sufficiency, we also become independent from them too, right? So they have this very narrow window of time where they can come, where they can come in and essentially pluck the, pluck the fruit while it's still ripe before it falls from the tree and becomes its own tree. You know, it's so like, so before we reach independence, they have to come in here and try to take it over. So that's why they're doing it now. Right. But it's such a long step process because, um, from different sources that I looked into, um, one of which includes, I don't know if, I don't know if the raw material talked about it, but one of their offshoot channelings, the Kuo material talks about a quarantine having been put into place around earth. So like right now, according to this theory, the story, our timeline isn't even the real timeline that we should be on. It's like a temporary, temporary reality that we're on, a temporary timeline we're on, where we're kind of like working out our issues. We're working out how we relate to the fourth density alien factions. And once we get all that sorted out, then we merge back into the main timeline and join the rest of creation in terms of, you know, its story. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the, but the reason why I mentioned that is because that's the reason why the negative alien forces uh, haven't been out in the open over the past two to 3,000 years. Because you know, ancient times, if you look at the Sumerians, Egyptians, those ancient myths and their stories, they all talk about the gods, the gods, you know, really meaning aliens, walking the earth openly, being worshipped openly, interacting with humans. You know, back when God spoke to man, that that's what, I mean, because even in the Bible, the early parts of the Bible, we had supernatural things like, UFOs and burning bushes and voices from the heavens, right? And like entities talking to the actual tribes and telling them what to do. But we're not getting that nowadays, right? It's not it's not like we're getting this or that political party being talked to at rallies by the voice from heaven telling them to go this way or that way. We don't get that anymore. And the reason why that is is because there's been a quarantine that has been put into place that's been in place for probably around 3,000 years now that seems to be ending. That seems to be ending now. And so the quarantine seems to have been put into place by, now that we've talked about the densities, by a six density STO overseer group. And they've uh, come in, they basically told the ancient alien factions to knock it off. And I'm talking about ancient fourth density, both STO and STS aliens, because they were kind of like fighting with each other back then hmm. uh, over, over the what to do with humans, you know? So that's why in all the myths, there's always these stories of the gods warring with each other, because that's, what, that's what, what was going on back then. But they told him to knock it off and to give humanity a chance to evolve on its own, at least under the illusion of evolving on its own. So over the past 2,000 years, a lot of this UFO activity has become sub rosa, meaning become covert Disc or discreet. Yeah, yeah, discreet. Exactly. Right. So they're still manipulating history, but they have to do it covertly. They have to do it behind the scenes, like by manipulating politicians, by, you know, maybe inspiring one person to start this religion or that religion that ends up serving the alien agenda right so they can do that but they can't like have us build a temple that they land on and they come out and they you know speak to us uh, to the masses you know we all like bow down and worship to them they, they don't do that anymore but they, i'm sure that they want it want it to come back right so now that this quarantine is ending uh, i think that's why the disclosure th stuff that we're seeing in the news is starting to ramp up more and more and more. I think it's because the governments know that the alien secrecy is coming to an end. And so one way or another, they have to prepare the public for that reality. Right, you know, I mean, and, and they've been dragging their heels for decades, I'm sure, not wanting to do it, but now they've run out of time. So now they're kind of rushing to get that information out there and trying to get humanity on board with uh, the big revelation about what's, what's, you know, what's going on here. But the reason why I bring this up is because just as the negative powers have had to be covert and act over a long period of time, likewise, the positive forces also have had to be covert and act over a long period of time. 
And so one thing you'll notice is that all the steps, all the all the steps that the negative forces have done over the past decade or the past century, there's been a positive intervention as well that has also happened, but it's not at the same level. You know, it's yeah. not like um, it's not like the negative aliens took over the government and created certain political ideologies like fascism or communism or Marxism, and therefore positive aliens have created some other ideology and some other political party that goes to war against. No, it's not like that. It's more like the um, it's more like the negative forces are, are working through political powers, whereas the positive forces are working through um, cultural influences, whether it's certain spiritual teachers or certain awareness-based truth movements that spring up. You know, something that's more organic and not as top-down, something that's more like the bottom. And the reason they can they can get away with that is because what I mentioned earlier about how they have access to more probable futures in terms of what they can see than the negative forces. So they don't need to have the dictator in power enforcing a positive agenda. They don't need that. Um, they just need the right people in the right place at the right time to, to believe in the right things and to do the right things. And that ends up being a butterfly effect that when in the future the time counts, it comes together in the most miraculous way and ends up kicking out the legs from underneath the, the big war machine, the big machine of the negative alien forces, right? And that's a problem because if you and I look at the news right now and look around in the world, it seems like the negative forces are winning. Obviously, it seems, it seems that way because we've got war with Russia about to break out. You know, we've got uh, India recently um, banning exports of all rice except for basmati, right? So we've got food crises going on. We've got Russia bombing the Odessa ports, which limits the grain exports from Ukraine to other parts of the world. To raise okay. So we see all this in the news. We see that. We see the, the heavy-handed political correctness, which at this point has become total mental illness, you know, the cultural degradation. Um, but these are things that we see in the news, in videos, that are obvious 3D level things. There are things that are sensationalistic. So that's why it spreads virally online. That's why that's why it's in the news. Like the news, it's not, I mean, I mean, except for news doing like silly, like um, oh, puppy rescued stories or, um, you know, this, this charity story, you know, this guy who like hands out presents to blind or chill children or something, you know, we get those stories, but you don't hear most of the good that's being done, especially, especially if it's covert good, you know, covert good meaning people that we don't even know in terms of being famous that are doing things right now that will have a positive impact on the future. You know, so there's a lot of things happening right now that we can't see easily, but you can see it if you look very carefully and you sift very carefully through the data. Then, then you can tell that there's something going on. You can tell that there's a, a, a positive intervention going on that is countering the negative stuff. But until we actually go through it, we can't confirm that the positive forces have it locked down, that they have it like fully, right? We have to have faith that they do. And just like with the divine, a lot of things that happen in our own lives to save us, we might not even be aware of it. Mm. But it's there, it's there, and it's been there because we are still here, you know? You can do what you, you do. I can do what I do because we've had help. Some, some of the help, you know, we've seen and some of the help we have not seen. But it's, it's there in the background. And I think the same is true for the world as a whole. So as difficult as things might get for planet Earth and for humanity. And, uh, and see, and the, and the reason why it would get difficult is because of collective karma collective dharma you know maybe there's a, a greater purpose to humanity coming together and triumphing over adversity or something like that that particular growth plan or lesson plan has to be preserved so positive inter inter intervention cannot come in and short circuit that you know mm -hmm. it can't it can't deny us the opportunity to overcome adversity but I'll, but what it can do however is be almost like a referee or like a chaperone or like a mentor on the side carefully watching it, making sure that, you know, it, it'll get difficult, but we'll get enough help that will triumph in the end. And by triumphing in the end, therefore, we feel like we've done it. You know, we don't feel like, 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 a, like, like a God came in and snapped his fingers and did it all for us, meaning that we should now then be on our knees worshiping it like children. I think that's sort of outmoded. I think it's time for humanity to grow up. And I mean, if, if we're children of God, I guess we're going to become teenagers of God, something like that. You know, we need to go to the next level in order to not just keep on retreading the old ground. I think we're we're at that threshold now of 
graduating into 4D, and if you want to get biblical, eating from the tree of life. Not just the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but also the tree of life, which was the second tree in the Garden of Eden myth. So when we eat from the tree of life, well, that is what fourth density is. That is, you know, more etheric energy, more psychic power, living longer, being beyond linear, linear time. That is the next phase of humanity. Um, and I think we're being guided there. But just like with a movie or a video game, there has to be tension. You know, there has to be adversity and challenges and drama, you know, in order to get that glory, that growth and that, um, that character arc that we're moving through uh, in, our, in our human evolution. So I really liked in your book how you tied the entire like scientific physics aspect of this with the shift that's uh, you know going to happen mm -hmm. because you're talking about how there's like a black hole in the center of the galaxy that's radiating this uh, you know gravitational potential which can uh, eventually you know take us out of this reality into a kind of you know time space reality rather than mm -hmm. like the space time that you were talking about and that also lines up with a lot of uh, ancient kind of prophecies with respect to you know this time that we're going through and about to enter like i was hearing an interview you were talking about the zoroastrian text you know that's the religion that i happen to be born in so they have their own version of this this time where uh, you know there's going to be battles between different alien factions and even the, the bible has its own version so looking at all the stuff that's happening with uh, disclosure now like there were hearings at the capitol hill recently with david grush and a couple of other people who were presenting so a lot of people in the alt media have this kind of uh, you know view, particularly the people who've gotten recently that uh, you know this is all part of Project Blue Beam and the government's just gonna mm. like fake an alien invasion and then the humans are gonna take over and create a world government. I find that a view really really ignorant because it kind of assumes that oh the humans are gonna fake an alien invasion and the mm. humans are gonna take over, not realizing that it's the aliens who've been running mm. it all along. So yeah. uh, I just wanted to walk, uh, like you, to walk people through the disinformation tactics that have been used, the the possible scenarios that could be played. You know, I don't think Bluebeam is really plausible. Like from just from one perspective, I feel like a lot of people are thinking about it. So it, I don't think that it's probable that they would do something when so many people are mm -hmm. kind of anticipating that. But even in terms of the the other scenarios that you talk about, like maybe you know nuclear war might break out and then an alien faction might come and offer to rescue us and pose as our saviors or maybe there might be a negative alien faction that might offer us technology and then we might get lured by that and then fall for mm -hmm. the deception maybe they might separate their alien factions like so they might demonize the greys or the reptilians and then the nordics might come and pose as the saviors there's right. so many things that could happen right so like maybe just give us your take on uh, the the prominent alien disinformation that's right. out there and if at a time where this stuff does go, you know, public like it's supposed to, how are people supposed to discern and differentiate between who to trust and who not to trust? Hmm. Well, one of the big disinformation lines that has been going on for a long time is that, well, it, it, it depends on how you look at it. Like if you look at Stephen Greer, for example, hmm. Stephen Greer and what he says about aliens, he says that all aliens are positive. Okay. And that if we have any reports of negative aliens, then it's simply due to the government staging fake alien abductions in order to, in order to demonize aliens because they don't want people to reach out to aliens uh, for, help. for technology, help, whatever, right? They, they, they want to keep us all for themselves. So they're trying to demonize aliens so that we kind of get them to go away. And then therefore the New World Order, globalist, military industrial complex has control over the entire planet. That's what Greer says. Now, of course, if all aliens are good, then that totally contradicts history about the wars amongst the gods. I mean, even even things like uh, the, the Battle of Nuremberg in 1561, uh, people saw giant UFO crafts and like little spheres and everything fighting each other, shooting at each other, some of them falling to the ground and disintegrating. That was an alien war like hundreds and hundreds of years ago, well, in the 1500s. Um, that wouldn't happen if aliens were all positive. Right. When, what, I mean, even positive? even in our own Indian text, like we have the Mahabharat Ramayana, and I, I know you've mentioned some of that in your Gnosis book as well. Mm -hmm. Do you want to elaborate yeah. on examples from like Indian texts where there were factions, like uh, warring factions between the? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, you got the you got the Devas, you got the Asuras, or you got the Devas and Asuras, and uh, I mean, I mean, there were warring factions at, at the time. Um, but the thing is about the Mahabharata texts. There's there's a lot in there 
that is essentially alien technology. It's not conventional, you know. I mean, they, well, sure, they got they got bows, they got arrows, they got chariots, but they have what seems to be nuclear weapons, energy weapons, um, hyperdimensional weapons, things that can destroy space time itself. Mm. So I forget what the name of that well, one weapon was, but yeah, it had the ability to destroy the entire universe. You know, is that Astra? Yes, yes, that's it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and my book is so complicated. I, I had to like, I had to write it. And then it's difficult to remember what I wrote because there's so much detail in there. So that's why I put it in a book so people can just read it, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, the, the Indian texts have it. And uh, I think, I th see, I think the Indian texts, they originated, of course, with the ancient, ancient uh, Vedics who I think were Aryans. But I think their, their history was taken from an even earlier people. And it's possible that that history might have even originated off world, for all we know. So it may not have even taken place on Earth. But of course, once the story was told on Earth, they had to use local names of you know this or that mountain range or whatever. Um, but I think the story could have originated even even before that, you know, off world. So what we think of as Asuras and Davis and the different um, I forget the name of some of the factions that they're fighting, but those could have originally been opposing alien factions, for all we know, using alien technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, some of some of the lore, uh, either in channeling and either even in some of the mythology. It does get into the idea that there were a group, there was a civilization on another planet that warred so heavily that they destroyed their own planet. And then, they, and then they had to come to Earth, you know? So I think it's possible that some of these Nordic alien groups might have been that, you know, they might have come from another planet. That's why they look human, because they're essentially human, but they're on another planet, you know, seated, seated elsewhere. Um, and then they were transported to Earth, which I guess would explain why they're not really cut out for the earth environment. I mean, what are you doing on earth with how hot it is with such pale skin and such fair hair? You know, it doesn't make sense. I mean, of course they try to explain it in terms of, oh, it's an adaptation to, to getting more vitamin D in, in Northern, in Northern Europe. Well, if that's true, then how come the Eskimos aren't blonde haired and blue eyed and fair skinned like they are, you know, it's like they keep on contradicting themselves. But the, but the point is that in, in these ancient wars, technology was used to well, not only fight against each other, but to change the course of history, right? So one of the things I talk about in my book is the Ark of the Covenant. Which you know, you the Ark and the Grail. I didn't want to go into that because I wanted to keep, like, there's so much to talk about, but then, mm -hmm. like, I really recommend, I mean, people who are interested in the, like, understanding the hyper-history side of things, go read Tom's book, Gnosis, because that really goes into detail into all of this. I was saying that I, I didn't bring up the Ark and the Holy Grail and all of that because... I wanted to like speak about other subjects, but yeah, I have read about that. I find that very yeah. fascinating. Yeah, yeah, and just really quick, I'll just really, really, sum really quickly summarize it. The Ark of the Covenant and the Holy Grail, if you look at what they could do in terms of manifesting things out of thin air, uh, killing people, levitating by themselves, uh, the energy that they would emit, it's alien technology that I call demiurgic technology because it plugs into the etheric and astral energy fields that underpin our reality. And so it's able to manipulate reality in a very deep and subtle way that you can't do with conventional technology. And when this was used and misused throughout history, it changed our timeline. And that's why we're in the situation that we're, that we're in now. Uh, and so, yeah, so that's part of the alien agenda. And you asked about uh, some, other dis dis some other disinformation that they use. Well, one thing you have to be careful about is that when people like David Grush, these whistleblowers, when they talk about these non-human intelligences or NHIs, which is another name for aliens, or interdimensionals when they talk about them you know these these people were asked you know did these nhis have they ever hurt people have they ever exhibited signs of hostility hmm. and the whistleblower answers yes yes they have people have died at their hands and so what you can take from that is the idea that oh these nhis if they're bad if they're malevolent then they cause injury then they're violent then they have weapons probably and maybe they want to take over earth in a violent way right so if you get focused on that view of that's what negative aliens are then what happens if an alien group comes in and says hey we've been watching your civilization we we feel sorry for you and we want to help you out we've got some technology we can give you give you some genetic upgrades to make you smarter uh you know just just do what we say and we'll lead you into a better more positive future of course, you're going to think, well, well, obviously those are positive aliens because they're not violent. They're not scary. They're not, they're trying to heal us and not kill us. But little do you know that they're actually cosmic con artists who want to, you know, get in here, gain our, gain our confidence, gain our trust. And then using their technology, using whatever they offer us, act as a Trojan horse to 
genetically manipulate us to become more obedient, you know, maybe less, maybe less um, independent thinking, right? Mm. So maybe that's why we have in the abduction phenomenon, the idea of the gray hybrid breeding program, the idea that they want to cross gray alien genetics with humans in order to help themselves and also to help us to upgrade us, you know, because grays are aliens, right? They're so smart. They got psychic power. So, hey, what about putting some gray alien genetics to a human so that we become smarter and we become more psychic and we can become more like these, these gray aliens. Well, that's not good because gray aliens at the same time, they're also high hive minded. They, they lack independent thinking ability. They're very um, easily controlled. They're like a slave species, right? I guess like a slave product. So if we incorporate those genetics into us, we will think it's an upgrade, but it's not. It's going to be a part of the transhumanist fallacy, right? So we have all these transhumanists now saying, Hey, we should merge with machines so that we can upgrade human intelligence and skip to the next level of human evolution. Well, I mentioned earlier that the next level of human evolution is a, is a spiritual evolution mm -hmm. to the, for the fourth density state. Okay. That's only done through conscious evolution. You can't do that through technology necessarily. So when they talk about, when these transhumanists talk about human evolution using technology like AI and chips in our brains and, you know, like, like put like a Google search engine right in our heads, right? We think it's an upgrade, but it's not. It's actually a spiritual downgrade. It's a form of spiritual enslavement. So just as the transhumanists are trying to do it now, the gray aliens and that faction is trying to do it too. And actually, they're, they're probably both extensions of each other. You know, it's all probably part of the same yeah. agenda. Because because obviously, if humans can get used to the idea of modifying ourselves through technology and genetics, then when gray aliens introduce, hey, we've made hybrids, then we're supposed to be like, oh, wow, look, they already did it. You know, you already got these awesome, like, superhumans who are, like, part alien, part human, and they've got the technological, technological upgrades. Let's do it, too. And if we go along with that path, then we will become dumbed down spiritually. Right. So that's one of the disinformation lines. The idea that negative aliens are necessarily violent, um, you know, injurious, warlike, not necessarily. They can be con artists who can take over the entire planet without firing a single shot. So the real threat isn't necessarily violent aliens. It is aliens who are imposters, who pretend to be the good guys, who pretend to come here to save us, to rescue us from World War Three, from climate change, you know. To, to give us food, medicine, you have to watch out. You have to watch out because whatever they give us, that in itself can be a Trojan horse. And whatever they make us give up in exchange for those good things is part of the deception too because that, that's how they gain control. You know, So it's that saying, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. So beware of greys bearing gifts. You don't want to take, take, take gifts from the devil. You, know, you don't, you don't want to make a, a Faustian bargain. So that's, that's, a big, that's a big disinformation ploy, for example. So you have like a summary I was seeing in Twitter recently. You summarized uh, the main points through which we can differentiate between positive aliens and next pretending to be positive. Could you elaborate on some of those? Yeah, 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 definitely. I'm going to pull it up here so I can refer to it. I mean, I know it like I know it in the back of my mind, but it's good to yeah, have. This is good to, if you have all the points covered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Going to my Twitter. All right, here we go. I got some crazy stuff on my Twitter. It's pretty entertaining. <laughs> I know, man. I'm a really big fan of a Twitter account. I try to track every post that, that you send out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here we go. Here are the 10 key ways to distinguish between positive and negative aliens. All right, number one, positive aliens encourage discernment, freedom, and spiritual empowerment, whereas negative aliens seek control and dependence. And that's sort of obvious when you think about it, but... A lot of people skip over that. So, for example, um, it's not even just aliens. It can also be spirit guides or people think are spirit guides, but they're not actually spirit guides. Mm. In some cases, they're actually demons, right? So a person considers themselves psychic. They consider themselves having spirit guides and they hear voices or little nudges or whatever. But these voices are very controlling. They're almost like control freaks, like micro controlling a person's life. And that's not at all a sign of a positive spiritual being. That's a sign of either a discarnate human who just wants to play with a living human and kind of sadistically run their life, you know? Or it's a sign of a demon who just wants to gain more and more control over a human being, almost like a, like a, like a spider wrapping a fly in a cocoon, you know, to start feeding on it. That's, that's how it works. So the positive aliens, they, don't, they definitely do not want us to become dependent on them. 
Whereas the negative forces do want us to become dependent on them because that is what slavery is. You know, once a, once a crack dealer has a person hooked, then they can, they can, you know, supply pull the their drugs, yeah. pull the strings, supply their drugs, lead them into worse things like human, you know, turn them into a human trafficking victim, right? So dependence is one. So that's number one. Number two, positive aliens are very careful. Well, I already said that. Positive aliens are very careful to not create dependency. Negative aliens want followers and they want worship. Well, it's because they're they're pulling on our religious strings to Yeah, I was just going to ask that actually. That, that was like a mini synchronicity. I was literally just going to say like like talk about the religion. So, does that mean that there is a big negative alien influence in the religions or do you think that the religions itself had positive figures but then the power structure kind of hijacked them in order to make us worship even these uh, positive gods and maybe make our awareness and intentions and our prayers go to the wrong address right yeah i think it's um it's both and more one or the other depending on the religion okay mm -hmm. like yeah. like in the case of christianity for example uh not to get too deeply into the history of christianity but you had the original group that taught a certain gnostic type belief systems and they're called the essenes so you had this essenes were which which was like a it was a jewish sect but they were more spiritual than other jewish sects at the time which were more ritual tradition oriented right so they had like real spiritual knowledge and uh at least one person from that group went around teaching those teachings and that became the basis of the historical jesus christ and there were others who also had good knowledge like uh apollonius of tyania tyana he, he was also a, a guy who did similar things at the same time as the, the fabled jesus right now after this historical character died and went away there was about 20 years where the the group the cult the the sect surrounding it started growing more and more and more and these were the earliest true authentic christians well the greek and roman powers at the time they saw that and they tried to suppress it but it was too big of a threat and so they concocted a plan to hijack it and to incorporate it into their own empire uh, it took it took a couple hundred years to fully get off the ground but eventually rome became christianized and that became eventually the, the roman catholic church and we know that you know it was it was a force of tyranny that had a very wide ranging field of power all right so but, but that's just christianity if you look at the old testament there's so much alien influences in the old testament it's not even funny and the Old Testament is still being looked. You know, it's still being worshipped today. You know, it's still being followed today, and it's still influencing culture today, in such a way that modern culture has been influenced by various religions, not just Christianity, but you know, of course, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, uh, and then the more recent ones like Scientology and Mormonism. Right? All these different religions have had tinkering since their conception. So some of them might have been started artificially by either aliens or by negative secret, secret societies secretly mm. uh, just purely for socio-political control um i don't want to step on too many toes but if you if you look at the origins of islam for example which originated what around like 500 600 ad um it had a lot of interesting political influences go into it to make it be what it became all right and uh, christianity had, had its own the old testament the old testament was written right around 800 to 700 bc and it also had a lot of political influences going into it to rewrite history, uh, shift dates and places around, shift the people around in order to create a narrative that could combine what was left of the Jewish people around that time to create a, a new a new religion, you know, of, of Judaism. So a lot of religions have had different artificial influences. Most of those I don't think are alien necessarily. Um, the, the biggest ones were definitely human political interests that came together but, to shape it for, for political control. But the the stories and the myths that went into those religions, like like you know, with with Hinduism, you have the, the Vedas, you get know, the Mahabharata, right? All those ancient stories, the stories that the historical events that they refer to, I'm pretty sure were alien based, either alien influenced, you know, alien historical events or alien forces themselves fighting fighting it out. All right. So yeah, so that's where the alien influence comes in. Comes from comes in at the actual original historical events and how aliens have influenced human society, oh. and then those influences were remembered and then incorpor incorporated into the myths that became parts of the religion. So, yeah, Makes but sense. you know, but you know, aliens can capitalize on that because 
because aliens are extremely smart and they're very perceptive and they know human psychology like nothing else. They, they know human psychology better than the best psychologist on earth because they're psychic and probably because some of their ancient, 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 ancient ancestors had a hand in genetically shaping our genetics, right? So it's almost like they got the blueprints to how the human system works. Um, so they know human psychology very well and they know how to construct stories or narratives that play on our cultural and personal personal expectations. So if, if a person um, goes into the New Age field and becomes a big fan of the Pleiadians and Commander Ashtar and you know the, the whole like New Age mythology, yeah. then when an alien approaches this person to manipulate them or use them, they're gonna use they're gonna use that mythology. You know, they're gonna present themselves as a oh I'm a Pleiadian and uh, you're you know you're, you're my, my third cousin in an ancient life and on another planet. And so therefore you have a destiny that is yeah. in line with our destiny. So we're going to make you into our spokesperson. So before you know it, this person becomes an expert on the, the commander Ashtar, Palladian fleet, whatever. And it becomes another person out there talking BS about this or that alien group, having no idea what they're actually talking about because their head has been filled with a bunch of alien disinformation. Right. It's because that person has that belief system. Whereas another person might be a devout Christian, and then when the aliens come to them, they're going to try to frame it within a more Christian context, mm. right? So they're going to use whatever the person believes in. Um, now, there is an objective reality behind all of those belief systems. There's an actual objective reality to aliens themselves. And that's a whole subject in itself because a lot of aliens that people encounter, they're not even, they're not like us. Like, see, we are born into this body and we don't leave this body until we die, you know, other than like astral projection or dreams or something. But... For aliens, a lot of their bodies are they're, they're temporary biobots. They're temporary avatars that they inhabit. So when you meet, let's say, a Nordic alien or uh, a reptilian, their true form might not actually be that. You know, those might just be mm. biological, biological spacesuits that they're wearing that looks that way. Now, I'm not saying that's the case across the board. I do think that some Nordic aliens could be time travelers from our own future. They could be... Um, uh, descendants of ancient offshoots of the human race that diverged, you know, genetically, and maybe they even left Earth, went to another place, and then came back now. So, but because they all look human, we tend to call them, oh, they're just all Pleiadians or they're just all Nordics. Well, it's not that simple. You could have time travelers, you could have aliens, you could have, um, you know, biobot suits that are inhabited by something that doesn't even look human, right? So when when these aliens show up one day, we have to be mindful that what we see isn't necessarily what they are, right? If they come out all looking like like, like beautiful space Fabios and Barbies, maybe it's because those are bodies that have been genetically engineered to play on our ideas of what beauty is, right? Because we see that all the time with guys where some woman can be a, a total psycho, but because she's pretty, the guy just kind of goes yeah. along with it, you know, kind of, kind of makes excuses for this person or vice versa, right? Some real good looking guy and a girl will fall goo goo over him, even, even if he's a psychopath, even if he's a total con artist and liar. Well, aliens, of course, of course they know about this principle. And of course they have, well, and since they have genetic engineering abilities, of course they would use that to create mm, clones or biobots or artificial bodies that play to our cultural expectations. But that's in parallel to, and not mutually exclusive with, the possible idea of them being um, um, time travelers or ancient offshoots, you know. So I, I think I think different possibilities are going on, and uh, but but it all ties back, yes, to religion in the sense that religion is is yet another one of those cultural things that they can play on, right? Yeah. So we just have to be aware because this is uh, I mean it's it's about the dynamic more so than the group that or the belief system that we're talking about because they can use our beliefs against us and it's about knowing the principles and knowing in which ways that we can differentiate so that even if a, you know, like a religious, like an alien uses a religion or an alien uses some other belief of us and tries to deceive us, then we can have the ways of vetting them or testing if they're actually positive or they're just trying to play on our beliefs. Right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. So let's finish up the list here. Yep. So, so number, number three, positive aliens provide information to help us make wise decisions. While negative aliens withhold information and manipulate. And that is true, you know, so so if an alien is positive, it's going to want to ensure that we make more informed decisions in life. 
So it's going to tell us about the alien agenda. It's going to tell us that, yes, there are negative aliens here. There are deceiver forces here. And here's how you can differentiate who they are. Mm. Whereas if it is a negative alien pretending to be positive, they're not going to get into that territory because that's going to expose them, right? They don't want to have us even be thinking about it. Mm. And so that's why we have people like Stephen Greer and others who say that all aliens are good. So that way, that question never even comes up. The possibility of having to differentiate between imposters and actual negative aliens or or imposters and and true positive aliens. The question doesn't even come up. And he's been asked that in interviews in the past. And you know what he does? He just kind of like smiles smugly and then avoids the question. Because I think I think it's a part of him knows. I, I think I think he he might know. What, what there's a lot of nefarious he... influence behind him. I think there's a lot of Rockefeller involvement and his involvement with like a couple of government insiders also that go back. I'll maybe I'll send you like a couple of good videos on that if you haven't come across. I think Truthstream Media did a good video on Greer and his connections to the Rockefellers and all of that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah there's certainly that faction and the Rockefellers, of course. They also tie into uh, Hillary, the, the Clintons, mm-hmm. right, and, and the, the Obamas too in a way, and uh, John Podesta. That whole crowd is tied into that. Um, and funny enough, back in 2016, Hillary Clinton, she was called the ET candidate. There was a, all these news headlines about how Hillary was going to be the ET candidate because she, she was very involved in the disclosure subject, right? Yeah. But I think that disclosure subject or that disclosure pathway was a different pathway from what we're seeing now with David Grush. I think that pathway would have been more like, um, well, see, interestingly enough, right now, the Obamas are involved in producing a Netflix series on the Betty and Barney Hill abductions of 1961, which was the first public gray alien type abduction that we know of, okay? So the Obamas themselves are also involved in this alien disclosure subject, but they seem to be more pro gray alien, more pro painting grays as uh, the helpful next step in human evolution, you know? Which is the opposite of David Grush coming out and saying, yes, there have been rogue military groups. They've made deals with negative aliens. Uh, NHIs have been hostile. They've injured people, right? You can see how those are two different types of disclosure pathways. Yeah. One of them one of them is partial and disinformative. And the other one is more um, awareness oriented, like trying to give us a fuller picture. And so I think I think I think what that I think what's happening there right now is that we have one military slash government faction um, that is taking a different approach from the other military government faction and they want to give a fuller disclosure sooner in order to preempt the other one which is going to be a little bit longer term more disinformative more like leading us into the transhumanist gray you know socialist hive mind state you know great reset right so so the whole like great reset versus great awakening those are manifesting right now within the disclosure process because we've got different factions trying to do it differently one mm. towards well, the great reset future, one more towards the great awakening future. And I think those two government factions or whatever, whatever they are, I mean, they might not even be government. They could be military. They could be like non-governmental organization or secret society. I think they're merely acting as proxies for alien factions that are even higher than them. And I'm talking about fourth density STO and STS groups. Because, mm. because, because, you know, if the, if these higher negative or and positive alien groups are going to want to steer human history, but they have to do it covertly. They're going to want to work through the points of power within our society. And that's military, government, uh, scientific minds, influential authors, people like that. Those are the ones that they're gonna to try to influence. So yes, you're gonna have some military and government groups that are probably more under the influence of positive aliens and some more under the influence of negative aliens. And then all we see is, oh, well, that's weird. Like, like you've got this group here pitching for the grays and you got this group here saying aliens are possibly negative so you're going to get contradiction and i think as disclosure goes on more and more and more you're going to get more and more obviousness of the alien element until one day one day it's going to boom right into the open where you're going to have a positive alien group maybe maybe if they exist but most definitely a negative alien group probably trying to pretend to be positive so they're going to be out in the open um you know interacting with humanity probably through uh um, groomed leaders that they've already selected. You know, for all we know, Stephen Greer could be part of the diplomacy team or something. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> but, but, but people that they've already pre-selected would be part of that process so that they can manage the narrative. Um, and then it would be up to positive researchers like us, positive aliens, and maybe some sort of sympathetic positive group within the military and government groups to counter that narrative with their own, you know, 
information, data, warning, advice, and so on. So yeah, I think we're going to get a polarization between the positive and the negative within the disclosure process as we move on. Yeah, and that's that's why it's so important to have these principles, right? Because rather than knowing who to trust, uh, it's it's like an exercise in discernment, as you were saying. And mm-hmm. the the I mean, the impression that this whole thing gives me is that our perceptions are very important to the alien disinformation program because that's one thing that they've been trying to vehemently control and steer the narrative in different directions. So I I don't think that people, even in the audience, like when this interview will go up and more people will watch it, like. The most important thing I feel with the entire alien subject is just us getting more street smart and realizing how to wade through it. Because if we are discerning enough, then half of their ploys will fail because, you know, mm-hmm. we'll have the necessary awareness to be able to distinguish. And why why is why are our perceptions so important in order for them to take over? Like, why can't they just come and, uh, you know, enslave us by force? Like, why do they have to psychologically get us to fall for their antics instead of just being able to take over? Yeah, that's one of the key questions. And I think if people ponder that, I mean, we know that's the case because we know that that's happening because aliens have existed throughout history, okay? Aliens exist right now and they're ramping up their disclosure process right now. Mm. So they're moving towards a takeover, but they've had thousands of years to do it, but they haven't. So we have to ponder the question. And so I think there's three reasons. I think there's three reasons why that is. The first reason is a simple matter of efficiency. As I mentioned earlier, if they wait until the fruit is ripe and they pluck it, in other words, when we are technologically self-sufficient to be able to police ourselves and imprison ourselves, then they barely have to do anything. They just have to be the royalty that comes down. They tell the top secret leaders what to do. And then everything, the pyramid kind of goes down from there. And, you know, you got that and you got that and you got that. You got the world governments, you got the military, you got the police, right? And the entire society is on lockdown. And uh, we just become like a like a slave race, essentially, to them managing ourselves. So that's one reason. Because, um, you know, if they, if they come in by force, they would only have to come in by force if it's, one, premature. And number two, if we can't enslave ourselves. So that's, um, they're smart enough to be efficient. And um, like I said, they just want to, do the minimum amount of effort necessary in order to control an entire planet. And, and that precludes the, the, the ability to use force. So that's one. The other, the other reason I think would be that the uh, higher powers that are, that are even above them don't allow the use of force right now. I think the quarantine that I mentioned earlier, the quarantine is still in effect. It's, it's starting to be lifted, but it's still in effect. So the aliens can't come out right now and start you know, shooting each other or t- trying to take over the government. Uh, they still have to be covert, but we're starting to see more and more of them coming out. So we're, we're moving in that direction. And then I think the third reason, um, one of the only sources that really gets into it is uh, the Allies of Humanity books, where it talks about how Earth exists within a greater community of cosmic life. And we're actually in a quite busy part of uh, the, the universe. It's, it's kind of like, a, it's kinda like, like we're like the Central Park in New York, where it's this green park, but it's surrounded by nothing but dense urban jungle. You know, so we, we think we're in the middle of a forest, but we're not. We're actually surrounded by city. So we, so we think that we're alone in the universe, but we're not. There's actually lots of different alien civilizations around. And because it's so busy, they have set up laws about how to, about what can go on within that space. So we're actually under the jurisdiction of these cosmic laws, which don't allow an invading alien force, like some of these negative alien factions, to directly take over this planet. Um, they have to do it by consent. So if they come in... If they, if they petition us, and uh, if enough people of the planet consent to going along with them, then then they would have full legal right to this planet. And then, therefore, the positive forces, if they exist, they wouldn't be allowed to to come here and, and undo that. So just different reasons, you know. But all reasons support exactly the same conclusion, which is that negative aliens cannot do it by force yet. They have to wait until a certain point, and they need our permission. They need our ability to, our capacity to invite them in. Right. It's, mm-hmm. it's just exactly the Trojan horse thing, because the Trojan horse, the Greeks parked it outside the, you know, the, the fortification. And then therefore, the people had to open the door and let the Trojan horse in. Little did they know that there were soldiers inside the horse that were going to be climbing out and therefore helping to, to defeat those people. So it's, it's exactly like that. Got it, man. Bro, that's fucking like fascinating. I'm mind blown right now <laughs> with all the insights that you've dropped. Yeah. I, I want to be considered. Do you have more energy or do you want to call it and maybe you can connect another time? Because I have some stuff to get through, but it depends on you. Like No, no, I'm good because uh, let's, let's go for another half hour. That way it'll be f- almost four hours. We can split it into two parts if we had to, you know. Done, man. 
yeah uh, yeah no, really i'm really grateful you're giving the, yeah. like me and the audience so much time to like really go into the stuff so uh, i'll uh, try to pack this last half an hour with the uh, most i would say like interesting insightful questions for people and maybe we can try to like cons- consolidate your insights so that we can cover more maybe but like yeah take it your way mm-hmm. so let's see i have, I have a long list mm-hmm. here uh okay let's start with this so with the entire break break up you gave of the different densities and dimensions um you know there's beings on higher levels feeding on lower levels so a lot of uh, people who are vegans and vegetarians make the argument that just like we feed on animals the negative 40 sts are actually feeding on us and if we eat animals then it's just justified that mm-hmm. they can feed on us as well i have my own insights on why that's a misconception but maybe yeah let's hear let's hear your take on it okay Yeah, so we have to it's a it's a semantic fallacy that that's going on there. All right. So the way that I see it is this. Humans um you know, you know funny enough, we we're conscious, right? We're, we're conscious, we can speak. So it's easy for a human to think, well, I'm above an animal. I'm on like I'm like way above an animal. I'm not an animal at all. I'm a human being. But what they don't realize is that they are they are a non-human consciousness, a higher spirit in a human body. Right. Mm, mm. But the human body itself is an animal. It's actually part of the jungle. It's part of the animal kingdom, the environment. That that's, that's what it is. Um and so just as you have a wolf eating a bunny, just as you have a cat eating a mouse or whatever, the human body has a certain diet that it needs. Mm. And um you know, vegans can argue it. They have their viewpoints, but in my in my viewpoint I think humans are omnivores. We're omnivores and our digestive system is not optimized for a vegan diet. So we can we can get by, we can survive on a vegan diet, but it's not optimal. Um and so therefore humans if you want to be at top capacity, um to be in your tip-top operational condition as per your biology, you're going to need animal products. Uh, especially organ organ meats for example, you know, things things that you simply cannot get from the plant hmm. kingdom. you can't get it from that you're going to get get certain deficiencies so you have to take supplements and then you end up with a with a diet that's like half supplements but what kind of diet is that it's not even natural anymore right it's like a chemical diet it's a vegan Wait, but it's chemical people watching it probably say johan takes 30 supplements as well and he's not a vegan so i mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i know but but i mean okay i'll i'll say this there are different genetics and it loosely correlates with blood with uh, blood types but not exactly but it's a, just different genetics some do better on a vegan diet than others right so if you're someone that do, does really well on it that's awesome i wish i could be that way i'm not because i've got a different blood type i got different genetics so i do need animal products to be at my at my tip top shape right and i think i think a lot of humanity does currently so we'd have to genetically modify ourselves in order to get by awesomely on on a vegan diet right but i don't think we're there yet so it's a fallacy to think that all humanity can switch to it and and therefore be okay with it um but basically so if you have to eat animals we do it because we can because we have the physical ability not because we have the right i don't believe we have a i don't i don't believe we have a philosophical or god-given right to eat an animal we do it because we can it's the law of the jungle mm. the law of the jungle the law of the jungle says one animal eats another because it must and because it can not because it has a right to like some sort of legal mm. right or philosophical right or spiritual right all right so likewise aliens prey on us because they can right demons feed on our emotional energy because they can now if they had the right to do that if they had the right to do that then if you were to take steps to keep them from feeding on you or from abducting you or whatever then you'd be violating their right then you would be in the yeah. wrong to to yeah. keep them from doing it right so that's where the logical fallacy comes in see if we have the right to eat animals and they have the right to eat us then if we don't let them eat us then we're violating their right to eat us that that's bad that's like a bad bad logic yeah. but if we have the but if we have the ability to eat animals and they have the ability to eat us then if we keep them from eating us well that's our ability to keep them from doing that there's no violation there we're actually we're if anything we're preserving our own self we're pre- preserving our free will by fighting back so I think we we do what we must and what we can to the best of our ability and that's all there's to it. That's how I see it. Yeah, one one really interesting insight I got from your work is that we actually have the ability to take our power back and to not feed them compared mm-hmm. to animals necessarily who can't really do that but uh, in the larger scheme of things they serve as a fuel source for us and then we're converting that energy into more 
positive entropy overall like what what right. output we can contribute to the world in terms of our polarity of consciousness and you know just that whole journey is way more than what an animal could do so i feel like there's a like you describe it there's a net positive effect over there when we're mm-hmm. eating like a lower life form and how it's you know playing out in the larger scheme of things right. whereas when it comes to like negative entities and stuff i mean your your material is gold with respect to self defense both on a mm-hmm. like you know mental emotional spiritual level and you know a lot of people just assume like you know we were talking about earlier that the elite can just take you out and oh some like anyone who's not dead yet is control opposition like this is what a lot of people believe that you know if someone's out there and he's not like people use this for david ike a lot but they don't understand the entire invisible metaphysical tapestry that's going on with you know everything we laid out so they tend to assume that but then as you were saying there's higher uh, we we have metaphysical laws and then we have the laws of the jungle so it depends on if if we are as you you know rightly point out that if we are uh, you know oriented towards our ego and our shadow then we lose that higher metaphysical proce- uh, protection and then these forces can you know it kind of opens the door for them to feed on us but then if we mm-hmm. stay in our spirit then we actually you know are not like a victim or a hostage to them it's just that we have this ability but most of it has to do with self mastery like on a, like it's a it's a kind of crash course in individual self development of sorts to mm-hmm. you know understand the tactics and to up our game so that we can protect ourselves against them so i don't think that we necessarily like victims to these beings if we have the power but i do have uh, some questions with respect to i can understand you know when we grow up like this is a second question like when we grow up and we are adults you know we can learn all this stuff and take our power back but tom what about the kids who go through satanic ritual abuse and you know who who don't even have the opportunity to grow up in terms of being able to protect them like i'm sure that they have certain reasons for why their metaphysical defenses are not there maybe you, if you could go into that a little bit and explain like why these kids go through these horrific things that you know it's happening on a worldwide scale hmm. yeah <clears throat> i think it comes down to the fact that as i mentioned earlier two of the things that kind of define this world that we're in is a uh, free will and physics and earlier i mentioned how uh, uh physics is the reason why a bullet can you know destroy your body and kill you right it's because, it's because of physics it's transfer of momentum and energy and force <clears throat> and so there are it's it's kind of like a chess game where it's possible to get your pieces just right where the other person you know it's it's like a checkmate on the other person the other person can't do anything anymore because the game just worked out to where that's it you know you're you're about to kill the king right and i think that can happen here in the physical world as well because of free will uh, and see see and the thing about free will is because it exists not everything can go perfectly to plan mm. right because because if everything were perfectly under the control of the divine let's say 100% under the control then no one would have any free will at all right because there's only one choice that you could ever make which would have to be the divine the right choice you could never ever make any single other choice because if you did then it would go against that right so because free will exists there are pockets within this grand chess game where negative forces have the upper hand over I mean, they, i mean they're winning locally they might be losing globally but they're winning locally. And so what what exactly is it that prevents the secret societies from um having their women be impregnated to give birth to babies that they keep off the map, you know, not even social security number, no IDs, yeah. they're kept underground mm. and they're, they're bred to be breeders, to do do nothing but breed babies. And then those babies and you know bad things happen to them, right? that's happening because biology and physics says it can happen right when you got a sperm and an egg and they combine and you get fertilization then the baby gets born grows up feed it food it grows that's the laws of physics and biology right there so that's why that can happen is because they're they're allowing and making it to happen in order for something to step in to prevent that violation from happening um there there has to be a big metaphysical reason for it okay yeah. Yeah. and and unfortunately you have a combination of genuine free will violations where a spirit is born and bad things happen to it that should not have happened and that's when you get into the idea of positive karma yeah. which is that which is that you're violated in a way that sh- that goes against everything that you came here for hmm. uh and it's going to be made up to you um so that you can continue, life in the so that so that you can continue your your learning your, your learning path hmm. um and and that's not like it's not like some 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 cosmic welfare system it's it's you yourself he said oh shoot you know didn't wasn't supposed to go this way i'm going to give myself another chance and maybe maybe kind of make up for for what just happened right yeah. so you get positive karma for when there are actual true true genuine free will violations 
you have that and then you have cases where free will is probably not being violated if if there isn't a truly sentient consciousness in that body okay. like, if you, like if you were to create a clone that's not even conscious it just has mm -hmm. like an ai brain and you do bad things to it like um in, in the the show Westworld, where these robots are built and and you know people people pay to go there to to do bad things to the robots well you're not going to get you're not going to get the same level of karma from that as you would doing it to the real person, right? So I think it's possible that that some of these, I mean, we, we can't know, but I'm saying that some of these kids are probably not spirited. They probably don't have a spirit. So therefore, they don't have higher metaphysical protection. They don't have uh, a dharma, a dharma karmic type pathway that, that shields them from certain things. So I think it's a mix of that. And I think it's a mix of genuine free will violations of actual kids that don't deserve it. And I think both are happening. Um, and, and, and I think as far as like justice and righteousness goes, both of them should be protected because it doesn't matter if a kid doesn't have a reincarnating spirit. The fact is their consciousness might be more on the level of an animal, but you're not going to abuse an animal. You're not going to yeah. hurt an animal just for nothing, right? Yeah. You're, you're going to want to save animals and preserve their happiness. So so what if they don't have a spirit? You're going to look out for them. You're going to protect them. You're going to try to give them a happy life just, just because they, they are life. They're part of life. You want to protect life. It just doesn't matter what it is. So, yeah. Good insights, man. Okay. Um, in terms of negative entities and aliens, uh, th the one insight I really like from your work is that rather than people perceiving them to be something external, external activity like UFOs and all of that, most of the interference is actually in our personal lives. And the main ways <clears throat> that we can defend ourselves against them have to do with emotional self mastery, which is what a lot of people don't think about, you know, when we're thinking about the alien subject, like people are thinking in terms of, oh, we have to physically fight back or something. But the game is all inside. So maybe if you can summarize, which are the kind of people who are the most interested to these beings? Because they, they seem to leave like most people off, but people like us who want to expose the agenda and who want to like fight back against the new world order, which is a constantly growing number of people now more and more. You know, we face interferences in our relationships, in our networks, in our friendships. So, you know, maybe the ways in which they target and the best ways that you have come across in terms of uh, self-defense, like just not going down the entire negative emotional spiral and the, the importance of countering our negative emotions and, you know, being in a state of high awareness and like high, like a vibration yeah. state. Yeah. Well, one of the biggest problems that we have is forgetting, simply, simply forgetting mm -hmm. what it is we're, we're trying to even do. Right. Because, you know, because you, you, you can come up with a, a spiritual daily routine. You can come up with, affirmations or uh, read or you know like every day i'll read from this spiritual author to kind of but then but then what happens a month later all of a sudden you realize well, wait a minute i haven't been doing that for a week because i forgot right you kind of get off track and that that sneakiness that sneaky deviation from the thing that you originally intended that is what plagues most people i think you know just just lacking the discipline and the memory um to to go along with it so so finding finding a way to stick with it that is that is a hard part and i mean ultimately it does come down to a choice because part of you because when you start doing it and when you start not doing it there is that in between period where you know you should be doing it but you choose not to right yeah. and you kind of go back part. to your old patterns and then you have to push yourself back to you know mm -hmm. get, get on the path there. right no 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 granted granted i've had it where i was definitely on a positive trajectory okay i was on a positive trajectory doing exactly what i needed to do I go to bed one night, I wake up the next morning feeling like it's two months later. Okay. Like something had been done to my mind where I'm not even in the flow anymore or connected with mm. it. I think something was done either an abduction or some sort of a night visit by some telepathic entity, you know, a demon or whatever that, um, uh, it, uh, it, like it, it erased, it erased the habitual pattern that I had been in and kind of like, like, like broke it up, like, like, moving away fog, you know, so mm. you just kind of move it all the way, but to disrupt the pattern. So now my mind is blank. It's not even in the flow anymore. It's not even connected to what I was connected to just the night before. Right. So that, that can happen too. Um, and I, I find the best way to deal with such things is to have something written out like a, like a mnemonic or some sort of a, a, a like a list of things that you can put on a wall, you know, like, like quotes or something that you see on a regular basis. And especially to recognize when you do get off track and as soon as you recognize it you have a process that you can go through to get yourself back into the flow right so like all right shoot you know i haven't been doing this in a week uh, i'm not feeling it right now i'm not even it's not even part of my personality anymore but 
I will read that book. I'll start reading a couple pages. Maybe I'll review my notes, mm-hmm. kind of go th- go through the affirmations again. And when you start doing that, then you start getting back into it. Then you realize, that, yeah, I remember what this feels like. And you start getting more and more back into the mindset. Now, it might take a couple minutes. It might take hours, even days of doing this. But then you'll be back into it, you see. The one thing you don't want to do is simply go on your feelings, which is like, oh, I don't feel like doing that anymore. And then you just stop, right? At some point, you have to almost like um, the same way that you handle a drunk person when they're about to get in a car. You take away their keys. You have to take manual override of their natural impulse, which is to get on the road while they're drunk. Well, when you're not feeling it, you're intoxicated. You're drunk. And some part of you has to kind of step in and say, nope, you're going to go ahead and go through that routine again. You're going to read that book again. You're going to go through your affirmations again. And you're going to start immer- immersing, uh, yeah, immersing yourself back into it. And that's, that's how you do it. Because the, w- the way that we progress in life is through feedback loops. Um, if you think about uh, a smoke ring, when you blow a smoke ring, right? That's a feedback loop. It's called a soliton. That's where the smoke kind of curls in on itself and it's self-reinforcing. It's like self-reinforcing feedback loop. And that's why the ring can kind of like go into the air and, ma- and maintain its form is because it's self-reinforcing. Well, when you get into a habit that makes you happy and uh, gives you a sense of fulfillment, that makes you want to do more of it. Okay. And so as you do more of it, the feeling becomes stronger. And so as you go, that feedback loop builds. And, if, and as long as you ride that feedback loop, it becomes easy to maintain a certain routine or a certain habit. The problem is when you wake up one morning or gradually that, that smoke ring just dissipates and now you're no longer feeling it because the, the momentum is gone. Well, the way you get back into it is by getting that smoke circulating again. You know, you have to like right. start dipping into it. It, t- it takes effort. It takes willpower initially to get into it. But then once you ignite that flame, then you feel it and now it becomes self-sustaining and now you're back in it and you're back in the flow and it's easy again, right? So you, you, don't want, you don't want to take the effort to get it going to be um, a sign of how it's always going to be. You know, it's like, oh, shoot, I hate reading the stupid book, but, you know, it's not always going to be like that. You're going to actually get into it, and then it's easy to, to keep continuing it. So yeah, that's sort of how I do it. But, um, but in addition to that, there's other things that can help, like simple things. Like I like taking power naps in the middle of the day. So just like laying down for 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, just kind of like dip down and sleep just very briefly. When you do that, when you come back from a power nap, you're not groggy. You actually have a lot of energy. And now you have more ability to deal with the matrix, with uh, research, with dealing with people, work, whatever. Uh, so power naps are really important. I love, I love power naps. I think, um, I think some of that Wim Hof breathing method, you know, where Wim Hof, he's, he's, yeah, he, he, he's all over the, the, the ice man. Yeah. yeah, the ice man. He's, he's got a breathing method. That's good, too, for, mm-hmm. for oxygenating the body in, in a certain way. Mm, I do like the Buddhist inner smile meditation. So the Buddhist inner smile meditation. I mean, if you look it up, a lot of people, they, they have versions of it that are just way too complicated, like visualize this, visualize that. No, no, no. All you do is you get into a meditative state mm-hmm. and you just try to make yourself happy like you're smiling from the inside. That's all you have to do. So, I mean, the New Agers would call it upping your vibe, but you can call it whatever you want. But that is incredibly important because that that that's like putting fertilizer and water and sunshine on your soul it helps to water your soul it helps to water your heart you know your spirit your inner child and it also kind of magnetizes you per the law of attraction to positive probable futures that you should be moving towards more right so yeah you have to keep up on that i mean the world's not going to do it for you like you know you can watch as many movies and and talk to people as you want but you're not going to get the happiness and fulfillment that you could by simply meditating on those very ideas and kind of starting your own inner fire manually that way. So I like that. I do like the idea of um, sending blessings towards other people, just like any, anyone you love, anyone you care for, um, e- even people you might know too well, but just sending them positive energy. Uh, and then what happens when you do that is um, you're, you're exercising the part of you that is your divine spark, so it's good for you. Mm-hmm. And it also affects them in a way that doesn't violate free will, because it's merely amplifying the part of them that has the free will to begin with, the spirit within them. You're giving, you're giving it an upper hand. Like it's probably being beaten down by their shadow, by the matrix, by all the bad things that happen in life. But if you can give them some positive energy, you're, you're, you're lending a helping hand to the part of them that matters in the end, the, the divine part. All right. So blessing others, that's good. Um, also love, uh, as I mentioned earlier, contemplation, right? Because with contemplation, what that is, is it's like holding a mirror to your consciousness. 
because when you write things down, when you write down your questions and you come up with brainstorm with, with, with ideas to your problems, you're getting it down on paper and then you can like look at it and you can come up with more ideas without having to juggle all those things in your head at the same time. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of like freeing up Ram inside your head in order to pull in more data from your higher self, from your intuition, from your heart. And, and so, you know, the same way, the, the same way that you can do math better on paper than you can in your head, the same way you can also solve metaphysical problems and personality issues and life issues on paper than you can simply in your head. So it is good to have a journal. It's good to have some something to contemplate within, spend time with yourself, introspect, and kind of work things out mm -hmm. because um, that's that's like the that, that's where the real catalyst happens within the person when they kind of reflect back on their life and learn from it and and, and so on. So those are some of the things that that I that I like to do. Yeah, I can tell some of the things I've learned from you that you probably missed. So one thing that really helped me a lot is actually to the the realization itself that your thoughts are not your own and just mm -hmm. the vigilance that you have to maintain with respect to intrusive thoughts because reading some of your chapters on alien interference and you know they can just kind of be there anytime it's not like they're physically bound that they can't come into your room or something they can just project themselves anytime where you are and you know they're telepathic so they can read your thoughts they know your weaknesses they know your strengths and they use all of that against you so like being very mindful about our own weaknesses, our shadow aspects and, you know, wanting to conquer that ourselves and not being a victim to them so that, you know, they can't use that as an entry point to kind of uh, get yeah, into right. our psyche and then fuck with us. Second is I was watching one of your interviews and you were recommending advice for targeted individuals and people who face a lot of like abductions and things like that. And one of your best advice I feel was just to get your mind off that and go towards like mm -hmm. the mundane, you know, that it might seem like counterintuitive that truth are actually talking about times where they, there might be like a use for you know going into mundane subjects but i i found that to be very useful as well just uh you know and this this can be applicable for any challenge in life i don't think necessarily for these subjects but in terms of interpersonal challenges also like just not feeding that whole thing you're sort of stuck in and diverting your mind and going to something else like i feel that helps a lot and in terms of what you were saying about habits uh, i feel like I've struggled with this because I, like, I was going through a difficult time, you know, since the last couple of months. So in the beginning, it's very difficult, as you were saying, you know, to to kind of opt out of your old state and to shift into a new state. So it does take a lot of effort. But once you get the habits dialed in, you know, like just wake up, breath work, meditation, take a proper schedule and, you know, practices throughout the day, everything's like planned and you just keep doing that and reading the material day after day, it kind of cements in and creates like a positive thought form. So the negative thought mm -hmm. forms that you were talking about earlier, they get energized in the astral realm and then they're kind of triggering us to seek more of that emotion out. But then when we shift that and create these positive states, I've seen those, you know, kind of tend to feed, like, you know, trigger us to create more of those positive kind of emotions and then they keep our state high. So practically, like, these things mm -hmm. have really helped me a lot, man. I'm so grateful to, like, come across you and, you know, like, have access to this because most people who are into this, they're so stuck in the external manifestations that like very few people are actually interested in figuring out okay how do we stop all of this inside and most of the answers are internal man so yeah that's just some stuff that helped me a lot yeah no that's good i'm really glad it helped you but yeah what we just summarized was so extremely important i mean the way that i operate in my life is um <clears throat> i i treat my thoughts and my feelings as if they are things as a, as mm. if they are things that are intimately tied into my external reality right um two ways, like, like both ways. So, so in other words, outwardly in the sense that if I go three, four days, maybe a week with low vibes, kind of materialistic, um, I notice how the things that come to me in life, um, good luck goes away, bad luck starts setting in. Yeah. And as soon as that happens, I like snap out of it, kind of shift myself back up. I have to do that. I have to do that constantly. One. Um, the other thing I noticed too is um, external impulses that are not my own that come into me. And it could be from subliminal subliminals I've seen online. It could be from aliens that have programmed me during abduction, the post-hypnotic command that gets triggered at a certain point, which happens. I mean, it's quite common, actually. Uh, or it could be a, a demon that I'm not aware of that's sending telepathic thoughts straight into my head, you know, something like that. I'm not schizophrenic or anything. I don't hear voices. But I'm just saying that there are, there are times when a mood comes over you or a feeling or an impulse or a compulsion or something comes over you where normally you would think, oh, that's just me mm. and I'm going to act on it. Like, oh, I'm kind of yeah. grumpy now. So I'm going to yell at people. I'm, you know, I'm going to be Mr. Mr. Grumpy just because that's what happened. But no, you, you don't realize that that's an artificial thing. It's not even, it's not even your, your true impulse. 
there's no biochemical reason why you should be feeling that way because it's an occult influence from the outside that comes in. All right. So both of those cases require me being aware of my mind, my emotions, my impulses, and questioning them or having some sort of control over them. So, so, so you know, you can't just let your mind run wild like, like a monkey in, mm. in a jungle. You can't do that. You have to be watchful of it and be mindful of it. I mean, the same way, like when you're out in public at a restaurant, you, you practice etiquette, right? Like, oh, chew with your mouth closed and uh, yeah. use a fork in this hand or whatever. Well, that sort of etiquette or hygiene process, you, you have to practice that within your own mind, even when no one's watching, because some part of your mind is watching you and entities are watching you. Entities are trying to trip you up, like in my case, because I mean, I, I deal with occult forces a lot. They're always trying to take me down. I have right. to be careful. So I can't do, I can't take a lot of the risks that a lot of people do. Like I don't do drugs because, oh man, if I, if I did drugs, I'd be screwed. Like it would, it would lower my defenses. It would create cracks, my aura. I mean, I, I would have things coming in really, really trying to trip me up. So I can't get away with doing drugs. Whereas someone else who doesn't have these many entity problems, I'm sure they could probably do drugs and be okay. But, but I can't. That, that's the takeaway I took from someone. Like someone asked you a good question that you covered in your book as well about ayahuasca. And then you were talking about. Uh, you know, nuances around drugs and how they can create cracks. So I feel like, as you were saying, someone who's probably more targeted and has to have their guard up like a lot, like most of the time in the day, who's, you know, who poses a threat, you know, for people like that, it'll just be a great idea to avoid going in those states where you lose conscious control of yourself. Like, you know, you, you even talk about sleep in a similar sense, like when you sleep, you know, you lose conscious control. So that's when uh, the negative entities and abductors can kind of have an impact in terms of, you know, like programming in a certain way that might then manifest in the day. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, even like that, that whole insight was, was really, really yeah. Good. yeah. Yeah. So, so if you think about it with all these different problems that we have, what is, what is one of the simplest things that you can do that solves so many of these problems? And, and then when that simplest thing is awareness, yeah. right? The more you can maximize not only the, the breadth of your awareness, but how long you can maintain it, the more of these problems you can, you can, um, know get over like for example all right this is very very difficult to do but some people have done it it's doable if you just keep at it but if you if you do like a mindfulness meditation where you're aware of your thoughts how you feel how your body feels your surroundings right people can typically keep that up for a couple minutes maybe five minutes or if you're really good you know even 15 or 20 minutes but eventually they just kind of let, let go and then they let their mind go again well yeah. what if you don't let your mind go what if you maintain that level of awareness constantly throughout the waking day well several things happen um number one it's going to be very difficult for an entity to insert a foreign thought into you that's going to catch you off guard and make you hy hypnotically just kind of go along with it right no, i've had some i've had some of those days where i'm so on guard like any thought that comes i'm like fuck off this is not me you know i can just <laughs> like you know, throw them off and i'm like super in, in my power yeah 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 but i mean if a thought feels right and if it makes sense and if it checks out you know, intuitively and, and logically, then cool, awesome, go with it, right? Yeah. But but if it's but if you're being sensed, it's off. It's not really you. Mm. It feels like an external hurried pressure. Then question it. I mean, in some cases, sure, you know, it could be a psychic intuition compelling you to do something. But but typically, if that's the case, you're you're going to feel an agreement from the back part of your being that it's correct and right, and 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 you should go with it. You know, I mean, this is something you'll you'll learn through trial and error, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but but just to finish up what I said. If you maintain your awareness throughout the day, not only do you not succumb to those nonsense impulses or those foreign thoughts, but you're also then going to become more aware when you're asleep as well. It's going to carry over as a habit. So most of your dreams then are going to be lucid, right? So you're going to have mostly lucid dreams. And because of that, likewise, an entity is not going to have much luck inducing a nightmare or a stressful dream just to energy feed. Because typically what these entities do um, is you're sleeping they're in your room, they're hovering right over you, and they're jacking etherically into your etheric body in your, in your brain. Like, like in my case, I get it on the left side of my head quite a bit. So, so my hearing is slightly damaged from what they've done. But anyway, so they, so they jack in and um, they control your dreams to induce stress or whatever, and then they feed off the loose energy, the life force energy that you emit yeah. from all the stressful energy. And they do it all night long if you're not careful. Um, but if you're lucid, you can totally put a stop to it. So therefore, you're going to be able to hang on to your energy more and accumulate it, which is going to lead to other positive benefits. Not only that, but when you die one day, when you die, your lucidity is also going to carry over at that point. So at that point, you're also going to be less liable to fall for deceptions and he's trying to lead you astray. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? 
Mm -hmm. Like you're not going to be like in this weird dream, like stupor. It's kind of like wandering off into the lower astral planes and being there for a while, mm -hmm. while, you know, nonsense happens. Mm -hmm. So awareness is the, one of the fundamental shields or weapons that we have against this whole matrix thing. So I guess you can almost say that the matrix control system is designed to make us not aware to keep our awareness suppressed, right? So that's why everything from the air that we breathe, the food that we eat, the, the types of diets that have been recommended by the system, it's all designed to make us tired, less aware, sick, right? Um, to, so, that, so that we don't have that key shield or weapon that we need in order to, to make it through these obstacles. Great, man. Just some final things in closing. So uh, someone in the chat was asking, why do these negative entities uh, want to feed on us? Or why do they need the energy? Uh, I mean, in my opinion, it's, it's a pretty simple thing. Like they've chosen to go off the path towards evolving uh, to the creator and then they're going to the other side. So they don't like they cut off from that energy source that they're powered with, which is why they kind of have to use our weaknesses and, you know, manipulate us in different ways to get that loose energy out of us. You know, I've, I've heard you talk about how different researchers have actually spoken about how there's actually etheric tubes attached to us, which are then, mm -hmm. you know, feeding into the demonic astral realms and they're constantly triggering us. Like you were talking about demons being in every household and, you know, I just, I just feel like once people understand the paradigm that their minds are open to these entities and they are constantly like scanning them and using it against us, uh, you know, and triggering these low vibrational emotions, which they need. Uh, which is why they try to maximize our pain during certain happenings as well. Like when we go through shit in life, they're always trying to extract the most. So as you said, it's a gamble between, you know, we have the chance to evolve or we have the chance to descend. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I just want to like answer that for you know, someone who's asking it. Secondly, the one of the benefits of like going into this positive emotional state is experiencing synchronicity. So I was really fascinated reading your detailed like videos and chapters on synchronicity because I actually wrote my synchronicities down that I've had in the last two months and I could like fit almost like two three in one category so you talk hmm. about manifestation things you know I had like two three going in there you talk about opportunity things I had two three going in there so it's just like when you when you shift into that state uh, like space time bends for you you know you can you hmm. can uh, you know feel like reality is very fluid and it's constantly responsive to thought and you know, just the way in which you're changing your mind is constantly being reflected in my reality. So I, I like plan to do a video on this where I want to go through the different types of synchronicities you lay out and then my personal experiences of what I've had and like, you know, where they fit in. So that will be really interesting for people. Yeah. Well, you, Ask, you know why that is. Yeah. You, you know why that, you know why, you know why that is though. The way, I've, I've, read that. I've, I've read an explanation on that. Basically, you say that uh, when we shift into the state, we're kind of changing the timeline. So, which is why a lot of these improbable things tend to manifest rather than if we were to stay stay in the most probable timeline before. Like, that's the typical thing, right? Once we go through a negative experience, the most probable thing is that we won't learn and we'll just keep going on mm -hmm. with it. So, probably because I shifted my state and became more powerful, which is why, like, reality is glitching so much. That's, that's my theory. What's your take on that? Yeah, no, no, totally. Like, if you're deviating onto the positive timeline, that's, I think yeah. that's part of it. And I think the other part of it, too, is when you... When you um, when you shift your your inner state, your inner vibration to that more positive state, you're you're accessing parts of the astral plane that you're not normally accessing. And earlier, when I mentioned how reality is probably a, a collective thought co construct within the astral, and how there's a programmed part of it, which is the etheric, which leads to physics, right? Well, physics and the etheric, I mean, those are the things that lead to us being as programmed as we are, having to deal with mater materiality and, and physics and, and, and like the violence and having to protect ourselves. Those are the things that keep us in the ego. But when you shift out of the etheric plane and you shift your, your emotions, your mindset more into the upper astral levels, now you're connecting with a part of the collective consciousness that isn't that, that fake simulated programmed physics part of it. Now, you, now you're connecting with a part that is the consciousness, the, the dreamer, the subconscious that generates this collective dream. So of course, of course you would get synchronicities. Of course you would get manifesting because you're accessing a part of existence that is more dreamlike, that is the origin of the dream of this existence. I just wanted to add to it. No, and I feel like coming across your work was exactly the same because, you know, when I was like really depressed, I was trying to find material and it's it's a very strange coincidence. Like I, I have all the volumes of, I mean, if I, if I have something at my house, which has like, you know, one book, but there's multiple volumes, I always have everything because whenever I'm buying, it's like I make sure that I'm hmm. I'm buying like a complete set and not some something incomplete. But yours was the only book where I couldn't find volume one. And that's, right. that's why I was like, okay, fuck, you know, I've... I've never heard your name before, probably like came across your website many years back, so I forgot. So I was like, okay, you know, I, I can find, I didn't even have any interest in your work. I was like, I can find the first volume, where's the second one? Then I went around like 
searching in my room, searching in my house, couldn't find it. And the more I thought about it, like the more, then I started to glance through your book and I was like, fuck, okay, I need to read this. So that, that was like very, very interesting for me in terms of like, you know, and the material in your book is exactly what I needed to, to get through this and to, you know, like become kind of the, the mindset that I have today. So man, like, yeah, for forever grateful to you, Tom, like you, you have no idea like how you're changing lives and really affecting people in deep profound ways. Um, lastly, law of attraction versus law of awareness. So you spoke about mm. the importance of becoming aware, but then for a lot of truth seekers that comes at a negative consequence of going down the route of paranoia and just like getting obsessed with these things and getting fearful and anxious about the negative future timelines. So like in closing your kind of, you know, the importance that you see in terms of integrating both because there's, there's people on both sides. There's the New Agers who then, you know, realize that there's a truth to the law of attraction and they don't want to attract these negative kind of things. So they just pretend like we'll not know about it so it won't happen. And then you have the other side who kind of bashes the entire importance of being in a high vibrational state and just focuses mm -hmm. on the 3D aspect, the negativity. And, you know, then they land up actually creating more suffering in their lives because they, they aren't integrated into like the higher metaphysical framework. So what's, what's the importance of having both in life? Well, it's because if we look at what are humans, we are physical beings that have a non-physical spiritual component in us. So we're, we're dual beings. And likewise, when you look at your own life, you have on the one hand, magical synchronicities and manifestings and higher beings who can come here and help us out. But then you also have, like I said, physics, money, the matrix, right? Nowhere, no matter where you look, whether within us or outside of us, there's a, a duality. There's a duality between higher and lower uh, spiritual and material. And so therefore, if you want to have success, if you want to beat this, beat this illusion, you have to operate on both levels. Um, and the law of attraction, that is only acting on the astral non-physical level, right? It's only acting on the, on the non-physical level. On the other hand, we also have to take physical action too, right? You can't, you can't just, I mean, sure, you could probably manifest I don't know, a lottery winning, so you wouldn't have to work anymore. But most people do have to do some sort of work to make it in life, right? And so that's physical action. So life is actually an inter interplay between black and white, between physical and non-physical. We have both, and therefore we have to operate on both levels. And so we know about what the law of attraction is, but what about the law of awareness? The law of awareness is, is a, it's, it's a term that I had to come up with because it was missing in the literature. Mm. And what the law of awareness really means is... Um, it's the idea that whatever you are aware of consciously at, at the level of ego, intellect, uh, beta, brainwave level consciousness, by consciously aware of it, it is now within your lap to physically physically deal with. Um, so, and so that's why when it comes to the law of attraction and manifesting, typically they tell you, you know, after you set your intention and uh, do your thing, you have to forget about it. You have to set it aside. Because mm -hmm. if you keep focusing on it, like awareness wise, keep anticipating it, expecting it, keep looking like, hey, is it manifesting now? No. If you keep doing that, it's not going to happen. Why? Because awareness, expectation, and anticipation blocks probable futures. And so that's why it's actually a very good thing to be aware of negative entities in, in a calm sense, like, in, like mm -hmm. without, without emotional resonance and investment. See, because when you, when you have a very paranoid, fearful, terrorized mindset about negative entities like you feel like oh they're always around they're always watching me um in an emotional like like you're losing control of yourself kind of yeah. kind of way you you're actually going to resonate and attract it in per the law mm. of attraction you're mm. actually going to manifest it into your life more and more and for some people um especially with a targeted individual phenomenon like gang stalking it, that creates a negative feedback loop between paranoia creating more entity encounters which creates more paranoia, which creates more gang stalking, you know, it, this big runaway feedback loop. And their their realities can melt down into a very nightmarish kind of state. You know, like like their paranormal events, black helicopters, mysterious men, like government agents, they all start coming after this person. Why? Because they drew in those probable futures where those things exist. You know? So the, so you don't you don't want that. You want like calm awareness of the existence of negative things. Um, so that your mere awareness of it can reduce the probability of it manifesting in your reality. It's, I, th I, think, I think it's a quantum mechanical phenomenon because in quantum physics, you have this amorphous cloud of pro probabilities called a wave function. Um, but if you observe it, if you try to measure it, it collapses down into a single possibility. It becomes physical. 
mm. and you can deal with physical you can measure it you can deal you know take a little you, you can you can deal with it physically um but the fact that you're observing it and measuring it gets rid of all the quantum weirdness associated with quantum physics so likewise if you want the positive quantum weirdness of man manifesting something you can't keep on expecting it anticipating it because what you're doing is you're observing into the future um and you're collapsing the probabilities and you're keeping it from being fluid like it needs to be but you can use that principle to deal with negative hyperdimensional stuff by being calmly aware of it because mm. then you're also getting rid of a lot of these weird quantum fluidity things that these negative entities have to work through in order to manifest in your reality and get at you and you can use it for towards that you can use it towards um like if you're going on a trip um by car and your car could possibly break down if you don't even think about the possibility of the car breaking down and you're not prepared for it it'll, it'll probably happen because it's wide open in your field of awareness you know you're not blocking it in any way with the law of awareness but if you're aware of the possibility that it could happen and you're prepared for it then that's that's the probable future where it's not going to happen because you're you're i mean you're aware of it you kind of like locked it out right mm. so for me the law of awareness is using your your conscious mind to be aware of something in order to freeze it from happening or to deal with it physically you know and whereas the law of attraction is more like what you do on an emotional level to draw things in you know just mm. just 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 by virtue of what you're resonating with um but you, you talked about how people can also have a negative downside to being aware yeah. which is that which is that you're, you're not aware of the positive uh, metaphysical side of things so you get so caught up in the negative awareness of things that you kind of get worn down you get paranoid right you go into this downward spiral of paranoia negativity and cynicism and we see that a lot with people who uh research either dark occult things or like like 3d conspiracy mm. aspects right the, the the dark secret societies and the you know all the lies of the government right if you only ever research that and you don't research the spiritual metaphysical you know things like 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 that you're going to get such a one-sided view of reality that you're only you're going to be blinded by the darkness you're going to be so blinded by the darkness that you don't see the light and you're going to lose the light within yourself you know you're going to you're going to get that light snuffed out because it can't withstand that level of darkness so that's why you can't simply <laughs> you can't simply study the the negative conspiracy you have to study the spiritual religious metaphysical esoteric things as well because that gives you the spiritual grounding and strength that you need in order to be able to dive into the darkness and deal with it there so you need both awesome man i i had like some more stuff that i just want to like let people know and then let people know that you can find the answers to these things and uh, montauk's work because he does like write about them pretty extensively so i was thinking about talking about why free energy technology never gets out your thoughts on the soul trap tunnel of light so i know that you've like written you know so people have asked you those questions and you've elaborated mm -hmm. on, on them pretty extensively in your book so that gave me a lot of insight because you know i used to resonate with some of that earlier since you have a science background i don't know if you've covered this in your questions a lot but uh What's your take on the entire uh, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases contributing to climate change that the elites are pushing? You talk about uh, ear ringing and warnings that you know people experience in different years with respect to you know attributes of different years and uh, how these uh, tinnitus kind of sounds tend to happen before the entities are trying to steer a timeline in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Deja vu's and like, how how that connects into you know like entities changing timelines. how to use the moon cycles to our advantage so you know the moon does open up dimensionally speaking and full moons and new moons so you know using that time in order to manifest uh, like positive outcomes and being more mindful about the negative aspects because that's when you know the veil kind of thins out so the negative entities can have more of an influence over us your opinions on cern harp chemtrails chemtrails i know you've elaborated on cern and harp i'm i'm not so sure dangers of astral travel uh, difference between sleep paralysis the normal type that people experience and the one that's like uh, induced by negative entities uh, your take on politics like i know that you inclined towards second amendment and libertarians but i maybe want to go a little deeper into that your take on the secret space program incredible people so i know that you're fond of richard dolan and you know people like that in, in that entire space and that you're not so fond of other people you write about that uh, in your books as well then let's see i have like a couple more how to fight nanobots in case of technocracy best and worst ai scenarios i know you've written about that as well in your writings and lastly 
drugs like yeah, i really want to get into mm-hmm. that that whole thing in more detail with respect to if you think that all drugs are the same or there's certain ones that you know open you up more uh, and create more cracks th- than others and yeah I, this is one thing that's really bothered me since childhood a lot is that i mean you laid out the entire dimensional density you know spectrum but uh, doesn't like i want to get your thoughts on doesn't the thought bother you as to how everything just came to be randomly and you know like how how many of answers we have like nothing seems to answer that fundamental question as to how how creation just came to be mm-hmm. so yeah i don't think i i'm not sure if that's something you've answered or not but that's probably like one of the important things i want to ask you most other things i'm pretty sure that you've covered even like tom's work on synchronicity and uh, you know he has like very good animated videos on his channel you guys can go and check out where he's gone to detail in the alien presence and synchronicity and it's it's done in like a very short concise way and i know that you've kind of transcribed that and you have chapters written as well so yeah man bro like really really grateful you've given us four hours 15 minutes i don't want to keep you any longer any any final thoughts and then we can close yeah i mean was there any particular question you want me to finish up on I yeah maybe maybe it's just that last one like well, what do you think about the ultimate question as to how everything just uh, came to be you know from nothingness mm-hmm. into creation or how consciousness even started in the first place yeah yeah well i th- i think um i think it started with well if if we go by the myths right we we talk about how in the beginning there was the void the darkness you know before there was even light before there was even something there was nothing but nothing wasn't nothing it was everything see when we start talking about things that are this abstract you start sounding like a crazy philosopher right with these <laughs> with these abstract terms but but the thing is in order for oh wow is this i do sound like a crazy philosopher now in order for everything to exist it had to exist at the very beginning right so so nothingness has to contain everythingness so it was, it was infinite potential now i mean i, I do think that I do think that if there is even just one consciousness that existed at the very beginning what would it do like it can't just be by that, itself doesn't it fuck forever. your mind as to how that consciousness could even just come to be mm-hmm. like i think that's that's the root question like how did it even start off to begin with yeah yeah because when we talk about starting and ending now we're talking about time mm, right okay. and did the time did the time even exist back then right or or do, or does eternity always exist eternity always exists it always will exist and therefore that that is all there is now i mean ultimately ultimately i do think that creation is i i think it is infinite consciousness i think it is infinite consciousness that is experiencing itself in an infinite variety of finite ways you know so so you're finite i'm finite we are we are of course we're finite because if you and i were not finite then we would both be infinite and then there would be no separation between us at all not even in form and so therefore i wouldn't be able to think things independently of you mm-hmm. so the fact that you have free will and i have free will means that we are separate in function even if we are united in essence so you i mean does this the same core i within you like the, your your inner self within you is the same one that is within me it's just we are two instances of the same thing it's kind of like it's kind of like having a uh, bunch of broken mirror glass and they're all reflecting exactly the same candle light so there's one candle reflecting light but we see a thousand candles before us because those are individual mirrors so each of us you're a mirror I'm a mirror we're all reflecting the same candle light but because the mirror has its own autonomy it can reflect that light in however however it wants you know brightly dimly this way that way and so I do think that we are all finite beings traveling finite paths because it's finite because it has a beginning and has an end but it's all started and it's all merging into the infinite. So mm-hmm. I think the infinite is where it started, the infinite is where it ends. And uh, so ultimately, yes, we are all one in essence, we're all one in origin and we're all one in where we will end up one day. Um but right now, we are a multiplicity and we are learning from each other. So essentially every interaction that we have, even if it's violent, I think it is a form of self-discovery and self-love of the infinite. within itself. And I think I think in context of eternity everything turns out well. So I think that's why some of the bad stuff that's happening now I don't want to say it's it's excusable, but it's it's being watched carefully and not interfered with too much by certain positive forces because they have a very long-term viewpoint mm-hmm. and they understand that there is a, a script and a story and a purpose to this. And um and that's why they only need to be the the guiders or the chaperones or the referees and not necessarily the the participants 
that are taking away the the joy of discovery from ourselves. Surely there's some crazy positive forces working through you because the, the kind of stuff that uh, comes out in your writings and your work is just phenomenal and you know it, it really answers so many things and I feel like shortcuts many people like I mean to come to your level of insights and awareness if we just started off on ourselves probably take 50 60 years or an entire lifetime and maybe then like even then I'm not sure if you can be able to reach it but so much gratitude bro thank you so much for being the person you are and you know like just keeping on so many years and i'm sure that like the world needs you now more than ever and you're going to become much more famous in this time because you have the answers to like a lot of things that people are going to start asking questions to so i i wish you all the best man thank you so much for coming on and like the audience has loved you it's been 4 hours and 20 minutes there's still 40 people watching the live right now so oh, thank it's you. great man that's really cool Yeah, I appreciate it. Um ultimately, I stand on the shoulder of giants and this is a team effort, so we will we'll, we'll all be famous one day. Great, Tom. See you, man. Good night, bro. Right. Thanks for coming on.